changes this through one back, which means that because we're playing advanced pro play, some players are playing super advanced, which we'll talk about later on. But in advanced pro play, going through one back for hoop seven means the opponent at the end of this turn will have a lift. That basically means they can choose if they want to to take one of their balls and start from the starting position again, so either A ball or B ball. Uh, That's they don't, right. They don't have to have a lift. No, they don't. But um, if this all goes to plan, then I'm sure Reg Bamford will be taking a lift when it's his turn. James has been playing a very controlled break. He's yes. got the pace of a lawn. He's a very fluid, natural, gifted player when he's on form. And he gets nice and close to the hoop so he can just run them with control. Yeah, James would definitely fit into that category of a flair player. When he's on form, he's uh, extremely good. So what's most common is uh, when you've gone through one back in advanced play and you've given a lift is you will stop at four back for hoop 10 and you will leave the opponent's balls in a position that makes their shot, their lift shot difficult. One of those options is to do what's called a diagonal spread which it looks like that's what James is doing, we'll explain that a bit more when he the position develops, but um, we're trying to make Reg's shot as difficult as possible while keeping him red and yellow together for another break if Reg misses his shot. So that will be the final hoop that James will make, which is three back hoop nine. <clears throat> so now, because he's coming to the end of his turn, he will want to make sure Reg's blue and black balls are not close to each other, or close to James's red and yellow balls. And he'll also have his two balls close together, and the reason for that is, assuming Reg doesn't himself hit, then James will have a short roque to start his next turn. So this is what's called a diagonal spread. So black is over sort of south of hoop two near the boundary. Blue is hidden from black by the peg. And then James will lay out red and yellow so that he can rush them over to either blue or black depending on which one bridge he plays. And blue also won't have a a short shot red and yellow because pegs in the way so he's it's a very this is a very nice lead it's very controlled the mistake that a lot of um kind of b class or lower a class players make i think is that they put red and yellow too far south uh, and so it creates a shorter shot for, uh, for the op opponent. Where James is there, Reg doesn't really have a particularly short shot. Any thoughts on which ball Reg is likely to play here, Keith? Well, to some extent, it doesn't matter from James's point of view. So if, for example, you could imagine that either blue or black was simply taken off the lawn then James would still be able to get a break going with yellow and he'd, he'd either rush red closer to blue and send red to hoop two and get a rush on blue to hoop one or he'd rush red beyond black send red to hoop two and get a rush on black to hoop one yeah so Reg's choice is really governed by how long the shot is, quite often the shortest shot is at the ball at the peg. So it looks like Reg is taking his ball into at corner three. He is. Now that means that um, 
If he does happen to miss, then Black will end up near corner four, which is arguably the most awkward position from James's point of view because yeah. it's it's out of out of his play until he gets um, gets through a couple of hoops. comes Roger's shot. Yeah, through the oh. middle. Yeah. I couldn't tell exactly how close it got to that, but it didn't look particularly close. No, certainly by Reg's standards, that would have been one of his poorer shot attempts. Us mortals, that would have been a good one. So James will ignore black for the yeah. time being um, and concentrate on establishing a break with yellow. Yeah. He's just checking there to see whether blue would rush towards black. Actually now, you wouldn't normally do that unless perhaps blue won't rush to hoot one. Yeah. Can't quite tell from here. Um, but I, I'd expect that it would, but we'll see after this next shot. Yeah, with blue being so tight to the peg, you do have that danger sometimes that it won't go to one. OK, so he's played mm -hmm. to rush blue to black, so perhaps... Perhaps blue was slightly um, misplaced at the peg, of course. Now... Mm. He hasn't played it exactly as he would have liked. No, he wanted to rush right into the corner, I would expect. So this is slightly awkward because he needs to, in his croquet shot on blue, he needs to get yellow the other side of black so that he can rush black towards hoop one. But he mustn't go off the lawn. Yeah. For those that are sort of newer to association croquet, when you play this shot, neither ball is allowed to the croquet shot, neither ball is allowed to go off the lawn, otherwise it's end of turn. So a bit of bravery required here to get in behind black. And he's definitely in behind. Yeah, he's played that. As far as we can tell from our commentary position, he's played that pretty well. Yeah, that's good. A little bit strong. Now, because we said earlier he would ignore black, and obviously he hasn't ignored black, um, and actually blue is a couple of yards out of corner four, so he may choose to, when he, when he approaches this hoop and runs it, he may be planning to rush black back towards corner four. That would make things a lot easier for him if, if he's successful. He's so a little on. bit short on that, so he'll be concentrating on making sure he gets the hoop. Nicely done. He has, but he hasn't got a rush back to corner four, so... Although he's stopping and looking at my... Well, he's going over to blue to just see what sort of, sort of shot he might have from blue, because he needs to get to red. Yes. Quite a big shot potentially playing blue down to three and coming to red, but the lawns are quick. James is definitely capable <coughs> of playing that. It's just he might have what we call furniture in the way, which are hoops and pegs. Looks as though he's ignoring blue. So he's just going to uh, he's going to send black towards hoop three as a pioneer. One of the keys with association croquet is being patient sometimes and just developing play.
Now we had a, a short break in commentary there because our commentary position is actually directly behind hoop two that James was just approaching and making there, so we don't want to be speaking when he's playing. But he's he's now putting red. Rather than trying to get a pioneer to hoop four, which he did on his first break, he's now setting up for what we call a triple peel. Now that means as well as making the hoops with yellow, he's going to attempt to be pushing red through its hoops. And the uh, first of its hoops here is four back, or the tenth hoop. So his plan here is to rotate red nearer the hoop, but not very much nearer. And then he will attempt to push red through a hoop. It's called a peel after a player from a long time ago who was called Peel. Didn't and he, he liked to uh, to carry out this manoeuvre. So uh, yeah. it's mm -hmm. one of the examples of manoeuvres being named after players. I've learned something today, Keith. I'm sure there are many more sitting next to you for a chunk of the day. So, that's so if... if um, as well as trying to get red through the hoop, he's also trying to get a rush on black down the lawn. Yeah. Because he still needs to establish a break now, because he hasn't got a pioneer at hoop four. So red has gone into what we call the jaws. It's gone into four back, so that's not a problem at all. It's um, he can easily no, knock that through. No, he can come back to that later. So he's rushed, it's like he rushed pretty much due south of hoop four so i think what he will do now is he will regard black as the ball that he's going to hit after running hoop four yeah so pretty much leave it there which yeah. we call the reception ball mm -hmm. and he's going to get a rush on blue to the side of hoop four somewhere where he can do a stop shot sending blue towards hoop five as a pioneer hoop five is the and at the same hoop. time approach hoop four yeah and then he will if that's successful he then will have a break established so in principle it's very similar to this first break in that he's using the three other balls he hits the ball makes it's a roquet shot and then he has to play off that ball with the balls together called a croquet shot it's the same break, but he is also, as Keith said, attempting to peel his partner ball, his red ball, through its last three hoops and then hopefully finish. So he, James could finish on this turn. He's done, my stats tell me, so thanks to Eugene and Chris Stato Williams for this, that James has done 528 triple peels in his career. So he probably knows what he's doing. <laughs> I think I've done about 13 in, in proper competitive play. I'm sure you've done a few, Keith. Do you have got any idea how many you've ever oh, done? I've no idea. Yeah, a lot. I was quite interested there. He, he did have a rush north, but he's chosen not to come up and get the peel, complete the peel before going to hoop five. So it'll be interesting to see how he continues from here. There are at least two recognised methods. Yeah. Yeah, so someone that's a bit more inexperienced at top level play, I probably would be sending blue down somewhere. Well, the real. Fall back the, and then pinging it across and rush peeling red through. and It's pinging it across, but is he going to ping it across all the way to one back? Or is he going to put it as a reception ball? for hoop six, but it looks like it's coming all the way to one back to me, the way he's looking at one back. So the reception ball at six, that'd be more of a sort of wily type approach. Well, already, you've yeah. introduced another name yeah. of the famous croquet player, Keith Wiley, who devised a method for continuing from this position. We're not going to see it, so I won't go into the yeah. details, but suffice it to say, he avoided having to be very accurate with this roll shot. 
because James is now trying to both get onto black and position red north of hoop six and he's played up pretty well, yellow's gone yeah. a bit far but red, bit red's very good. So by not by, by rushing red through its hoop, that means that four back hoop has been made, so he's that red is now for the last but one hoop which is called penalt. Um, getting that first peel in fairly early is critical to doing this triple peel. So you know, looking at it, allowing for nerves, obviously, because it's semi-final of the British Open. But um, he's in good shape. He'd be very happy with this position. So he's now okay, Red. So he, he's going to be attempting the second peel um, while getting a rush on black to somewhere where he can send it as a pioneer to two back which is the hoop one the other, in the other direction or the one with Reg's two clips on it so he's made that look quite easy clean as a whistle that isn't it and he's going to be rushing black back to towards the boundary but not all the way James, James has got a mallet that's probably better at doing stop shots than some of the more modern carbon fibre peripherally weighted mallets. And that's, to an extent, that's an advantage because it doesn't need to move his ball quite as far in croquet strokes. And therefore it can be more accurate. Yeah. So this is um, one back or hoop seven. So in association croquet we have the, the normal first six hoops numbered one to six and then we go one back which is this one, then two back, three back, four back. And then we finish with penalt and rover. So rover is the red topped hoop and so you're going through both all six hoops in two directions. Both balls, that's uh, 12 points times two, 24, and then you peg out of both balls, that's 26 points in the end of the game. So, I don't want to curse James, but I would say from this position he's looking very strong to potentially finish this game one. It's best of five in the semi-final. Uh, we're not entirely sure who won the toss of the first game, but um, I would say he's in a well, good position, I'm, isn't he? I'm going to stick my neck out and say that Reg won the toss. Yeah. Because I think if he had won the toss, he would have chosen to go in. Yes. And with having chosen go first or second, the other player, the loser of the toss, gets to choose which colours to play with, and I'm pretty yeah. sure James would choose to play with red and yellow. That's a really nice position for red. Yes, red's ready to go through the rover hoop, which is the last of its remaining hoops, and so he's going to be making two back here, and then he's, he's going to be sending black as a pioneer to fall back if I'm not mistaken yeah, Reg. That's right. Very, <laughs> very close to red ideally because he doesn't want to move red very far in the roquet. Yeah. And then he can set up a croquet stroke pushing red through rover whilst at the same time getting on to blue to make three back and yeah. James has not let me down. He's got yeah, very beautiful. close to red and he's got a very good pioneer at four back. Yeah, it's brilliant. It may be Which that makes the commentator's job a bit easier. <laughs> he does when it? he does what he's meant to. I think he's slightly concerned, yeah. It looked like he was ah, okay. gonna end up pushing red wider the hoop, making the approach to blue difficult. So he's he's doing a slightly different line okay. of play. Well that was potentially a function of where blue was. Yeah. If blue had been further south, he yeah. might have still taken on the peel. Yeah, it's quite a wide shot, wasn't it? So he didn't really want. Yeah. Shame so the plan now here is that uh, he will run the hoop and then he will try and again rush red back over to in front of Rover. It's a bit short. It is a bit short. Well, that makes me feel a bit better because I can. <laughs> 
confidently say that that's a manoeuvre I've never successfully completed. It's a tricky, it's a tricky uh, touch shot that one, isn't it? Getting it in front. On the other lawn, uh, Robert Fletcher is on the lawn, but he's asking for a referee. So just trying to see. Ah, okay. It looks like Robert's just come through the hoop and has a slightly hampered shot to hit Mark's ball. We've got Jenny Clark coming over to ref by the looks of it. Oh no, change of play. No, I think that might be in Vincent. Meanwhile, James is progressing. Now, Red, Red isn't terribly close, close to Rover at the moment, so I would expect him to go to it after making fallback and get it really close in front of Rover before he comes back to blue. Yes, mate. some audio visual technical, technical uh, hitches there. interrupted the beautiful flow of with the experience, commentary from inexperienced Aiken. commentator <laughs> so right so it looks like James is choosing to rush red all the way back up the lawn beyond blue but he mm. hasn't gone beyond blue that is actually um, that's going to make things tricky he did, he did have an option there just to, to rush red in front of Rover and do a takeoff. It's quite a long takeoff, it would have been 15 yards or so. And he's decided he was going to do something he thought was going to be more accurate, but it did rely on red missing blue. And because he hasn't, he's in a very difficult position now for finishing. Could make the difference between winning this game in this turn or having to sweat on Reg having another lift shot. Yeah. You don't really want to give Reg any extra shots. Not do if you don't need to, no. So this would be a position on the croquet lawn where we'd say you don't want to start from here. James is perfectly capable of doing this but he's going to have to get a very, very good rush on Red down to Rover if he wants to get that through the final hoop. More than capable of doing it, but it's not a shot you'd want to play, is it? Given where he was at. And he won't if he goes straight to red, he won't be using black. I'm guessing. Yeah. Yeah, leave everything behind. Oh wait a minute. I don't think I know what James has got in mind. Yeah. Like he wanted to rush blue. Um, onto a line where he could use blue in the croquet stroke to what we call promote red yeah. down towards the hoop but he hasn't actually rushed blue far enough to do that so he's in real trouble here um, super accurate he'll get his there. he'll get his hoops made i expect but he won't he won't finish the game and that's at this level that's quite a big mistake yeah, from the position he was in to actually rush red. That's and looks big. That was too far. So red is not in front of Rover. It's a very small mental error he made rushing red into blue, but you know it was unnecessary, so he'll be quite annoyed with himself. Part of the mental side of things which Keith and I love is uh, is being able to reset after making a mistake, which yeah, for someone of James's ability was unnecessary. Um, it looks like on the other lawn the actual issue is with the hoop setting. I think the hoop's been reset. I think it was uh, looks like it was hoop six I think. So, so James has um, he's realised he can't finish the game in this turn so he's just going to make sure that he gets the hoop with yellow and then can make 
a leave where Reg again won't have a short shot to yeah. hit enemy. So the key here really when you made an error is finish off the break well. If you're going to have to leave one more shot just make sure that again because um, James has come through both one back and four back on this go. Reg will have another lift shot after this. So he'll want to make sure he leaves the balls in a position that are not particularly useful for Reg. Was that a deliberate attempt to try and clip Red in front of it, Logan? It wouldn't, it wouldn't surprise me because potentially James is, is known for um, trying things that other people perhaps wouldn't try. So he may have been trying to to promote Red to a position where he could have attempted to rush Peeler. But he didn't he didn't manage that. So anyway that is now Black's final resting place for this turn. And I'm not sure what he's planning with blue. You may hear some background noise. We've got uh, I think it's a hockey tournament across the way. As the day goes on and a bit more people tune in to Keith and mine's adult towns, I'm sure the crowds will come across. Right, I have a funny feeling James is still planning to try and rush peel this. Yes. I can partly understand the logic, which is I don't want to give Reg another shot in this game. If I can finish now, there's a. Oh, no, he's going over there. Oh, yeah. Okay, okay well. Not, not a bad result. I can it? see he didn't succeed, but he's still giving himself the option. It's not going to be ideal for him, but he's going to, I suspect, um, roll these balls down towards corner four. Yeah. But I might be wrong. For someone of Wedge's ability, you know, if he does go to corner four, you know, it's a relatively short shot, but obviously it's all on that shot. If he misses, James will probably finish. And James has already left Reg. Um, what's that about? 14. 12. 12 or 13 yard yeah, shots. Yeah. Um, so it doesn't necessarily matter that he might leave him another one in by going down towards not corner really, four. not really, no. So he is rolling down towards corner four. I've got a question, Keith, on that rush peel. Um, if he had succeeded, obviously red would have gone through its final hoop. But yellow would have been miles away from red and he'd have left red on the south boundary, which would have been an easy pickup for... Reggie's next shot. Well, it? It, it was a rush. It was a roque. So oh, of course, yes. Yeah, sorry. He would sorry, have had you, the croquet stroke, but the point. question would have been: Would he have then attempted a peg out from from miles from uh, well south of Rover? Good point. Who knows? We'll never know. This is why I'm not a top A class player because I uh, forget about fundamental stuff like <laughs> being able to take croquet. <laughs> Well, this is definitely a bonus turn for Reg. He would have been assuming yeah. that James would finish that triple peel. Yeah, and I, yeah, I think James will be disappointed. It was uh, a couple of messy shots. Um, after three back, that the rush back to Rover wasn't the best, and then yeah, sort of an error rushing red into blue, which he'll be annoyed about. But we've all done it. On the other lawn, Robert Fletcher is continuing to go round. I'll, um, I think he's just made two back. Yeah. On his first break. Yeah, so he's in good shape. So this game's a little bit more advanced. As the, as the day progresses, I think it will become apparent that if James is playing, the games will go pretty quickly. Um, 
so depending on how this match actually goes I'm expecting it to finish before the other one does which potentially, we'll is, an which potentially is an advantage for the finalist isn't it if you have a bit of a bit more of a break reset ahead of tomorrow but I mean these guys are used to playing best of five games it might be a marginal advantage finishing early yes nobody really wants to have a long drawn out five game match the day before playing a, the final against somebody who's had three hours of play and is fully rested so, uh, right, so here comes Reg he's, he's lifted blue and he's taking this this shot is 13 yards yeah. a shot, shot at red if he hits he could change the game yes he misses and another miss not a happy shake of the well, head you're probably back in reds to hit most of those wouldn't you but uh, this is a lot on that shot looks like red and blue are well in he contact. hit he hit third turn didn't he and then yes and then since then he's had two lift shots both of which have missed didn't look like that one missed by very much to be fair well but probably, you know, he, for he, red. Missed, he must have missed by a fair bit because he he put it on south of red and he didn't put it in contact. So okay, your eyesight's better than mine, Keith. Well, James took a rush on it, didn't he? Yeah, he Just did. Yeah. So talking about best of fives. Um, so in the knockout phase, three of the semi-finalists, James, uh, Robert, and Reg, uh, progressed without dropping a game as Mark Avery had a real tussle in the quarter final with um, Stephen Mulliner uh, former world champion and won the final game twin, uh, by a couple of points I think it was in the did end. he? yeah mm -hmm. so that's that might take its toll today Mark's an experienced player but uh, you don't really want to have a squeaky 3-2 in a quarter final particularly if you're playing arguably one of the best ever players in to play the game. <laughs> so, oh, so James is negotiating, getting uh, in front of Rover. Yeah, done a really nice job and there. This will now be the end of the game. All he's got to do is Early. peg out yellow and red. But he can peg out yellow in a croquet stroke, and then he's got his continuation stroke if it's needed to peg out red. There's not a lot that can go wrong at this stage, to be fair. You well, could hit the peg accidentally, you could miss the peg out, but I think he's got a nice position there to move yellow a bit closer. One of the, the saddest things that can go wrong, but if James <laughs> has made sure it didn't, is yeah. that you rotate yellow onto the peg, and that would peg yellow out, and then you have no ball to take croquet from, so it would be actually end of turn. Yeah, yellow pegged out, red pegged out, 1-0. James Deeth. One nil to James Deeth. And in some ways I'm thinking, you know, having made that silly error and still winning, it might just help sort of up his focus levels a little bit in terms of uh, game two. Well, I was going to ask you, Rich, yeah. as the mindset mm. expert. <laughs> and you. How do you think um, the players will be feeling at this stage? Yeah, I don't think that's a bad thing. I mean, you can read it many ways, right? But I think, obviously, the vast majority of James's play there was super smooth, so he's got to be feeling good about it. There's a huge advantage, I think, in uh, sort of semi-finals, finals, to having lawn time, just to settle the nerves a little bit. Because, you know, even though they played this stuff a lot, they, uh, now they do Now we're straight get on here, straight on to game two. No messing. No lunch breaks, tea breaks. Comfort breaks. Yeah. Um, now you'll notice straight away that James has played red towards the middle of the lawn. This, op this opening has a name. Uh, it's not named after a, any one particular player, but it's called the Super Shot opening. And the idea is that whatever Reg does with black, assuming he doesn't roquet red and then move the balls. James will be shooting with yellow at black.
And having said that, Reg's response is, I think, going to be a soft shot at Red. He'll be trying to hit it, but he won't want to go very far past if he misses. And then James will have to make a decision about whether to shoot hard at either Red or Black, which I expect him to, to do. So leaving two balls in the middle of the lawn. Now from Reg's reaction, I think that was very close. It looked like he thought it was on target and then it just held off slightly. Yeah. So one thing we haven't talked about yet is uh, we've had sort of unseasonally hot weather in the UK. I've just uh, noted that my iPad and phone have uh, given up the ghost temporarily because they? they're too hot. Already. So obviously that's another factor to consider is, you know, kind of fitness levels of the players in the heat. Uh, we might have some thunderstorms later, which would cool things down. But you know, game of five games in a day potentially. Uh, it's quite draining in this weather. But yeah, so I mean, James will really be looking. Oh, nice strike on black. So there. James chose to shoot from corner one, and I'm I'm guessing that he could probably make what's not, what's called a double target. In other words, mm. a target that. Uh, bigger than a single ball because you, you can set it up such that there's no there's not a big enough gap between the red and the black from where he was looking um, to enable him to actually have missed through the middle so we're in a situation that is not that uncommon at the elite level where James has hit black so he's going to send this to two and then he's going to try and make hoot one off red so there's only three balls on the lawn currently. Yeah, this is this is the advantage of the super shot opening. If he's successful, it means yeah. he gets uh, he gets to put his clip on full back to have made the first nine hoops. Yeah. Before Reg has really had an opportunity to make any hoops. It's a nice rush. He looks very smooth at the moment, James. That's not, not ideal. ideal, is it? It's just on the on the wrong side he's of hoop one. Red looks to be pretty much due north of the hoop, which means he's got to get yellow past the hoop without flicking off it, and yet still leave himself a, a hoop shot. We call this a takeoff, so um, the partner ball does actually have to move in that shot, yeah, otherwise it's illegal. He's staring at it. Can't, can't see actually it. see it. Ooh, looks a bit a bit tight. Yeah. Yeah. He's thinking, which makes me think it is possible to run the hoop. Well, given that he's not just running the hoop, it looks as though he can't run the hoop. Yeah, I think he's thinking about what sort of shot is Reg like to have with blue when he has to play that on. Um, red is not that far away from a ball where you start from. It looks as though he hasn't actually, no, he hasn't actually yeah. ended up on the south side of the hoop, so he must have been yeah. the hoop. From do you think? I think so, yeah. The I trouble mean, from our commentary position is we're looking right down the, yeah. the line of hoops, one and two, so it's not easy to tell, whereas yeah. the viewer will be able to see easily, Rich. Exactly. Exactly I mean, where yellow was. Oh, yeah, he's... Now that is... That's another mistake. Whether it will get punished or not, we don't yet know. Yeah. He's flicked off hoop four, trying to go into somewhere near the corner. Um, that indicates to me, kind of mentally, that he was quite frustrated and annoyed. So sort of lost a bit of accuracy then on the next shot, which has put a ball further up into the lawn than you'd like. Yeah, I'll have to ask him later on about that takeoff shot off red because that's, for someone of his ability, it's not a particularly difficult shot. So I wonder whether the, the lawn's not completely flat. Well, we couldn't quite see because from our position, because James was standing in the way. So yeah. whether it might have hilled to have yeah. the hoop or, or yeah. um, he just played it in a way that yellow didn't go down the right line, I don't know. It's very inconsiderate of him to stand in the commentator's view playing well, a critical we'll, shot. We'll have a word about that, shall we, Rich, <laughs> later. 
see if we can get it sorted out for yeah. the next game. And a red shooting blue at red. No, it's Mrs. Again, red that might, might have been black. a double target. And Miss he has Flip's actually black. hit black. Now, black was quite a long way away from red there, so I'm not going to say he was lucky as such, but <laughs> um, let's just say he was fortunate. Yeah, he'd be relieved to get some warm time now um, from this position. Black near two, red near one. He should be going round to fall back from here. So for those of you just tuning in, um, we're the semi-finals of the British Open. We are watching a semi-final between Reg Bamford, who's currently in play, and James Deat. James Deat is 1-0 up, best of five. And on the other lawn, it's still in game one. Robert Fletcher against Mark Avery. Uh, looks like Robert Fletcher's gone round to fall back in his first break and is just about to do some sort of leave. I think it's a little bit away from us, so we're trying to work out what's happening in the game. From well, Mark missed the lift. Ah, okay, so it's second break. With red, yeah. so okay. and Robert has chosen to rotate partner first. Right. And that's so that. Uh, he doesn't have to put, put partner to hoop two, ah, yeah. because he'd like to get it to hoop three, yeah. which is also four back the other way, so that he can start his triple peel more easily. Yeah, it makes sense. Yes, Meanwhile, Reg has got down to red at hoop one, he's rotated it, and he's now got this little takeoff. Mm. He's got in front of the hoop. He'll be glad to get his first hoop under his belt. And he will. He will. Crack on. From James' perspective, um, he'll be annoyed to get that Reds are back on the lawn because you know you've won a game one. You don't really want your partner to get any sort of lawn time at all. Uh, so this potentially. Now this a, this turn will take a bit longer than James's turns. Reg is very meticulous. Yeah. But he's just as accurate. Would you say that Reg is probably the best player of croquet strokes in the game? He's certainly one of the best. Yeah. He's got a beautiful swing. For those of you that have a standard grip, you look at Jack, um, Reg's swing, he's, got, he's a standard grip. He's just got a technically very, very good swing. Very accurate with his croquet shots. So here he's going to be sending Red to hoop three as a pioneer, and I think he will be going to yellow. But I'm wrong. Yeah, it's coming he's actually blind. coming to black. Yeah. So Red to three. I'm slightly surprised. Red's a bit short. There's an opportunity to to get yellow into the game a bit more. At this point, because he's not had much lawn time in game one, he's probably just saying, right, OK, what do I feel most comfortable with playing? Oh, we'll be quiet for a second because he's just approaching the hoop next to us. Control. Mm. 
Again, we had to have a brief break in <laughs> yes. transmission there while Reg was making hoop two. Um, so he, he was clearly he's now going to pick up yellow. Yeah. But um, I think he would have preferred red to be near a hoop three. Yeah, it was a little bit short, wasn't it, coming out? Because he, he now needs to get a rush on red. Yeah. Ideally, when you're a approaching a hoop you want to be doing it from straight in front of the hoop so that your ball is traveling along the line towards the hoop so that it's not super critical exactly how far your yeah. ball travels um, if you're approaching from the side then clearly it's, it's much more important how far your ball travels one of the important things in association croquet is try and play as many simple shots as you can. If you start playing a series of difficult shots, you can end up kind of spiraling out of control. So this controlled croquet is a high percentage way of playing. Now that's going to have mm, gone. Not happy with that. Reg has paused for thought there. You can often tell whether Reg is happy with the outcome of the stroke or not. Mm. And he's not entirely happy with that. And the reason he's not entirely happy is that he wanted to get somewhere where with yellow just then, where he can send it to hoop four. And I think that's fine. But he also needs to be able to get blue, the other side of red, to rush it to the hoop. Yeah. And he's actually, basically red is on that line that blue needs to travel. And he mustn't, he doesn't want to, to touch red in this stroke. Yeah. He wants, definitely wants to get past it, so he's got to be careful with this. Yeah, when you and he's mm. played that pretty well. Mm. well he's, again, he's not entirely happy because blue didn't go as far as he wanted. Yeah, and he's now got a cut rush to get red because he just put his mallet down there at the spot he would like to be. Yeah, um, and this is going to be a harder rush than he would have liked. Just looking at his body language, you can see that, I mean, Reg is very much into mindset and coaching. You can see that he's struggling slightly with his game. Um, so with hoop approaches, you can actually see him visibly looking to calm himself and focus. But it's clearly that it's not, he's not quite into flow yet. No, and also, um, I had a conversation with him a week ago, and he, he said he, he doesn't really enjoy playing with us this um, particular model brand of croquet ball. Ah, oh, interesting, okay. Um, but just a little bit uh, softer and rushing is a bit un more, um, more um, not random exactly, but you don't, it's harder to, c to control where the, the ball that you're rushing actually goes. It's one of the things we don't talk about very much is kind of playing conditions so you have different sorts of hoops these are more standard hoop that you'd have in the UK um, but interesting you know we're increasingly we're moving towards use of hoops that probably other parts of the world use balls rush and behave differently weather conditions lawn speed all these things have an impact on how players can play now you see the the, the knock-on effect here of not quite getting his rush on red which was caused by not quite rushing yellow into the right place before he played the croquet stroke getting a rush on red means that he's ended up with a longer hoop than he would prefer he's had to hit it harder just to be confident of getting through and he's left this longer roquet which is again is taking red further away from yeah. where he's going next so yeah. he's, he's he will pick this break up I'm pretty confident but he's it's not, uh, it's not straightforward. He's now, I'm, I'm gonna stick my neck out again. Oh, here we go. And say that he's going to black with blue, as yeah. well as sending red to hoop five. Big, big roll down to black. And he has, but. Uh, flirting with the boundary. Right? He's okay. Just slightly, but he's, he's played a good shot. So it's lovely a pace. It has, a, it has a toll. You sort of, you, you, if you have a break where you're constantly just, just trying to struggle to get things under control, it can have an impact mentally. It's going to be quite draining. 
So Reg will be trying to get these balls into position where he's playing shorter shots, he's closer to hoops. He looks to me as though he's, he's decided that, right, I have now got the balls under control. Let's just reset. Yeah. Yeah, it happens a lot that when you've had a sort of difficult, tricky start to a break, sometimes when you get the balls under control, you mentally relax and then make a really silly error. Well, it's also, yes, that Reg will be um, very keen on staying in the present, I would mm -hmm. expect. Yeah. It's very, very easy to just let your mind wander ahead, maybe to what leave you're going to make or something of that nature because you think you've now got the break under control and you're definitely going to make the hoops and it's at that point that you, you do something silly. Mm. You've kind of got these two extremes mentally, one of which is being too relaxed and you know, feeling like you're in form and, as Keith just said, they're looking too far ahead and making an error. Uh, the other extreme would be you're trying to take too much conscious control of the break um, and that can lead to errors because we're not used to playing best croquet while trying to consciously control everything. So it's kind of you need that kind of happy zone of performance where you're focused but not overly focused. Yes, yeah, so I've personally found it exhausting to put a hundred percent effort into yeah. every single stroke. Yeah. Yeah. And yet, when you play the stroke, you need to be. That's what you're concentrating on. <coughs> And nothing else. So Red's gone off, gone through the hoop, off south boundary. That's that's allowed in croquet. If you can run a hoop and go off the boundary, you'll now pick up black. And uh, yeah, looking more in control now. So he'll be feeling a bit. Yes, bit he's, more he's got a pioneer at hoop five, which is red. Um, he's got an easy roquet here, and he will be getting a ball to hoop six. So again, for those of the sort of not as familiar with association croquet or particularly advanced drills, so again, Reg will be looking to go around the hoops and he'll stop at, he'll make hoop nine or three back and then he'll leave the balls in a way because James will have a lift shot. Well, so you, 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 you say, say that all, you ah, say okay, that, Rich, if I just led you well, into a sex tuple discussion, well, we didn't rehearse that, but... <laughs> um, I, I actually think you're right. I think he will go and make nine hoops, but was he? If, if he was more confident about how the balls were going to perform, I'm pretty sure he would only make six hoops. Yeah. And if he doesn't make one back, the seventh hoop, mm. then actually he doesn't concede a lift. Yeah. But in order to justify doing that, he. Um, he would then be attempting, assuming James didn't make a roquet and take the play away from him, Reg would be attempting to do six peels on partner in his next turn, the so-called sextuple peel. Now, I still think there's a chance that Reg will be, will be making a one-back leave. I don't know. Hmm. You wouldn't normally have partner at hoop six if you were going to do that. Yeah. So Reg is kind of a sex two pool peel specialist, and he? he's done 334 according to my stats, which is phenomenal, really, just to give you an idea of scale. I'm guessing that's the most of anybody. Isn't it, it? it must be, I'm sure. Yeah. I know um, Robert Fulford has done a lot of sex two pools. So the yeah. pair of them have done many, many sex two pools. Yeah, to give you an idea of stats, so James and Reg have played a similar number of competitive games. James is about 100 more. Reg has done 334 sex tuples, and James has done 94. So it's a massive difference. And James is a very, very talented player. So Reg, sex tuples is kind of Reg's signature move. Um, what's really interesting on the other little one, so Robert Fletcher has played 450 games less than Reg and yet he's only 130 TP, TPs or triple peels behind him. So Robert yeah, Fletcher so is kind of like the king of TPs. Reg, Reg is not making a long back leave. 
yeah. I can confidently predict. Yeah. Yellow will be going as a pioneer to one back, so he's going to be making nine hoops. Um, and I think that is down to his lack of confidence with how these yeah. balls perform. Because he, he said to me that when he plays six steeples, he expects to have a couple of rushes that uh, maybe don't work or, or are tricky. Yes. Um, and when he was practicing them with these balls, um, he was finding it, it just made a, too much of a difference to his success rate. Just in my chair before I fall over. Now the rain has just started. And I'm very much hoping that it's not going to be blowing into our uh, commentary position, Rich, to be honest. Yes. Uh, could it affect that level of enjoyment somewhat? We're in a three-sided tent. Oh, there's, the, there's a, a certain amount of expensive looking electronic equipment in close proximity to where I'm sitting. Oh, there we go, here comes the rain. So Reg is off to get his waterproofs, I expect. Yeah, I think now. Uh, uh, Spectators are seeking shelter under the gazebo. Welcome or to in the uh, pavilion. This is the uh, our very English welcome to uh, Robert Fletcher. He's come over from Australia. Probably had great weather since he's been over here. And uh, now we got a pretty high, heavy rain, as predicted. Well, Robert's played a lot of croquet in Melbourne. Yeah. And from personal experience, I can tell you that Melbourne weather is equally unpredictable. Yes. So we might just have to move our microphone slightly inwards. That's going to be... playing with electronics at the moment to make sure we don't ruin any of the Croquet Association's equipment. Yeah, so Reg has come off the lawn, he's having a break under a tree quite sensibly, it's uh, coming down heavily. Some of the other players are boldly carrying on in the rain. Um, but yeah, it's pretty unpleasant. Well, it's unpleasant, but it's not unplayable. Yeah, we don't have any puddles on the lawn yet. Well, hopefully, the but um, Reg is known for just taking a break when the rain comes on, and he shouldn't really be doing that, in my opinion. I don't think it's scheduled to stop anytime soon. Robert Flex is coming off the lawn as well. No, I guess he's got a waterproof somewhere. No, oh, he'll he will have waterproofs, yeah. Just a quick update then on play. So we are the cameras are on the first semi-final of the British Open. Um, James Deeth against Reg Bamford. It's a repeat of actually last year's final, which James won. James is a game up and then made uh, an error in game two. Reg is now in going around first break. And it's proper pouring now. We call this raining cats and dogs. And in the other game we've got uh, Robert Fletcher playing against Mark Avery. Um, it looks like Robert's... Well, Robert seems to be donning waterproof gear. Reg is resolutely standing under a tree. It's a different approach. I mean, if it's uh, I've only a very short down ball, but it's not predicted to be. Well, no, this is predicted to be on for a good few hours, I think. 
Um, equally, it's not very really pleasant playing in rain, but I uh, personally would much rather play in rain than in wind. This is a bit of a sort of uh, background information on the players. So, um, Red Bramford, clearly one of the greats of the game. Uh, high time world champion, Association Croquet twice, Golf Croquet world champion. Uh, I think he's the only player who needs to hold both titles at the same time. Uh, I'll take your word for that, Rich, but yeah. it sounds plausible. That <laughs> sounds good, doesn't it? <laughs> If, if you're not sure of the stats, say it with confidence. So, how many times do you think Reg has won this event? I think it's about 12, isn't it? I think it is about 12, yes. James has won it a couple of times, isn't it? Maybe three out of two. Well, J James has won it twice, yeah, and twice. both times he beat Reg in the final. Oh, there we go, so there's a bit of a... There's some history here. Yeah, which is... Mark fun. Avery has also won this event. Right. Um, and he won't mind me mentioning that it was back in 1987. Gosh. When he was a 21-year-old. Yeah, yeah, I was going to say, he's only mid-50s. And, and he's he very not. proud of the fact that he is, he is and, and remains the, uh, the youngest ever winner. Oh, there we go. So, Robert Fletcher is a uh, one-time uh, Association World Champion. He's um, generally considered to be right up there and best players ever in the game semi-finalist in the World Championship GC last year, Golf Pro Day. Well, I've heard him described recently as the best youngster ever. Oh, wow. That's, That's a, a strong call. That is a it? strong call. But apparently call. it's endorsed by, uh, and this is hearsay, I must say, endorsed by none other than Robert Fulford, who in his day was, a, mm. I would have said, yeah. a pretty strong youngster. I was very fortunate to be coached by Rob, but you know, starting out of Colchester, and uh, you watch him practice. It's uh, the game looks really, really easy because he plays every shot so well. Well, that's the trouble with these good players, Rich. <laughs> they they do tend to make the game look easy. Um, but as we both know, when you actually get out there yourself, it can seem slightly trickier. Yeah, indeed. Well, the rain is, I would say, settling into a nice, persistent downpour. Just, just checking that our cameras aren't getting wet, but I think we're, I think we're good. Ah, oh, suddenly they turned off the water. It looks like the, the rain's stopping. Ah, we're on cam. We're on camera, Keith. Are we? Right. There we go. I mean, I'm not sure we negotiated image rights ahead of the uh, commentary, but you better stop picking your nose. <laughs> Another, other dodgy habits. Yes, going back to him, Robert Fletcher, phenomenal player, has come over here, predominantly for the uh, Association World Championships that's starting in a week's time. Uh, but he's done rather well at golf croquet since being over here. He won the. Um, British Open doubles with Dominic Nuns, one of our English players, and then won the singles title as well, so he's on form. He didn't just win it though, did he? He didn't just win it, he, he didn't dominated just win it. it. He beat Reg in the final, and the first game was 7 0. He did a 7 0 against Reg, which you don't see very often. It's fair to say Reg was impressed. Yeah. I mean, certainly in this semi final, we're seeing four strong contenders for the World Championships. You definitely would throw Robert Fulford in the mix and Matthew Essick, who was the finalist last time. Yeah, right? Matthew Essick from the States, he'll be up for it. Yeah, current Golf Croquet World Champion. Yeah, another semi-finalist, Mark Avery, as well as being the, the youngest winner of this competition a few years ago, uh, was also a member of our successful McRobertson Shield um, team, which that was last November. It's effectively the Team World Championship in Croquet. And Mark was one of the six 
English players to bring that home and uh, give Keith some credit he's very modest he was uh, the coach of that successful team and despite that they still won <laughs> I think I'll have a few people arguing that uh, you had a lot to add to the to that team Keith It was a it was a close competition that one. Uh, England came out on top, but um, very tight test against New Zealand. Meanwhile, uh, back, back in the action, uh, Robert Fletcher is back out on the lawn. Reg is uh, Reg is taking his jacket off. I'd say Reg is apprehensively viewing the weather conditions but it really it's just spitting now so it's not really any excuse not to be out there might affect the lawn speed a little bit bit of, uh, bit of know, moisture the, the top's going back on oh yeah the top is going back on i think we're perilously close to seeing reg coming back out oh, on the lawn okay. so look at the um no he's left it in an interesting position Will he remember which ball he's playing with? And looking at the weather conditions, we've got a decent chance of rain really right the way through the day. So we've kind of got to crack on with things really. But it's not particularly pleasant. Your, your Malik grip gets wet, the balls get wet, which isn't a bigger problem. The lawn conditions change. Yeah, he's coming out near one back, so we'll be quiet again for a little bit. That's the worst we get, Rich, that won't be too bad oh, for we, rain. Yeah, right? based on the forecast, you lock that in, wouldn't you? I suspect we're going to get more. But it looks quite bright at the moment. For those of you interested in the mental side of the game, there's a, if you go onto YouTube and Google Reg Bamford um, Surbiton, you'll see a talk that Reg gave at Surbiton Croquet Club on mindset. It's really good. Um, even it's something I do professionally and Keith's studied mindset as well. He said the way Reg talks about the mental side is very, very interesting. Um, that rain shower might have done him some good, you never know. He's coming back onto the lawn, he's in a good position. Gives him a chance to reset. Croquet is a very simple technical game, a uh, swing, even though all sorts of things can go wrong with your swing, as I found. So the mental side is is key, particularly in pressure situations like this one. And Reg spends a lot of time getting that side right. Not all players. Well, Reg, certainly at one time, I don't know if he still does, he had two mm. coaches. Yeah. He had a sports psychologist and he had a performance coach. Gosh, yeah. That's a decent commitment, isn't it? Well, what's he won? Twelve this <laughs> twelve times. <laughs> World AC Championship five times. Yeah. G C championship twice. Twice, yeah. So like yeah, there's some clues, aren't there? <laughs> yeah. And yet, you know, Robert Fulford is you know, probably considered one of the absolute all-time greats, if not the all-time great, has just got a naturally quite a calm, focused mindset. He's good under pressure. I don't know if he consciously thinks about mindset as much as, say, Reg does. Um, I think obviously you and I have a natural interest in it. I think even if you're naturally good at the mental side it's good to know what you're doing I think it's good to understand your natural mindset and, and make it replicable and equally if you're not too good at it then you can definitely improve it it's like going, going down to the gym you can improve your physical fitness or going on a swing train you can improve your swing 
it's the same with the mental side, you've just got to find approaches and tools that work for you. Anyway, Rich is through two back. He's, um, so, it looks as though he's intending to make a diagonal spread, so this is the lead that James used in game one. So, red will be near the peg. Uh, yellow will be over on the west side of the lawn. Cross peg from red and blue and black will be over on the east side of the lawn in a position where the peg would hamper any attempted shot by red towards yeah. them. One thing you notice with Reg is he's not if he's really unhappy about the outcome of a stroke, then he will wipe wipe it away mm. on his forehead, just above his eye. So there is a variation on this game which is optional for players. I was just in a uh, comment about it. Um, you can play a version of this game called Super Advanced, which is an extra lift at Hoop 4. It's just change players' approach to the game. Um, I don't think we'll talk about it in too much detail now to not confuse com um, spectators and viewers. Um, but, but I believe that in both both matches they've opted for what we call normal advanced. The one thing that Regal is make sure that he doesn't do is make the same mistakes James made, which is making sure that Red can be rushed to hoot one. It looks like it's in a good spot to be able to do that. I'm going to make an attempt to find out what comments are on YouTube now we've got going, Keith. Apparently I've come across slightly quieter than you, some might say that's a good thing, so... Uh, well, okay. I'll sit a little bit closer. Yeah, don't be shy, Rich. Don't <laughs> be shy. <laughs> We've known each other a few years, Keith, haven't we? So. so he's positioned yellow. He's now positioning red. He's just making sure red and yellow are cross pegged so that they can't see each other. And. He's going to get a rush on red to the east boundary. Uh -huh, I've discovered live chat on YouTube so we can see uh, the comments coming in. We've currently got 82 people watching us, Keith. Well, not watching wow. us, listening to us and watching the action. 82 people with nothing better to do, Rich. I know. Amazing. That's not saying that some of, us, some of them haven't put us on mute, but... Uh, <laughs> Eighty-two enthusiasts. Now your partner Ailsa has commented we have fork lightning in Lincolnshire, so be careful. Nice. We uh, we've got a metal cage around us, so I'm hoping that <laughs> other <laughs> things get zapped before us. But if not, it's been a pleasure, Keith, to spend my last moments commentating with you. Yeah, I'm not sure this would quite work as a Faraday cage, but anyway, I'm not. Your knowledge of physics might be a, a lot better than mine. Yeah. So I also commented that the balls are Dawson Humpty, is that is that correct? Yes, there's um, the sort of standard brand of ball in much of the croquet world. It's a Dawson. Yeah. Made by somebody called Dawson, <laughs> believe it or not. He <laughs> must have spent hours coming up with the branding. <laughs> well, yeah, it's... Yeah. <laughs> Um, but he sold the business, he retired, he sold yes. the business, um, I'm not really sure exactly how many years ago, but a few years ago. Um, and whoever took over developed a different, slightly different formula. Okay. And the upshot of that is that although the balls look exactly as they always looked, more or less, to my untrained eye, yeah. Um, 
they are just slightly, they just perform slightly differently. So, yeah. in simple terms, I would say they're a bit softer. Mm. And the effect on of on the these people at this level is that um, the ratios on Cote strokes are different. So, if you imagine playing a stop shot, the your ball will travel further than it would do with um, the old Dawson's. Yeah. Um, that's something you can get used to. Sure. Um, you just alter the, the way you play the strokes. It's the rushing that is giving people more trouble because although there are two scenarios when you're, when you're carrying out a, a, a rush. Mm. One is that your ball is still sliding when it right. reaches the target ball. Uh, in which case almost all the energy goes into the yes. target ball um, or your ball could be rolling yeah. and in which case less energy goes into the target ball but with these balls you get an extra effect that it seems as though your ball sort of just slightly sticks to the mm. target ball yeah. and almost starts to climb over it got it um, and that really reduces the amount of energy that goes yeah. into the, the target ball. So if you're used to, you know, you think, oh, this is going to go 20 yards and then it only goes 10 or yeah. 12 or big 15, then that is quite a big difference. So James has uh, said, Reg is a lovely lead, really nice lead. Um, James has lifted the ball next to Peg, his red ball, and he's going to take it to B ball, corner three, and shoot at blue and black. Yeah, this is the same lift shot that yeah. Reg took. Well, actually, it, no, it's not because Reg, Reg would have yeah. lifted the equivalent of the, the yellow, ball. but yeah. it, it's, it's the same ball. length of shot, roughly. Same, um, same sort of defensive nature. If he misses, he'll go yeah, to the, corner the four. Yeah, the thinking is that you you Oof. you put Red out of the play. Slid past the left hand side of. Uh, I'm black. not personally convinced that it's the best shot to take when you're playing somebody as good as Reg or for Reg to take when he's playing somebody as good as James but um, what would there's you an think? argument yeah. for saying you, you just find the shortest shot yeah. because it's this yeah. might be your yeah. only chance to, to get back in the game Yeah. the difference it makes by having Red down there or it can make is that instead of doing we're about to get very technical now. Instead of doing <laughs> a standard go. triple peel where you, you peel four back immediately after you have made hoop three, yes. you you um, usually get in a situation of having to do what's called a delayed triple peel, which yeah. involves attempting the four back peel, getting a rush to hoop six, which just means you've got less time Less, fewer hoops in which to organise the, the peels uh, and, the, and therefore it's potentially more likely that you won't complete it yeah. but for these players I would have said the, the difference in their chances of completing a standard triple peel versus a delayed triple peel is fairly insignificant yeah, it very much depends who you're playing against, doesn't it? So the, the elite level, as you said, the um, having to dig that ball out of corner four when conditions are like this, which are you know, relatively straightforward, uh, is, is not a problem. It's something they've been used to. Whereas you, you know, someone like my level, who is I do play internationally for Wales, but it is Wales, not England. Um, a class player, but not elite. You um, see that? Sorry to interrupt okay, you, but okay, there's yeah. a classic example of um, Reg is very accurate with his rushing normally yeah. and he would have he would have wanted blue to go beyond yellow and it may be that because of the balls it blue hasn't gone as far as he thought it was going to yeah I'm gonna um, I'm gonna step out for a moment Keith I'm gonna bring in my your protege under 21 GC world champion Aston Wade, who's also a fellow Essex team member. So I'm going to pass you over to Aston and step in and have a chat with her.
Well, welcome, welcome Aston. Right, thank you, Keith. Thank you, Rich. So bring me up to speed here, will you, Keith? Well, I don't know how much you've been watching, Aston, but we're in game two. OK. Uh, James Deeth won game one. He was doing a standard triple peel. Um, had two peels done. He needed one more peel to do, and he made a bit of a howling error, failing to get the peel in front of Rover before he made Penalt. Right, okay. Um, so he gave Reg an extra shot, but Reg missed and James finished. And in this game, James hit third turn and made arguably another howling error um, in the sense that he rushed to hoot one slightly awkwardly. He was directly north of it, but he then failed to get his ball past the hoop. Right, I saw so him running away from one, couldn't quite tell what had happened well, there. Well, he couldn't, he couldn't run the hoop. Um, and then Reg has hit fourth turn, and slightly fortuitously, I would say, because he had a, about a seven yarder, uh, which he missed, but he hit the ball in the distance uh, hoop two. Ah, oh, that's <laughs> always good, isn't it? <laughs> Anyway, he went to fall back, James has just missed the lift and Reg is starting his second break. And so he wants to do a triple peel on blue. What would you estimate the percentage chance of him completing this very, triple? Very, very high, I would say, normally. I was saying earlier on commentary that Reg doesn't feel comfortable with these balls, the Humpty Dorsey yes. balls. Yes, I don't think anyone here is particularly comfortable with them at the moment. Well, for Reg it's the rushing. He's, he relies on accurate rushing yes. lots of times. Um, and he's just not happy with them. You get quite a, you can get quite a dead contact. I've noticed quite a few of those well, you've uh, earlier played this week. With them more than I have. How did you find um, them this week? So this was actually my first event playing with the Humpties, um, and as Keith says, they don't rush quite as well as the normal Dawson balls. Um, tend to lose a bit of energy on the contact, uh, so won't necessarily go quite as far as you expect them to. Uh, and then when you're actually playing the croquet strokes, the ratios are a little bit different. Uh, they tend to pull a little, little bit more, and also roll a bit more. Uh, the normal Dawson's. Right, so as a attentive viewers will notice a, a significant difference between the way this turn is going to shape up compared with James's attempted triple peel in the previous game. If you remember, James went to the corner ball before making hoot one and therefore had a ball at this stage that was two or three yards out of the corner towards hoot four. Uh, and so James actually took his partner ball to, to hoop three with him and set up for the peel, whereas with the ball still in the corner, Reg has chosen to just continue with a three ball break for now. 
Um, so he's got no chance of peeling four back after hoop three. And I would expect that his first attempt will be before he makes hoop six. But he's still in the break building phase. So he'll be making this hoop and then we'll see which ball he sends to hoop five. It might be red or it might be yellow. But I think he will go to red before he goes to blue. Does Reg normally have a preference for which ball he sends to five here? Well, it, it, he's usually doing a sex tuple Aston, so... Well, yes, OK. <laughs> so, I haven't followed him closely on his triple peels for a while, so... We'll just have to wait and see. I mean, there are, there are several ways of continuing from here. One of them is just to tap yellow, but I don't think Reg is going to do that. Oh, it, no, unless he's hampered. No, it wasn't. You can tap yellow and leave it here and take off to red. Um, which is, it's, it's an interesting manoeuvre because lots of turns come to grief by attempting a, a 20, 20 plus yard takeoff followed by a roquet on the ball in the corner. Some people like to say it's the hardest shot in croquet, well, that one. Well, uh, yes, yes. Somebody I expect will be on commentary later will probably make that <laughs> point. Well, he's chosen to send yellow there, because the other thing he could have done is simply take off to red and send red to hoop five, but the position of blue is uh, would make that a bit awkward, because uh, he wants to come, once he's rotated red, he wants to come the other side of blue from where he's playing. Um, which just makes things a bit more awkward. Your, yours, if you just hit, miss, miss hit it slightly, you might spray black towards blue and you actually make a roquet, or you, or you in, in attempting to make sure you go past, you leave a longer roquet, or, or you decide that, no, I'm good enough to just get myself a two or three foot roquet, and then you end up short. Lots of ways to go wrong. Lots of ways to go wrong. So if he could have placed blue, I think he would have put it more or less level with the hoop. So another three yards further south from where it is now. Right, so, okay, this is one of the plans. This does, by, by croqueting red all the way up towards four back, it does give him the, the option of, when he makes hoop four, um, playing it in such a way that after making the hoop he can rush blue up towards four back. And if he does that accurately enough, then he could get a go at the peel before hoop five. That would be nice. It would be nice. It's always good to get the four back peel done. Reg, as we said earlier, is normally very good with his rushing out of hoops. So better chance than most people of getting this peel done after hoop four. Well, you just need an amount of accuracy. And I, was, I was saying earlier that the ideally when you approach a hoop you approach it from in in front so you're going towards the hoop with your ball down the line that you're down going the to. line is always good yeah Reg has had to approach from the side here which is just a little bit trickier and I can't quite tell from our commentary position exactly where blue is but he won't want to rotate on the hoop shot Okay, so we're getting an update from the other game, Robert Fletcher against Mark Avery. Uh, Robert Fletcher is now rover and penalt. Uh, Mark has just made it through one back with his first ball round. Well, that suggests to me that Robert broke down on a triple peel. It does, which you certainly wouldn't expect. He's been no. playing very well all week so far. Um, so some errors starting to creep in there. Right, so Reg didn't rotate blue running the hoop and he's now played his rush. I think he'll be pretty happy with that. I would well, be. I think you can have a go at that there, can't you? Oh, definitely. Even if it just ends up in the jaws, that's good. Yes, you can rush peel you, it after five. You can. But if he did get it peeled, then he'd be in a position where he could, he could get a standard triple peel back on track 
so for the standard triple peel you you peel penalt after making hoop six. Right, we've now got the, um, what did you call it? I think it's called the dead cat. We've got a dead cat on the microphone now, just to dampen out some of the background noise. So Reg is, Reg is lining up his fallback peel, so he'll, but he'll be keeping half an eye on where black goes because he wants to, he wants to get a rush on red. But he's played it straight there, Aston, did you see that? Yes, so that so reduces that the risk of any pull absolutely. taking the ball offline. It makes um, it much easier, much more likely that you can get the peel. Because pull, we haven't explained what pull is, but when you play a croquet stroke that isn't a straight croquet stroke, so your ball is, is not going down the same line that the croquet ball is going, um, you find that the, the croquet ball won't simply go down the line joining the centres of the two balls like you might think it would it actually is pulled in the direction that you send your ball so if you're split to the left then a croquet ball will pull slightly to the left and when you're playing croquet strokes it won't be obvious watching it on here but the players actually have to aim to allow for that pull and therefore if you're attempting a peel uh, you would have to, uh, and you were doing it with a split croquet stroke, you would have to allow for pull. And, it, and it's, sometimes you have to do that, but if you've got the option you'd rather not, because the, the pull can be a little bit unpredictable. And you may be thinking, well, what does pull depend on, Keith? And I think the answer to that question is it can depend on the actually depend on the lawn conditions depends on what type of shot you're playing uh, and dare I say it also depends on the balls that you're playing with So what lawn conditions tend to exaggerate Paul? Well I was hoping you weren't going to ask that oh but if the conditions are dry I would say that if the conditions are dry and fast then you don't get quite as much pull and I'm just going to speculate Aston that the reason for that is that the balls aren't quite in contact for as long as they would be on a on a slower lawn. Okay. Does that sound plausible? I think that sounds plausible. It's it? plausible I'm not sure it's true but anyway um, Anyway, so back to Reg. So Reg got his peel, as we saw, and he's made to five. He hasn't quite got a rush exactly where he wanted. He, I think probably he would have wanted it somewhere like corner three, or but he's 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 done okay. But, I mean, he'll be happy with that. And he's just looking up at the, how much rain's going to be coming down. So he's got a, another excuse to get off and shelter for a bit. Has it noticeably affected the lawn speed so far? Well, I'd, not to my eye, okay. to be honest. Um, so this this ball can now go to one bag to continue the, the break, and he will be keen to collect blue and bring it over to Penalt. So he's, he's actually, if this works, he will have got himself back into the same situation that James managed to create. Now again, he's not happy. He's yes. not happy. You can see he's not happy. Life had he's gone a little bit further there. He could have rushed Blue closer to Penalt here. Absolutely. Uh, now yes. he's going to have to play a bit of a role to get it into position and to get on Red. Yeah, well, Red's south of the hoop, so... If he'd known this was going to happen, he would probably have had red level with the hoop. But anyway. That's where the rush out of five is quite important. The so rush out of five. If he'd been able to play it into corner three, uh, he would have been approaching blue along the line of blue to penalt. Um, he would so indeed. That croquet stroke would have been a bit easier. 
very well observed, he would indeed. So in that case, he was actually coming across the line with black and he didn't get far enough across it. Don't we? So he's actually chosen to play a similar shot to the one James played and he's played it equally well. So this is very similar to the position James got into and he managed to get the penalt peel after okay. the six. Which is just taking a moment to decide it's not so much making hoop six here, it's where to put red. James actually chose to put red slightly north of the hoop on the uh, on the west side, and it looks like Reg has put it slightly north of the hoop on the east side. Do you have a preference for where you like uh, Reg? We I'm call it the escape ball because it's the ball you, after you've done the peel, you want another ball to, to rotate. So I normally prefer Red on the west side here. Uh, then after the peel, you can rush it back a little bit straighter along the line of sending it to two back. Um, I think because yellow is a little bit east of one back here, um, he's put it on the eastern side of the hoop so that he has a bit more space um, when he has to send red down to two back later on. Now just the reporting on the other lawn, I can see that Mark Avery's gone to four back. Um, and Robert Fletcher has missed his lift shot, so and Mark has rushed to hoop one with a ball at hoop two, so he's got a good chance of, well, he should have a good chance of, of winning that game, certainly um, making big inroads into the uh, Robert Fletcher's lead. It's not a straightforward approach to one for Mark there. Um, he's got a slightly longer, more angled hoop than I think he'd want, but we'll see if he can make it. Yeah. yeah, makes it look easy. Yeah, just got the right amount of wire to give himself a short rokeh. Right, so Reg, Reg has got this peel, so I'm guessing he's just going to play it straight again. He'll probably rush Red further east, maybe northeast. pace do you think he'll be playing this at? If we, if we play it with a stop shot, so it's all governed by how far he wants black to go. Okay, well that's, that's actually just as good an outcome, or pretty much as, as good an outcome as peeling it. Yeah, so but what it means it, is In fact, it's a much better outcome than peeling it by about an inch. Yeah. Uh, so here, after he makes one back, he'll be able to rush peel blue, uh, getting it down the lawn. Whereas if it had just rolled through by an inch, uh, it's much harder to get a rush on it uh, down to the south. So I think he'll be quite happy with that outcome there. So Red, Red will now be going to two back for it as a pioneer coming over to yellow and he will want to stay to the east of yellow so he can rush yellow in front of the hoop. He won't want to approach from where it is now.
now. That's that's maybe okay, but I think he wanted to get beyond yellow then to rush it back north. It makes getting on blue a little bit easier uh, if you can rush it back down towards the north boundary. Question here is, has he got enough room? I think he probably has to get yellow all the way to three back and stay north of blue to get the rush peel. I think there's enough space here, yeah. I don't know if you noticed, but just before he approached one back, he did give a little shake of the head about the fact that the rush didn't go far enough. Well, it's okay. So it's um, a couple of short pioneers now. Red isn't quite as far towards two back as he'd like, and yellow no. hasn't gone quite as far towards three and back it, as he'd like. And it's actually yellow. Well, we'll see. I expect we'll see him wanting to peel Rover going to yellow and that's actually quite awkward if yellow if you can imagine the line joining hoops four and five if yellow isn't to the south of that line it can actually make the, this peel of rover a bit more awkward it's definitely a lot more awkward now that yellow isn't south of rover so well we'll see too. if he still chooses to attempt it okay he's, he's Disappeared to put his top on. Rain has just increased a little bit over the past couple of minutes. Yeah. So he'll rush the, rush peel this, and now would you expect him? I think. I think I would expect him to rush peel this to somewhere. Probably. I don't know. Maybe a peg high. Or maybe short of that, where he can play a croquet stroke, a split shot, sending blue down to Rover, go, getting onto red, rather than trying to rush red, uh, trying to rush blue all the way down to Rover. Yes. Yeah, so if you try and rush blue into good position, you do have the option of playing a thick takeoff if needs be to try and fix it, getting on red. Uh, but I think he'll just back his croquet stroke to place it into the position he wants. So. We'll see where he rushes this to, but I think north of the peg is probably sensible. Thing is, if you there are play, if you try to rush it all the way to Rover, there, there are almost certainly positions it could go in where you can't improve its position and get onto red. That is true. It depends how it comes off the wire here. Yeah. So if it goes straight down the line of Penalt and Rover, then that's good. But if it comes off at an angle, it can be quite difficult to fix it with the takeoff. Right. So he's managed, I think he's managed to demonstrate what I, I was saying. I think he's found one of those positions, hasn't yeah. he Keith? So it's hard to get blue closer to Rover than it currently is whilst also getting on red. So I think he'll just play a thin takeoff, not moving blue very far, um, ensuring that he gets a rush on red to make two back with some control. Meanwhile, Mark Avery has just made hoop four, he's got a Pioneer at five and his partner ball is up at four back, it's not in the jaws of the hoop, but he has gone back after hoop four. Maybe he's hoping he can rush peel it. Hard to tell from our position whether it's in front for him over there. Um, certainly close to well, the hoop. Well, he's, so. putting, he's putting black to hoop six, which suggests to me that he's fairly confident he can rush peel this, which I don't know. I'm trying to keep an eye on Reg. And he has he has rush peeled it. Right. Anyway, meanwhile Reg has obviously rushed to two back quite well. What he will find though is because he couldn't improve blue, he now needs to get an accurate rush on blue. And then the, the one thing that he's been struggling with, or at least he's not confident about, it, is playing the controlled rush on blue. So I was talking earlier with Chris Clark and Samir about the importance of getting rushes out of hoops and rushes to hoops, um, and I think that's something which Reg is really good at. Um, Robbie Fletcher, very good at that as well. Um, you know, it's a key aspect of the top players 
that they will get control brushes out of their hoops. Um, so we were talking about a few practice routines for that. Um, so one of the w ones that Samir suggested was keeping a ball either close to the peg or close to a corner and rushing back to it after each hoop, leaving a ball in the corner or by the peg while you get a rush to your next hoop uh, and just repeating that. So it's not a standard break, but you're practicing rushing out of hoops to a particular point on the lawn and then rushing from that point to your next hoop. Uh, so that's definitely something I'll be looking at working on. And it just makes these triple peels and uh, standard break play so much easier uh, if you can get the rushes you want out of hoops. It does because one of the um, on our Reg's okay, Reg, so I'm just interrupting myself there. Reg is going to do or try and do the same manoeuvre that James attempted. So he can't peel blue in this stroke, so I think he's going to send blue northwest of three back. Yes, so blue will become the reception ball when he runs three back. Uh, he'll then try and rush it over to position in front of Rover to attempt the peel, uh, going to yellow. If you can't manage that, uh, he'll just leave it in a nice position in front of Rover uh, to come back to you later for a straight Rover peel. Yeah, so going back to the importance of getting rushes out of hoops, it just well, one of the things it, it means is that when you play the croquet stroke immediately after making a hoop, um, you generally um, get to move your ball a shorter distance. And moving the striker's ball a shorter distance should theoretically make uh, everything more accurate. So this is very similar to the position James was in. Let's see if Reg is better at rushing in front of Rover. Now James had a much shorter rush from memory. Uh, but he didn't get it, he didn't reach the hoop and it was actually because of that and how things happened subsequently that meant that he didn't finish. Reg is... Um, That's going to be quite actually, difficult. He, he, I, mm, I think he miscut that slightly. Potentially if he, if he had actually got the the angle of the cut right, he might have got blue. I think the pace was good front. on that if he'd hit it where he wanted to. Um, but he, he can have a go at this again, getting in the jaws is a good outcome. Getting in the jaws I think would be a fantastic outcome. But hopefully you hit enough of the hoop that blue stays near without actually gluing on a wire. Oh, well, there you go. That's very good. That's pretty good. And an excellent black as well to rush yellow, close to red. Well, Reg is very, very good at croquet strokes, generally. Um, so he gives himself nice short rushes like this. So, you might be thinking that well, oh, Blue's, Blue's going to be a nice pioneer for Rover, but actually he's going to put a deal of effort into making sure that Red gets down to Rover, so that when he does, he will go and rush Peel Blue before he uses Red, and therefore he can send Blue t to the peg, ready for the peg out, and use Red to make the hoop. But we're a few strokes away from that. I think yeah. we can be fairly confident that this triple is likely to finish. Well, that's what we said about James. Okay. <laughs> but yes, I think this is pretty likely to finish. 
So you alluded to the fact earlier, Keith, that Reg is normally playing sextuples. Yes. Uh, I've seen him attempt a couple earlier in the week, uh, which didn't quite come off. Uh, do you think he's not going to be attempting them at all today or in the I, final, I, or do you think he'll well, switch back? It's interesting. I mean, he's, I think he's he won't actually. James also tried a couple of sextuples uh, in his quarter-final yesterday against David Warhurst. Uh, again, didn't manage to complete either of them. Uh, he actually made 12 peels over the course of the three games uh, without any actual letters, uh, which was quite impressive. Well, J James is possibly our most entertaining player. I think that's fair. On the circuit. Um, the rate at which he plays is certainly good for the crowd. And the number of peels that he attempts, the things he tries, all makes for uh, something spectacular quite often. Now, you see this, this is quite important where it goes and that's, I don't think he'll be entirely satisfied with that. Uh, again, a little bit further there on red would have been nice. Because again, once he's rushed peeled blue, he wants to put blue back to the peg. He'll be able to do that, but he also needs to get north of red. And that won't be so easy. I mean, I'm sure he'll probably cope, but we're looking for perfection here. We right? are. It's what you expect from the final stages of the Open particularly going into the world in about a week's time? Well, yes, I mean, I, I would hesitate to describe this as a warm-up event for the Worlds, but yes, yeah, some of the players will certainly be wanting to peak in uh, a couple of weeks' time. And that should be a fascinating event. It's uh, held in London, well, with uh, clubs in and around London. The headquarters is one of your clubs, Aston, isn't it? The Hurlingham uh, it is. Club. The Hurlingham Club will be the main venue for that event. Um, though I believe there are seven venues around London in total. Now, Reg has obviously made me look an idiot by going to Red first. I wasn't expecting that. Um, he may have actually changed his mind there. After red I, wasn't I suspect particularly so. good. Yes, I, I think his original plan would have been to rush peel blue and, and go to red, but with red where it was, it's, now you have to be just a little bit careful, which I'm sure Reg will be. He's effectively turned this into just doing a, a straight rover peel in the normal way, although he's, he's obviously his blue is in a very good position, so you'd expect him to not make one of the dozen or so errors that you can make No, I think this is about as easy as a straight row of appeal gets here. I've certainly made a few of those errors with my rover appeals so far this tournament. Uh, plenty of things that can go wrong, but Reg here with nice control. All he really requires now is a rush on blue close to the peg uh, to peg out and take and a one all one all. Indeed, and you'll notice that he's he's still giving us maximum attention because he doesn't just want any old rush to the peg. He will want a very, very easy rush. So there's absolutely no chance that he will rush it into hoop five, which is embarrassing. Um, or, or rush it on a line too far away from the peg. No, he's good. No, I can't tell exactly how long that is, but about a foot, uh, 15 a inches, foot something of, yeah. like that. Um, generally, you don't want to pay, play this with enough pace to go past the peg. That is also uh, a good point. So, if you actually hit blue into the peg here, that's the end of your turn. Blue will go off the lawn, but black will stay where it finishes. It's called Grievous. It is. Known, its full name is The Grievous Error. Oh. Uh, but Red has been sure to avoid that by just rushing it slightly offline so there's no risk of it going into the peg. Uh, and he'll now be fairly confident with this relatively simple peg out here. He'll still be sure to take his time. Um, you don't want to go wrong having done all the hard work.
no, he'll concentrate on this, but um, you'd be disappointed to miss the peg out from you, here, You'd be very you? disappointed. There we go. Right. A so. smattering of applause from the, the crowd. Now, that's one all. Um, the other match... <laughs> The other match is, is still in the first game, and I don't know if we've got this on, on the screen, but uh, Mark Avery is approaching Penalt. He's got his partner ball in the jaws of Rover, uh, having done two peels of his triple peel, so he's just got to complete that peel and peg it out. And unlike Reg, he's actually got the other opponent ball about a foot from Rover, so he'll have no trouble. Oh, well, he's calling for a referee about something before he approaches Penal. Um, he'll have no trouble, famous last words, uh, <laughs> rush peeling red, his partner ball, and then croquet it towards the peg before he makes Rover with black, using black. Jenny's coming on the lawn now uh, to do some lawn repairs, so it may be that there's an old hoop hole or a divot uh, in the way She's of Mark's got a shot. Bucket and spade. Now, yes, this is um, apparently this was an issue that arose yesterday about where these matches were going to be played because uh, lawn seven in particular seems to be very attractive to squirrels. We've had quite a few squirrels on the lawn, um, digging up some holes. So I think the manager's been keeping an eye on it. Um, oh. Lawn's at the moment in good condition. Uh, we've actually restarted here. We uh, have. Reg versus lawn James. Three. No, no, no break in this play. And we're straight on. So we're having a similar opening to game one. So Reg here has gone with a standard ball over on the east boundary, uh, about 10 yards north of corner four. Uh, James has replied with the defensive shot, uh, just going a foot south of corner two. Uh, Reg there just clips his ball on the east boundary. Right, so Reg has done exactly what he did in game one, which is hit third turn. Um, he's got no real chance of making a break, and he's going to do... He's in a slightly different position here, because in, in game one when he hit, he was taking croquet from, oh, I'd say, a good eight yards further south than he is now. So he's going to come to yellow again. Um, yeah, he's got no real chance of making hoops this turn, so he's just going to bring yellow out of the corner. Um, I expect him to leave a rush to it, like he did in game one, and then he'll hope that James misses his shot. Uh, meanwhile, Mark has successfully completed the peels, he's made the rover and he's now pegging out. So that's 1-0 to... will be 1-0, just waiting for the peg out. And it is now 1-0 to Mark Avery. So, Robert's, Robert Fletcher's been punished for whatever error he made in his triple. Is that 
the first game Robert Fletcher's dropped this event? Uh, it could well be. Might yes, be. It's, it sounds plausible. It's, it's definitely plausible. Uh, he won the GC Open uh, recently without dropping a game. Uh, Did he not? Very impressive achievement. I've just got a feeling that after day one he was on three out of four. I think he might have been, but I can't figure There's out a, who he lost to. There were only two people on four out of four, Sam Murray and Omid Hallam. Omid took a game off Reg. Um, so yeah, it may have been Sam. Yeah, I don't honestly know. I don't think it will phase Robert too much, really. It won't, no. Uh, very composed player. So, right, so Reg has moved yellow out of a corner. He's put it pretty much where he put it in the first game and he's left a rush to it as he did in the first game. So, in the first game, James uh, played his red ball from a bulk and shot at yellow from down near corner one. Okay. Uh, and he looks like he's going to do the same again. He has got good memories of it because he not only hit it, but he rushed it to hoop two, or just north of hoop two. He's reconsidering. I think this is the shot that I'd be taking. Um, black and blue are actually quite far north, so yep, I think is, this is probably the shortest shot available. I think it looks like the shortest shot because I might even be, could they be north of the peg? Uh, I think, I think possibly. Uh, well, in which case, uh, they're either is, level or north of the peg. This, so. this is 16 yards or so. In the other game, in game two, uh, there's been a super shot opening by Mark, and Robert has done what Reg did, which was to. Well, I think he has. I didn't actually see him play the stroke, but there's a, there are now two balls in the middle. Uh, right in the middle there with James's shot, so I'll have the yeah, first opportunity for a break. It is. It's not ideal. Um, I mean, it could have been worse. He could have rushed it all the way to the south boundary. He could, which I did earlier in the week. Um, well done. Just makes getting the rush on blue over to yellow a little bit more difficult now that it's further away. Yeah, and that rush is quite important. Although James is deciding that he can do something useful with black as well as getting a rush on blue. OK, I'm not sure that's a rush to yellow but he might be able to rush to hoop one. Could rush directly to one here, now that he's sent out a Pioneer to hoop two. Well, it's not an ideal rush over to one there. <laughs> no. Um, so uh, well, uh, about choices. Yeah. He hasn't used yellow. And you'd, you often get in situations like this where you have to calculate am I more likely to be approaching from closer to the hoop if I go and use the ball I haven't yet used? Which I think in this case is it's probably be, true. Blue's it, quite far away so any kind of rush on yellow should give him a better opportunity to approach the hoop. Yeah, and he's played a good takeoff. Oh, he's closer. He's closer. But he's not um, close. Again, not a brilliant rush there. The line was good, but hasn't gone as far as he was hoping it might do. So a reverse takeoff approach to the hoop. Um, quite a big shot, this. Swapping out commentators again, Keith's uh, going to take a break for a little bit and Rich Waterman, my Essex team captain, is going to rejoin us. Good to be back, Aston. 
I'm Essex team captain more because of the fact I'm good at organising and motivating rather than quality of play, but equally important. <laughs> James has made it through one now, so should have control over this break. Do we think he'll take it round four back or set up for a sex duple? Yeah, you never quite know with James. It's, uh, he's playing well, he's clearly in flow. He looks very relaxed. I had a chat with him off the lawn. So it could be in his thoughts to lay up for a sex duple. Let's see. It'd be nice if someone did one. So we it would be, yes. Talk through the nuances. Might want to get Keith back for that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've never. I've done five out of the six peels in practice. I've never done one in competition or practice. Keith and I have had a go at some alternate stroke sex duples in practice. Um, we've got all the peels done on one occasion, but um, then managed to fail a return roque. <laughs> so nearly there. That's good. So yeah, it's not a dissimilar start to game one. Uh, James hit the full shot and it's going round. That is the trouble with the dream leave that Reg left there, is that if James does hit in, uh, it's not too complicated for him to try and get a break going. Yeah. Yeah, it's probably more of an aggressive leave, isn't it? But, uh... Yeah, so going over to corner two and digging out James's ball earlier, um, basically just gives the first break um, to Reg if James misses, uh, but hands it to James if he hits. And once again, he's hit the lift, uh, well, the shot from b -Bulk. Uh, and has taken the first break. Over on the other lawn, uh, Mark Avery has managed to win the opening. Um, so from what I saw, uh, it was a super shot opening. Uh, Robert Fletcher lagged up to near the peg with his second ball. Uh, Mark decided to dribble at it rather than risk missing into B-Bulk. Uh, and I think Robert must have then missed a shot uh, and let Mark get going. Yeah, just looking at Mark off the lawn then after game one, um, he looked looked very relaxed. So uh, yeah, he's a he's a you know, involved. Robert Fretcher is number one in the world. Mark's a formidable opponent. Nothing seems to particularly bother Mark. He's very naturally laid back no. character. Definitely helpful when it comes to croquet, staying relaxed. Has Mark won the AC Open before? Do we he know? He has, yeah. He was actually the youngest ever winner. All oh, right. That was a stat from Keith. You know, I've got an iPad full of them. That one was one of Keith's. <laughs> Very good. From memory. And obviously with the World Championships just a week away now, which uh, looking forward to seeing you playing in Aston. It's, uh, yes, yeah, we mentioned that earlier. Um, should be exciting. We'll have live streaming set up there as well. Are you going to be able to watch any of that? Yeah, I'm going to be hopefully commentating for the first few days oh, in Hurlingham. So yeah, looking forward to that. It's actually my first time seeing Robert Fletcher and uh, Reg Bamford live, so I'm uh, very yeah. privileged. Again, you can see the speed that James is playing at now, that he's feeling very comfortable. He's, uh, he's a quick player and uh, he tends to play very, very well when he's playing like this. It's just that he's comfortable. Yeah, he gets into a very nice flow. So he's put out an early Pioneer to two back here, which would indicate that he's going around to full back rather than stopping before one back. Um, I think probably the sensible play here. Yeah. It's a nice pattern of play that after six to get an early pioneer out to two back. It's a shorter shot. Uh, and so generally in croquet we are looking to play short, simple shots. And you see from the best players they do make it look very, very simple because they've got such great control. Um, the gentleman sitting next to me is an uh, excellent control player as well. I, uh, I'm very good at scrambling. It's not quite as true as I'd like it to be, <laughs> but... <laughs> we'll take that one. So James just approaching one back, so we'll be a little bit quieter for him. It's 
So that's now a lift for rear jazz and when James finishes. So I think I'd be remiss of us, Aston, not to at least briefly mention the last time we spent significant time together, which was in the inter counties for Essex. Yes, yeah. And uh, it's it good came, fun. came down to the last game. We had to win to avoid relegation. And uh, I think it's fair to say I definitely wasn't playing well halfway through the game. You had a couple of. It, was, it wasn't brilliant, was it? Yeah. Um, and then we uh, we suddenly got going. Uh, yeah, managed to pull it out, picked up quite a difficult break. Um, yes. Had some tricky shots in the middle of it. A couple of long hit ins and difficult hoops, but got round, did what we needed to do. Yeah, um, saved ourselves from relegation. Yeah, happy days. We had quite a crowd at the end. But, uh, Aston's a, is an a amazing performer under pressure. I, I quite enjoy it as well, to be fair. So uh, it was a really fun experience. I think we agreed it might have been one of our favourite turns at the counties. I think so. Uh, for both of us. Yeah. So, yeah. so counties is a, well, the inter counties technically is a competition. We play both in golf croquet and association croquet where for those of you abroad the counties of England of which Aston Mike represent Essex play against each other over a few days. It's all doubles in association croquet. Really good fun, good social occasion, usually uh, at the end of May bank holiday. And I think uh, it's the largest croquet tournament we have isn't it in terms of players? Yeah, it would be yeah. James is just, yeah, he's in good shape here. He's um, going to leave blue somewhere near the peg, go to black, make three back. And then we're probably going to see yet another diagonal spread leave. It's not the only leave you can do in these situations, but it is highly favoured by a lot of the top guys. We may see another one over the next couple of days. If so, we'll explain what the thinking is. But this is a very good general all-purpose leave after you've taken a ball round to a uh, fallback. I'm willing to bet that Blue will be rushable to one after James made that mistake in the game one Arch. where it wasn't rushable. He had to go off to corner four and pick up another ball. That's a bit unfortunate. Yeah. It's tight but it looks a, a good angle from here. So Black being sent over towards west boundary just west of the line of one and two. It's a nice position. Black can't see blue. And then ideally, yeah, just nudges blue onto peg. Ideally blue also won't have a shot at red and yellow when James lays up in a second. It's a kind of a classic spread. Whereabouts do you think he's looking to lay up maximum distance? Yeah, normally I think I think with given the, the quality of shooting of both players, it's interesting the, the two leads that James has done and also the lead that Reg did was pretty much at what's called maximum distance. So basically you're trying to leave a longer shot possible for Reg when he lifts either blue or black. Um, so you're trying to minimise his chance obviously of hitting you. I think I was saying earlier on in the commentary that mistake I think um, kind of the better B class players and the weaker A class of which I'm one is we tend to go a little bit too far south here and you leave a shorter shot. So yeah if you're further south and the opponent shoots at you from A bulk uh, it's a little bit easier to pick up the break and potentially a triple Yeah, because um, they go off the boundary right next to your ball so you can pop them out uh, getting your rush again. Uh, right. If you're further north um, then the shot from B ball becomes either the same distance or shorter uh, and they can take that missing down into the fourth corner which just makes it a little bit more difficult for you to pull out the break uh, so generally um, A and B class players uh, weaker end of A class players uh, will lay up a little bit further south to encourage the shot from A ball uh, or make the shot from B ball longer um, but for these players um, they're fairly happy digging out a triple either way so it's just a case of making the opponent shot as long as possible uh, hence maximum distance here. So again I'll probably be expecting Reg to pick up blue or black and probably shoot from b-ball like he did last time unless he's got something else that he likes the look of. 
The advantage of shooting from B ball down through red and yellow is that ball, if he misses, end up in corner four, which makes any triple peel attempt by James on his next turn a, a bit more tricky. It tends to just delay things a little bit. Mark Avery on the lawn in play on the other match. Just starting to go round by the looks of it. Mark had a very exciting game against Stephen Molyneux yesterday, uh, yeah. which was the only quarter-final to go to five. Uh, all the others were sorted 3-0. Uh, Mark took the first two games of that. Uh, Stephen made a comeback, taking the next two, and they had a very close game. Could have gone either way in the fifth. Uh, um, Mark managed to hit in on a couple of long shots um, and finished off. So, Ooh. Oh, Red has just clipped that yellow, only moved it about an inch. That's all you need in this game, so from where the balls are now, he's got a very, very good chance of being able to take his own blue ball around to fall back. Yeah, it's an interesting one with the... Um, yeah, you don't want too many easy games in the tournament, but equally, you know, a, a best of five tight match against Stephen Mulliner. It's going to have a certain impact on your kind of physical and mental... It can be quite draining playing yeah. all day um, before then having to come out and produce another really good performance uh, in the semi-final. Um, obviously that's something they talk about at Wimbledon at the moment. Mm. Players have to play late. Um, you know, Is that going to affect their play the following day? Um, a lesser extent with croquet being not quite so physical as tennis, but mm. you know, it does still drain you to be playing all day, both mentally and physically. Mm. Yeah, obviously all the players playing here are very experienced, they're used to best of five games, they're used to having late finishes. Um, certainly from my own observations, I'm kind of okay with best of threes, I've kind of got used to that now, having played a bit of tournament play, but uh, yeah, best of fives, that takes a certain level of concentration. I would certainly think that Mark Avery's best chance, because uh, obviously Robert Fletcher is a phenomenal player, would be to probably get ahead quick and stay ahead. You know, he's probably If he's going to win it, it's probably going to be a 3-0 or a 3-1. Um, I think the longer it goes in, the more you'd start to favour Robert, who's um, you know, he's, not, he's world number one for, for a reason. Still not 30 and uh, already considered one of the best players to ever play the game. I think he's 30 in July, if I'm correct. So, uh, a baby in croquet terms, not as young as my good friend Aston here, but uh, yeah, young for association croquet. Do you know how old he was when he won his world championship? Gosh, yeah, it's going to be a few years ago now. It's going to be early 20s, I would think. Um, I'll have to maybe look that up in a second. Um, but yeah, he was he was a yeah. Well, I keep saying earlier on that I generally reckon to be. The best young player there's ever been, so that's pretty pretty high compliment. Oh, absolutely, there's been a few before him. Let's see if I can find a, a detailed answer to your question. I think I was talking to Keith recently about his top five greatest players of all time. Oh, yeah. Uh, Robert Fletcher, already in there, uh, yeah, despite yeah. his young age. Yeah, that's um, that says a lot, doesn't it? Um, Reg Bamford also on that list. Yeah. Reg is just... Uh, I was saying earlier that like, the quality of Reg's swing and the precision of his croquet shots really is... If you want to watch how to play great shots, Reg would be right up there in terms of people to watch. And to be fair, like all four semi-finalists have all got really great technique. It's not no accident that they've made it to the semi-finals. So Robert Fletcher won in 2013, so he might even have been 19 then. Wow. When he won that ten years ago. Red's obviously current world champion, beat uh, 
Matthew Essek in 2020. Matthew Essek, another great young player, um, current golf croquet world champion. And as I mentioned, I think when I handed over, like we, in one of my left, is uh, became the under 21 gold croquet world champion in January. We we're very proud of him. Yep, and exciting also, event in New Zealand. We also got European champion and Open champion in gold croquet to add to that as well. Uh, yeah, in yeah. the past. Well done. Um, so, couldn't quite retain the European Championships this year. Uh, yeah. Got bested by Rachel, uh, who I beat back in 2022. Yeah. So, I think, I think that's fair, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, nice uh, agreement to split. Rotate the titles around. Exactly. I think it's, you know, it's definitely a, a skill, being able to perform under high levels of pressure. You see that some croquet players are very good at practicing, very good when the game doesn't matter and then you get to a semi-final of a competition like this, the pressure is huge and not necessarily showing it because the croquet is very good standard but it's something they probably get used to a little bit but it's uh, still uh, something you have to deal with. I always used to get very nervous before tournaments, mm. uh, whatever the level of tournament. So. Yeah. That is something that I've worked on through experience. Yeah. It's just glued to, so we're a bit quieter. So what we've got here is um, you know, classic, what we call the four ball break position. So those that are maybe a newer to association croquet, he's going to send this ball down to hoop four, which is his next but one hoop. He'll use yellow in the middle to kind of reposition a little bit. We call that the pivot ball in the middle. And then he's got a, a black ball ready to make hoop three. So this is how you can create a break and go around and put basically as many hoops as you want um, once you've got control like this. So given the conditions and, and given how Ridge is now playing, you'd strongly expect him to be able to go around to fall back. Think, uh, there's some debris on the ball or something. Reg is just Reg is just asking if he can clean blue. I think <laughs> James Pike in hand strolling out to the lawn. Oh, okay, I think it might be it's a bit of lawn damage, maybe a small hole in the lawn, and you're allowed to just move move blue to a better spot. Otherwise, it impacts. How well blue, blue can strike yellow. Yeah, but it's a ball out of a hole that can get a bit of height. Mm. Uh, either contact the ball on the top, which won't send it so far, or go completely over the top. Mm. Uh, James had a rush on one of these lawns the other day. Um, very short rush, hit it really hard. Ball was in a hole he hadn't realised and it went completely over the top. Yeah. So always worth just checking if you think it's in a hole. That's kind of like the croquet is a game of etiquette, so it's always nice just to check in with your opponent that they're happy for you to move the ball. It's a very much a gentleman's game, for a better phrase, even though uh, so we've got some very high quality female players here as well. Got the Women's GC Worlds in August, uh, which I believe will also be live streaming. Uh, so I'm planning to go down and watch some of that, maybe do some commentary there as well. Yeah, that's... Yeah, looking forward to that. One of my uh, croquet friends, Cheryl Bromley, is coming over from the States for that one, so it'll be good to see her playing. And yeah, it could be, it could be interesting too. I think there's a number of potential winners of that. The Egyptian ladies are always very strong. But uh, yeah, it could, be, uh, could be come from a number of potential winners. And, and, and equally, I, you know, if the conditions are relatively straightforward, the Association World Championships that are coming up in a week's time, there could be a number of winners, but it just seems to be that generally the uh, the top, top, you've kind of got the elite level, then you've got the super elite, so... Yeah, yeah. I, th I think most people would either back Rob Fulford, Reg Bamford, uh, or Robert Fletcher to win yeah, that. Um, I think I think those would be the, the big three. I think Matthew Essex definitely is in that in that discussion. Don't know how much association he's been playing recently. 
but yeah, the first three you mentioned, obviously being previous world champions. I'm pretty sure he's, um, I'm not sure if Paddy Chapman's coming over as well. I he's, don't think he's playing don't think this year. He's playing right, so he would be another one that would be on the in that mention. I think anyone that's won it before has always got to be considered a contender. You don't tend to have sort of random people winning world championships. Um, of course, Stephen Mullen, who's in the, was in the quarterfinals here, got beaten by Mark in 3-2. Another former world champion. I think he's the oldest world champion ever. Was it 2016 he won his world I think championship? That's right, yeah. I'm going to have a quick. Oh, you've got all the stats. I've got here. all the stats here, yeah. Beat David Malouf, I remember that, following that on uh, text commentary. Beat David Malouf's semi finalist, Reg Bamford, David Norm. Uh, David's another one to be in the contenders. Just looking through previous um, semi finalists, Jose Rivas coming over from Spain. He's an excellent player. I don't know if he gets a lot of time to play currently, but. Uh, does have a fairly young child, I believe. So yes, yeah. It's taken a bit of a step back lately. Uh, now we've got something interesting going on here. Yeah. Um, so I think Reg might be looking to do a pop at some point. So that's a peel on the opponent ball. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, if he puts James through hoop one and potentially through hoop two as well, uh, it makes it a little bit more difficult for James to do his triple peel later on. Um, less hoops means less time for James to position the balls. Uh, as he would want to. So Reg will try and peel this going over to red before he makes hoop four. Yeah. Oh nice shot. It's a very nice shot there. So played that as a thick takeoff. Uh, perfect length on blue there um, and really accurate lining up to get yellow through the hoop. As we spoke about earlier, uh, judging the pull on these balls is quite difficult. Mm. And when you're not playing the shot straight in line, yes. um, lining it up is a little bit difficult. Takes some time to get the hang of that. Yeah, yeah it's probably in very recent years. I haven't seen as much many pops um, where you're putting the opponent through. Um, but yeah, it's, it doesn't just create more of a defensive position, whereby, as uh, as Aston said, that James has less time to manoeuvre the balls to get a triple peel. Another player actually worth mentioning from the who's been well placed twice, actually twice the semi finalist in the World Championships is a Irish player called Andrew Johnson. I had a good chance to have a good old chat with Andrew at the Home Internationals recently. He's a very, very talented player. Again, a young family, but um, yeah, someone to, that it could um, could definitely cause an upset for sure. So I think there's a big difference here between where Reg is at now and we could sort of see at the start of game one uh, he didn't look completely comfortable but now he, you know, he's doing things like putting James's ball through hoop one whilst kill containing on the break it just makes you realise that he's feeling in a good place and he's thinking about what tactics can he employ to get his own ball round, round but also make it more difficult for James to finish in his next turn should he hit the lift One thing I've just realised, Aston, is looking at these stats is Robert Fletcher was actually a semi-finalist in the Worlds four years earlier than when he won it. So he would have been about oh, right. 15. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> I thought I was quite good as a yeah. young croquet player, but maybe not. <laughs> yeah. Of course, Robert comes from a whole family of croquet players. He's got, his brothers are very, very good players, been in the... Uh, Australian test side in the Robertson Shield, the World Championship. So I've got a number of Fletchers on the circuit. We've got a fair few croquet players uh, who siblings also play, but I don't think any quite to the same level as the Fletchers. No, yeah, yeah. 
And I'll say that, yeah, there's a slight difference in the plane down in Australia. I think obviously maybe conditions partly, but Robert's got a huge number of triple peels, but it doesn't look like the sextuple peels are quite as popular. Uh, and that may be because they don't play as much super advanced, but they no super advanced. But yeah, you find different countries have different tactics they seem to favour. We've been doing a bit of a survey at this event uh, on Super Advanced, so mm. asking players uh, yeah. whether it was offered for their match, uh, yes. whether it was declined, uh, or whether they completely forgot that it was an option, Yeah. Um, just to get an indication of how popular it is and whether people would prefer to be playing it at a high level event like this. Yeah. Uh, for the Worlds, it's uh, compulsory, normal advanced. Um, as Rich said, it uh, tends not to be played outside of England. Um, so super advanced is just something that we play here. It basically came about because, um, particularly if the conditions are benign, that players got a bit bored with, you know, hit in, go round to fall back, do a, do a leave. If that was missed, player would finish with a TP. So you end up spending a large part of your day sat watching if you're not careful. You just happen to miss a few longer shots. So they created this concept of having an extra lift at hoop four. It does make the game quite different because often the first player round will go, again, to finish at four back, but then you're giving away contact. So rather than a player being able to shoot from A or B ball, they can actually put their ball in contact with another ball. Uh, and so it does change the sort of types of leaves and some of the tactics. There's a lot more of what call um, TPOs. So that's... Um, Peeling the opponent through their last three hoops. Um, so creating advantage of your two balls against one. So it's quite a different game. Um, I've just spotted someone who was uh, an early mentor for me in my early days of croquet. My first ever counties, I got to part of this gentleman and he's, uh, he's without exaggeration, a legend of the game. And I'm going to hand over to him so you can have a some hand over. All right, whichever. Um, one of us is going to hand over, we're going to get Chris Clark in, who uh, is my favourite croquet commentator. So uh, He's arrived at a good time, so Reg here is planning to crosswire James at hoop one and set up for a sextuple. So Chris yeah, will be well placed to talk you through that. Great, thanks Aston, we'll see you soon. Yep, look forward to it. Thanks very much. Um, the lunch bell just rang, so I thought <laughs> I'd give you the opportunity to, to pop and have lunch. <laughs> um, I think Reg has rushed this um, ball into a less than ideal position. Yes. Um, he's probably just going to have to dink it out a few inches and then rush the um, yellow ball towards black to get the cross wire. Yeah. Um, now, I'm just trying to run through the clip positions here. Um, yeah, James went round, was first round to four back, and then this is Reggie's response hitting, after hitting the lift. Yeah, uh, has he peeled um, James yes, through heat one? he has. He's just, he popped him through when he was uh, kind of halfway through the break. So, red's on four back. Yeah. Yellow's on two. two. So he's got the rolled balls the correct way around. Mm. You want the backward ball towards corner one, so it's got a longer shot at the balls. Got it. Near third corner. Yep. Um, it doesn't really make the triple peel much more difficult having popped to hoop two. I know you've got to rush to hoop two, but yeah. um, at this level, it's not a massive difference. Uh, it's worth doing, mm -hmm. but. Um, James is going to be faced with a, an interesting choice of would does he take something seven or eight yards longer with yes. the ball he wants to play, or does he take the shorter shot with his forward ball? And most of the top players will take the longer shot. Yeah. And I think it's the right choice of shot. Otherwise, all you're doing is hitting in, making a leave, and you're giving your opponent a bonus 28, 30 yarder. Yeah. And they're going to hit that shot more often than the extra yardage here is going to make you miss more your shot. Yeah. Um, 
it's a consideration in croquet isn't it it's like what am i gaining from the shot and equally what am i giving away and sometimes you do get a bit of a sort of asymmetric asymmetric risk so you have to be careful not to play shots that don't give you a lot but potentially give the opponent everything now i know jenny mentioned in her text commentary that we're putting on croquet scores as well as the live video stream um, the fact that Reg has actually sort of given up sex tuples part way through this tournament. Yeah. He was trying them in the in the what we call the block stage, the sort mm -hmm. of pre-drawn Swiss stage, so the qualifying stage, and he failed several. Right. Uh, and they weren't good failures either. They weren't sort of finishing on rover and peg. They were yeah, finishing yeah. on like two back and four back. And, right. You know, they weren't looking like they were going particularly well. Uh, and it's strange because one of the things Reg has said about when he goes for sex tuples and when he doesn't, he said it's all about the hoops. Okay, interesting. He says if the hoops are difficult, then he'll probably not go for them. But yep. when they're sort of okay, mm. yeah, just normal, uh, he goes for them. And there's been nothing scary about these hoops. These have yes. been really well set, they've been narrow, um, the ground's reasonably firm. Mm -hmm. Um, but apart from his quarter-final yesterday, where they played on the lawn next door, lawn seven, yeah, and that's got the fast patch. Oh, uh, okay. That's got the fast patch between hoop six and hoop three. Right. Which is really genuinely quick, and hoop three was baked in yesterday and was much firmer. Yeah. Um, and they were struggling to peel it, and they were struggling to run it. Okay. But apart from that, none of the hoops this tournament should have fallen into the category of difficulty. Mm. Of, of difficult. So this is a clear change in strategy from Reg. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know what you've mentioned so far about how he's been playing in the event. Yeah, well, we talked a little bit about how, um, so right at the start of game one, it was noticeable that he didn't look himself and he was feeling uh, a little bit more sort of nervous than I'd normally see Reg. So Jim, James definitely started faster, but I've sort of, well, the only thing I'd noticed from the early part of the event, which I've not been watching live, yeah, was the you know, kind of the lack of peeling turns, and it makes sense now. You said that he's put down a number of sex tuples. But what was your observations earlier on, Chris, of how he's been playing? Well, I'll come back to that. I think mm. what we're going to find here, given the fact that James has walked onto the lawn okay. with his pint in his hand, right. is they might take lunch. Ah, uh, okay, yeah, it could happen. Um, which will give us a little bit of time to talk about a variety of things. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah it looks so like it. Doesn't James it? has given him the nod. He said, "Yep." Yeah, Red and yellow are crossword. I can't yeah. see anything there, just yeah. in case a squirrel comes during lunch and <laughs> yeah. knocks them open again. Good, to, good to know that. Agreed that they're wired. And Reg, see I've watched a lot of Reg now for the last couple of weeks. Yes. Been down in Southwick for mm. the Golf Croquet Open. And we all know how good Reg is at Golf Croquet and look completely out of sorts. Really interesting. Um, every time he hit the ball hard, could go anywhere. Okay. Um, even his positional play wasn't quite up to his normal level, but it was mainly his hard shots. Right. Um, and then he's arrived here, he's failed a few um, sex tuples, he's put some basic breaks down as well. Um, and there's a very interesting um, stage in, I believe, probably his last, um, last 16 match, where he got hampered after hoop six. Mm -hmm and he could only hit his one back pan here. Right. And I thought, that's ah, a no problem, he'll just tonk that off and it'll yeah. be fine. And he hit it, sent a ball, and he moved it about three feet. Oh, okay. So it was the most dribbly shot you yeah, can imagine. Interesting. And it really showed that that sort of confidence about hitting the ball more firmly yeah. had gone. Yeah. Uh, great that he could still hit it straight gently, but normally he would just walk on, tonk that off, croquet to two back, go to the other yeah. balls, all fine. And yeah, it was a really gentle stroke. Mm. Um, and then again yesterday, um, against Jenny, he ran two back with a three yard rush pointing north. Mm. Well, you just want to tonk it back to the ball at four back, Yeah, missed it into b bulk. Oh gosh, man. And that's how Jenny yeah. got in in one of the games. Yeah, very unlike um, him. So, you know, the lawn they were playing on yesterday was tricky because mm. of this fast patch. Yeah. But even on the areas where the lawn condition wasn't relevant, and he just had a three yard rush, which he had to hit in the middle, mm. he missed that. Um, so I think 
he's been getting better. I think he's better today than he was three days ago. Yeah. Um, but he's showed that by being comparatively error free and hitting fractionally more of his shots. Got it. Um, he's hit in a couple of times this match already third yeah. turn, made a leave and James has hit straight back in mm. again. Um, what he hasn't done is extend his stress that he's putting on his overall game, which includes his croquet strokes, which yeah. I haven't mentioned yet. Mm, okay. And I think we all know Reggie's croquet strokes are fabulous. He can do anything he wants. He's got great touch. He can play big pass roles. He's got mm. every shot you could want. He's looked enormously uncomfortable with these balls. Yeah. And I don't know what you've been mentioning about Humpties. Yeah, we briefly talked about he you had know, you know, a conversation with Keith about the Humpties and you know, it's a slightly softer ball, maybe don't rush quite as truly as some other versions of balls. So yeah, it was clear you know, the fact he's mentioned it to Keith made me realise that there is a degree of discomfort currently. But obviously that's if your game's not 100%, then obviously anything that's not quite optimal. It continually stresses your game. Mm. His perfect rushing will suddenly get a fractionally poor contact and finish two yards short. Mm. And then he'll play a croquet stroke where the back ball goes either too far or the front ball doesn't go far enough. Mm. He's sort of, what I think he's done at the moment, he's, his adjustment he's made has been to try and get the back ball right. Yeah. Which means he's often leaving the front ball short. Got it. Yeah. Um, and again, that just means instead of having a good pioneer, you've got one that's two and a half yards away from your hoop. You've got to rush to a bit further away. Maybe you don't get a rush out of the hoop. It's just that extra level of difficulty and you know slightly more difficult shots that means that the control isn't as good as normal. And this next turn, which will obviously be after lunch, um, is going to decide has he made the transition? Can he play enough good croquet strokes? And the balls are probably pulling a bit more as well. Mm. So mm. all this next turn, this sextuple turn, mm. can he pull it off? Will it start so badly that he changes it into a TPO? Yeah, yeah, yeah it'd be interesting to see what develops. I mean, so my, my thinking was now that he's got his back to one all in games, that he, I mean, him for him sort of, setting up a sex two pool well obviously it's almost he's obviously trying to win this competition but he's obviously thinking oh, on the worlds as well so like how can i pull my game up to yeah a level where i can win the worlds and that does mean probably doing sex two pools uh, depending on the conditions so i, I understand why he's doing this he, he's almost challenging himself a little bit to see where am i at and can i pull myself into a slightly higher level of play yeah, I, I think we should also mention whether to go for a sextuple here. One of the thought processes that will be going through his mind is how well has James shot. Mm. Now, James missed the lift yeah. in the last game and the reg finished. Mm. But he has hit in fourth turn twice. That's right. So, you know, it's a completely justifiable decision that no, now is the time to put the game in my hands. Yeah. He's a very, very good sex dupler. The rain will have just changed the lawn from 11.3, 11.4 to 10.8. Right. And that will make a significant difference in just being able to play every shot that little bit more accurately, yep. not have to worry about a bit of pace. Um, so all these things are in his favor. Um, starting to get a little bit of drizzle a little mm. bit of light rain now there's no wind at all is there no it's absolutely still so yeah. it's really quite unusual playing conditions it's warm mm. it's potentially wet and it's dead still so it's really quite good playing conditions mm. um the rain starts coming down more heavily yeah um, i think uh, mark might be heading off the lawn so mark's mark avery's on oh Whoa, chris is actually all right we've had a chair failure let me just go and rescue Chris. There's, uh, equipment failure. We lost our best. We lost our best commentator there. Let me. Right, get another chair. 
We're uh, trying to stay out of the rain here. It means we're all sat on a slightly earthy slope and uh, plastic chair failure there. But thankfully we're crisp in one piece. So we go over to the other semi that hasn't broken for lunch. And it looks like Mark's got really good control here. Two peels done approaching Penalt. And the peel is probably only two feet away from Rover. Um, so he just needs to do a straight Rover peel. To take a two, is that a two one lead or is it two, two equalise? Two nil. Two nil lead. Yeah, of course yeah, he failed um, that hampered shot after four back to win the first, didn't he? That's right, yeah. And, yeah. Um, yeah, Robbie was stranded on Pennant on Rover. So you, you know, going into it, given the form that Roberts Fletcher's in, you'd have made him favourite. But Mark has got a lot of experience. He's a very calm player. Two 0 lead. It's going to take a little bit of a comeback from Robert. He's definitely capable of it. Again, going back to Robbie, he was absolutely fantastic at Southwick in the Golf Croco Open. It's uh, probably the best I've ever seen him play. Um, and then he's come here and even yesterday he was making some errors, just failed a couple of hoops and um, his shooting, which has been amazing, he just hardly missed, um, he's just started to miss the odd shot. Mm. And I think the fourth turn shot in this game where he had a double target with the front ball only about 11-12 yards away and a ball in the background. I would have had him at 95% on that last yeah. week, and he's missed that. Um, subsequently missed the lift, and the rain has changed the lawn, so all this difficulty we had yesterday, I didn't see anybody peel four back after hoop three. Okay, gosh, right. The yeah, best they got was jawsing it, right. and generally it bounced out, maybe in front, but it was a really fast, really pingy hoop, uh, whereas now this rain has dampened it down, they've got the control. Um, I think he, he did go back to four back and rush peel after hoop four this game, which was a little bit risky because it wasn't in the jaws. Um, but again, it's such an easy paced lawn now and they're very flat that he's just managed to cope quite easily. Um, I think the match is far from over, personally. Uh, I really think Robbie's a very strong player and capable of coming back to take the match. Um, but he won't have been 2 0 down very often mm. in his life. Yeah, it brings a certain level of pressure, doesn't it? Because, you know, literally could be one mistake and it could be curtains, so. Obviously, the two of you, uh, two of us talked um, after Roberts and Shield, just sort of assessing team performances. And like Mark is just a really, really solid player under pressure. It doesn't really get phased. He just goes about his business. So um... yeah, he did very well playing sort of within himself in the Mac. Didn't do many TPs, but didn't make as many errors as the other players. Um, and was really a very good foil in the doubles as well for Jamie. We had a couple of comments on YouTube that I managed to pick up. So uh, the current commentator is myself, Rich Waterman. I'm uh, Croquet Director for the uh, Croquet Association, Coaching Director, uh, Welsh International. And next to me we've got Chris Clark, World Champion. Uh, the Wiki, if you ever had a Wikipedia of croquet, Chris would definitely be one of the main contributors. He's a phenomenal expert of the game. Mark finishes game two, 2-0. Two I'm going to have to take lunch. It'll be interesting to see whether they do take lunch. Um, I could imagine they might go back on. Just keep rolling. Big advantage to getting an early finish before a final. So Mark um, often likes pressing through his matches. Yeah. Um, Robbie's diabetic, okay. so he often has to manage his blood sugars yeah. as they go up and down. Yeah. 
Um, but again, he does like playing. He doesn't often like have a big lunch break. Yes. Um, so they've obviously had a quick chat. Mark's gone back under the tent. The question is, as he says, lunch 30 minutes, or as he says, I'm just going to have five minutes and we'll be off again. Um, it's got a couple of comments about the cameras. So it's um, we're obviously uh, an amateur sport. We've got a certain amount of kit available, which is very impressive. And uh, Eugene Chang does a brilliant job setting it all up with uh, with other helpers, Will G as well this morning. But we're somewhat restricted, really, in what we can do. Um, we tend to have to focus on on choose one lawn and hope it's the best the best match and also there are various logistics in where we can put the tents particularly with the threat of rain so we apologize if we're you're just sort of seeing me and Chris chat but we now both games have stopped now so we're having a having a break so recap mark two games up against Robbie yeah. and here we're in the third game game all and James is on two and four back and Reg has just gone to one back so he's one and one back and James is faced with a very long one back leave um, again going back to Robbie he should have got the hang of the balls he'll have played with these balls mm. before Yeah. Um, and it's been more his single ball strokes have um, just let him down whenever he's got a sort of four foot angled hoop which mm -hmm. he normally just smashes through yes um, he's just failed a couple more than you might anticipate um, so at the start of the event i thought robbie was the clear favorite mm -hmm. uh, reg looked completely out of sorts to yes. me and coming in today i had him as a slight favorite for the tournament i thought he would beat mark mm -hmm. um, but I thought Reg was just gradually, gradually getting a little bit better. Yeah. And uh, lots of people write off sort of the people who've been good at the game for 20 years as soon as they have a bad year. Yeah. And I just think it's madness. Someone who's played at a top level for 20 years, they've always got the ability to refine. Yeah, that, it's there. It's in the level. locker, isn't it? Yeah. Um, they know how to win. Mm. Um, and again, looking back, Mark's playing as well as he's ever played. But he last won this event in 1987. Mm. Um, that's a long time. Yeah, that's pressure in itself, isn't it? Yeah. And that gap. Uh, and lots of good results. I think he got back in the top three in the world last year at one stage. Yeah. So, you know, he's playing really nicely and he's a beautiful player to watch. Um, but Robbie's in a different class. And then Reg, we know if he manages to get back to where we expect him to, uh, also has a, an edge from a peeling point of view. He yeah. can pull out the sex tuples. Yeah. Um, I had a quick look at the. Uh, recent winners and I think Reg has only won it twice in the last nine years. Yeah, having won 12 in total hasn't he? So yeah. it's not a, not a best streak for him. It's a bit of a surprise to me because it was in a period where Fulford was really stopping playing Yeah, and uh, the tournament was a little bit weaker because of that. You had lots of years where it was well which is going to win out of Fulford and Bamford yeah. and you know nine times out of ten it was one of them. Yeah. Uh, so hugely impressive and basically when your number one rival disappears you think okay the gates are open maybe i'll win you know six out of the next nine mm. instead mm. of two out of the next nine yeah yeah um and they're both very close on you know maximum numbers of wins they've both gone past solomon now mm -hmm. um but red i think now is tied with rob is he on 11 or has he on got to 12 i, I think he's remember. i think rob's on i think i think reg's on 12 now i'll have to check how many rob is maybe do a bit of research on that um, so, but they're right, yeah, I mean, it's a phenomenal number of wins, but it's interesting, I didn't realise he'd won relatively few in the last few years. Yeah, yeah, because really for that period, you think about it and you think, yeah, ask most people who's the best croquet player in the world, mm. and most people will come up with 
Gretch Bamford, whereas actually Robert Fletcher's been the number one ranked croquet yes. player in the world, and uh, there's a little bit of a sort of Northern Hemisphere bias in many ways, because yeah, the, the chat is very Northern Hemisphere, yes, and absolutely. Um, Robbie's stuck down in Australia, and he plays brilliantly in Robertson Shields, and wins yeah. events when he turns up to them, but um, doesn't often come over for the British summer. That's um, right. I think yeah. we need to go back maybe, what, 10 years to when he won the World Championship without dropping a game in England. Yeah. And there haven't been many people who've won a Worlds without dropping a game. And he's back to that le sort of level now. Yeah, that, and that's pretty scary for his opponents, isn't it? That's one of the things I was going to ask you, Chris, was obviously approaching the World Championships. He's almost got the, the elite and the super elite, haven't you? So, I mean, obviously, I, w I would still probably, my personal it would be still be Robert Fletcher but then obviously Rob Fulford would be playing Reg Bamford you've got Matthew Essex who was a finalist last year he's a super player you think there's anyone else in the mix Paddy's not playing I suppose. Paddy's That's not playing yeah which is um, one contender out of the way you've definitely highlighted the top four players yeah um, again always fascinating to see what happens when Fulford turns up mm. uh, playing as little as he does how can you produce that extra performance level yeah. that he, he did in the Golf Croquet Worlds yeah, last year? It's yeah, phenomenal it performance. Yeah. And uh, again, they had his warm up tournament, I think, last weekend at the Cowhorn. Mm -hmm. Immediately did a couple of sex two pools. Yes. Um, so, uh, in an email to me, he said he was pretty pleased with how he's playing. Oh, good. Um, yeah, so, that's good. And yeah, we just have to wait and see. If we get to quarterfinals, we know the quarterfinals are going to be on the front four lawns at Hurlingham. Yeah. And then the fact that Bamford and Fulford have played match after match on yeah. those front four lawns yeah. and done dozens of sex duples on them. Yes. I think that does count for something. Okay. Yeah. That's and interesting. We can look at the results on Croquet Scores for America. Mm -hmm. And one of the things you'll note is Essek has gone from doing triples in virtually all his games to not having very many peeling turns. Okay. And it's clearly true that he's been trying sex duples. Right. Quite Makes right sense. too. Yep. Exactly the right thing to do. He's still winning virtually all these games. Yeah, yeah. He's still throwing the odd triple in when he fails a sex tuple mm. and he's completing the odd sex tuple. Yeah. But it's not a 70, 80, 90 percent completion rate Got it. that the sort of more experienced players can get to. Yeah. So Matthew is gonna have to rely on his shooting mm -hmm. and probably isn't going to be as high at sex tupling, which I think you'll have to be doing sex duples on these front four lawns as the others um, so I for people who've listened to my commentary a lot I'm I'm quite skeptical about sex dupling I think mm -hmm. uh, you need to have at least a 70% completion rate yeah to be going for it but if I was playing in this world and I got to a quarter final mm. assuming what we think the hurling and front lawns are going to be like yes I'd be sex dupling yeah um, and that opens the door for several other players to be mm -hmm. going for it. Well, obviously, yeah. Fulford and Bamford will be sex dupling. Yeah. Um, what's Fletcher going to be doing? This tournament, he's been going to one back. Yeah, yeah. Then not trying the sex duple, TPOing and pegging two walls out. Oh, uh, interesting. Okay. Can he improve that to TPOing with two peels of his sex tuple? pegging two balls out to leave one and three back yeah. instead of one and one back? Which is a big difference, yeah. Um, he struggled in some of those two ball endings. I know he got to um, one back against um, George Noble on three back. Oh, okay. All right. Um, and he ran one back and he ran two back in the same turn and then missed George at three back. Right. And George had a chance. Yeah. Um, so, you know, he hasn't been as conclusive mm. in these two ball games as I, I would have hoped. Um, Will he convert that and say, no, I'm going to do different tactics. I'm going to go all out sex tuple at Hurlingham because it's so easy. Yeah. I don't know. Uh, these are all interesting points to look forward to. And uh, it's great having a, another really big tournament coming up and yeah. all these people coming in from all over the world. A whole group of good um, Australians and Americans. Uh, slightly weak New Zealand contingent. But yeah. we do have Logan McCorkindale coming over. Oh, yes. Yeah. Very exciting 
young player who's risen to the top 10 in the world. Excellent. Um, yet to be tested at this level. Mm. Inexperienced tactically, but got lots of good shots in his locker. Yeah. And really looking forward to how he gets on. Um, but yeah, should be a, a good tournament coming up. So, looking back to Lawn 7, I think Robbie's now left. He did originally stay in his hut. But yeah. I think they've broken for lunch. Yeah, they have gone, yeah. So, um, I don't know, should we take a break until yeah. they come back? I was very much enjoyed uh, hearing your input. Chris, we'll keep you fresh for the live action when it reappears after lunch. And uh, we'll, uh, we'll see all the viewers shortly. It shouldn't be too long, I wouldn't think. Uh, Croquet players, when they're playing best of five, tend to have a fairly rapid... Yeah, Reggie's lunch. walking back already. Yeah. Probably may not have even had lunch. Right. Might just have had a few snacks. James will be having lunch, I think. Yeah, you got to understand how your body works with the lunch. It's uh, particularly I mean, obviously Robbie Fletcher being diabetic is very conscious of uh, food intake. But it's true about all players. You, know, you can have that kind of post-lunch lull if you overdo it, and uh, will impact your play. So if you're smart, you're taking relatively regular small nourishment, and same with hydration as well. Um, just have very subtle impacts on how your body works. I'll sort of leave the commentary position briefly. I'll have a go and have a chat with our technical director and see who we got lined up for commentary. But I think you'll be uh, you'll be kept in the hot seat for a while yet, Chris. So we can uh, hopefully uh, see Red Shrine in six people. He's currently having a chat with Keith Aiton at the moment off the lawn. Keith was, uh, as I said, was the coach of our Mark Robertson team last year. Right folks, we'll see you all uh, shortly.
Right, welcome back. Um, James and Reg are back from lunch. And yeah, one of the interesting things here is when would you have taken lunch, Keith? Because James oh, had the choice of having his shot. But if he took his shot, then Reg, it's Reg's choice, isn't it, as to whether to carry on? Could James have still insisted on no, having I'm lunch? I'm not or? sure he could. It's normally the person whose turn it is to start. Yeah, not far away, but not great. And a couple of people during lunch came up to me and said, well, what do you think Reggie's going to do? That's a very good question. I think he's going to do a TPO. What do you think? Well, I think he's going to do the sex tuple. Oh, yeah, we'll see. So, uh, as a basic, you know, function of what Reg does, Reg doesn't peg people out. He, he just generally doesn't peel them out. Okay. Uh, he can look at his stats and he, he'll have hardly any TPOs. And he'll have, yeah, as we know, over 300 sex duples to his name. And he's someone who likes doing things that he's done lots and lots of times well, before. Well, that is true. How many, hum how many uh, sex duples has he done with uh, Humpty Dawson Bulls? <laughs> Humpty Dawson Bulls, indeed. So you've spoken to him more than I have this tournament. How Has he mentioned any level of uncomfortableness about the balls? Total, total, he's totally uncomfortable, it's, it's the rushing. So it's not the croquet strokes, it's the rushing. He can get used to the ratios, the different ratios, but it's the uncertainty in his mind about is this rush going to go where I want it to go. And what about pull? <clears throat> well he didn't mention that, um, but obviously the, the, it looks as though it's certainly uh, different with these balls. It is. No, the, the thing he specifically mentioned was the, the rushing. And again, just going through that for the people um, who are listening, who haven't played with this type of ball, what we're finding is when one ball contacts another, sometimes it reacts as you'd anticipate and you get a full almost 100% energy transfer. And some of the time the back ball sort of rises up and some of the energy is lost and you lose 10, 15, 20% of the energy. I, th I think they behave fairly similarly if the striker's ball is sliding. It's when the striker's ball is rolling because the, I've seen the striker's ball just start to climb the back of the, Absolutely. Of the uh, target ball and when that happens then you, you the, uh, the rush ball just won't go as far. So I, I'm right in saying that Reg did come back quite a long time no, ago. Reg has been he? sitting in the gazebo for 10 minutes at least. So where is he? Is he? I'm tempted he not to lean forward again because I've already broken one chair. So, so I've heard. I thought he was down there. Yeah, I, I can't see him anywhere. There's no reason not to be playing, is there? It's, it's just light rain. Um, I would say James is discussing it with him at the moment. Or at least James is talking to somebody that we can't quite see. And that's, I think, where Reg was sitting. And what have you thought to the speed of play during the event? Um, I haven't picked up any particular negative impressions. What are your views? Well, I mean, one of the matches that stuck out to me was um, Jenny playing Reg. Mm. They had one game that was reasonably competitive, plus eight, and the other two, one was sixth turn. 26 TP to Reg, and the other one was something like plus 14 or something like that. And they finished at 5 o'clock. Yeah, that's quite a long match, isn't it? Yeah, if it had been <coughs> either all the way to 5, or you'd have maybe had some closer games, or maybe a pegged out ending, well, you're not even finishing. Indeed, well, the, yes. Well, I'm sure you remember the, the final from 2013. 
I can't remember what time it finished, but certainly there wasn't going to be time for five games. Yeah. So, um. to what uh, do you attribute this to anything in particular? Well, I, I do think most of the players have struggled to play a, a confident break, either because you know, let's say yesterday the lawn that I mentioned Reg and Jenny were playing on had that fast patch. Yes. And that caused some problems during the match. Um, and, and they never probably settled as quickly as they might have done. But, but equally, I think overall the standard of play you know, they st has slowed. The speed of play has just slowed. Um, well, I think, I genuinely think the, um, the balls have had an effect. Yeah, yeah, I, I think that's true. Breaks haven't been as accurate. Um, people haven't got used to the different ratios on Coco strokes. Um, and it, and it's, it's just, yeah, if you're constantly almost picking up a break while you're pro playing a break, absolutely, it just takes longer. Um, and one of the things I mentioned to Rich before lunch is I think Reg has now got the hang of where the back ball is going to go. Yes. But he's leaving his front ball short all the time. Yes, he, yes. I've noticed that. And I think that's a big improvement on not having an idea where either ball is going to finish. <laughs> it is. It is. And usually short is better than long. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it'll be interesting. We won't see it today, of course, but it'll be interesting to see how people readjust when they play in the World Championships Absolutely. with older Dawsons. It, it should be an easier transition, shouldn't it? It should be, yeah. yeah. Um, so the other semi-final still having lunch. Um, well, I've seen Mark's back and Robbie, is that Robbie's knee I can see in the oh, I think that's Mark's knee. No, Mark's down here. Yeah, Mark's down Mark's, here, is he? Yeah. Yeah, he is. So they're both back. The rain isn't anything other than mid-level, is it? It's not heavy. Well, it's not as heavy as it was earlier. Um, and it, again, it's the sort of rain that could be here for a while. So The forecast was actually very bad today, wasn't it? Yes. Yeah. Um, so we were looking at torrential well, rain for... Is the local patches. forecast in, in Britain, Chris, as I'm sure you know, um, it's very hard to predict. Yeah. It could be bright sunshine a few miles away or it could be absolutely sheeting there. Yeah, I think looking from the distance there are certainly definitely some areas that it is raining heavily a few miles away. Well, before play started there was about a mile that way it was absolutely tipping there. Um, well, this is... I mean, this is something you wouldn't even, you'd barely put waterproofs on, would you, for this? Oh, Reg is there, look. Yeah. So James has been sitting next to Reg for this period, and Reg is now putting his green waterproof top on. So we'll shortly find out what his plan is. I'm, I'm really quite confident about where he's going to go for this sextuple he's, all he, out. He is not confident about completing a sextuple. Going to shake hands with Hugh Carlisle. Nice to see Hugh and Veronica here. Yes, I had a chat with them. They'll be a big part of the Hurlingham. Massive, massive part, yes. Um, Worlds in a little while. I know Hugh's been a big part of the organising committee there. I think Hugh's chairing the organising committee. He is. Right, here comes Reg, striding up the lawn. Now he's got room to get this front ball almost to hoop three, I would say. It's a, the, the further you can get it out, the better, really. But oh, yes. He'll be wanting to hold the striker's ball for a rush in front of one back. He will. And if he gets that right, he'll be trying to peel it down to red. Definitely. And it's this sort of shot where if you're not completely confident about the reaction you're going to get, suddenly finish two yards short, you're not in peeling position anymore, are you? No. Which is not a disaster in the overall scheme of doing a sextuple. But Reg 
I would say one of Reg's strengths is his rushing. He's got many strengths, to be yeah, fair yeah, to him. He has got many strengths, yes. This looks good. Stop, 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 stop. Ooh. Too far on this time. He's been under rushing quite a few times, but... That's on a pretty much direct line with the corner, so 45 degrees and yeah, unlikely to be taking that on, I would have thought. No, because uh, you risk it bouncing, uh, bouncing miles away. So just looking at it, it it's jawsable, isn't it? But you'd have to absolutely get it bob on. Yes, you'd have to hit the far wire spunk on, basically, wouldn't you? Now, I think this is a sensible choice. Yes. Just taking off from the right-hand side of it. I mean, it even if he is going for the sex tip, there's no rush at this stage. And we still can't tell because I think he would have attempted to peel anyway. Whether he was going for the sex tip or the TPO. That's true, that's true. Had it been perfectly in had front. It, had it been perfectly in front, yeah. Um, <clears throat> so red's the ball that he might be TPOing. Yes. So one of his options here is to rush to hoop one, get nice control out of hoop one, which won't be easy from there. So it's fallen into an old hoop hole. He should have noticed that. Don't really want to play it with red in an old hoop hole. But had he been able to get a rush up towards yellow, he could have potentially peeled four back. He could. Rushed yellow over here and had to go at both at the same time. <laughs> knowing that if the sex tuple falls behind he's just got the last two peels of the TPO to do. This is the sort of turn James might play. Well yeah again it's that rush to hoop one which we mentioned where normally Reg would be nicely in front of hoop one yeah. and he's ended up inches to the side and he can't get a forward rush to hoop three. No and when he comes through he'll run this hard I imagine <clears throat> and but he'll be rushing red well, somewhere up the west boundary, or...? Yeah, I d I'm not even sure he'll bother going to yellow anymore. No. OK. Well, we'll find out. Now we will find out what his we plan will. is. So, if it's a TPO, he's going to be sending red to hoop three. Yeah. If it's a sex tube, he'll be sending red south of hoop two, and a bit on the eastern side, so he can peel one back hard, going to red. And... I think it was it was 300 quid we had on that, wasn't it, Keith? <laughs> well, I think you'll find we didn't, but uh, interesting. Oh well. What do you think his chances of completing it? Well, now that is fascinating. I, I think the guy's incredibly talented. No question about uh, that. Based upon early in the tournament, 30%. Based upon the fact I think he's got better, 50%. maybe 55. Is that good enough? No. What do you reckon would be 75? 70 plus. 70 plus. Okay. Just giving Reg a little bit of uh, quiet because he's right on top of our commentary position now. Yeah. He rushed it a little bit straight, hasn't he? Well he won't he won't get this directly behind the hoop. It'll be one of those where you you don't want it to hit the wire, but you want it to just miss it. Do you it's think he out. could play a good enough stop shot to send it sufficiently far past? That he could run it past it and cut it a bit more in front of the hoop. Well, he will be trying to do that, I think. Again, has to allow for a little bit of pull, so he can't line it up to miss the wind near wire by nothing. That's a pretty good shot. That's very good. It's all with these is see me. Yeah, so he can't yeah, improve yeah, that yeah. angle. That, that angle's only going to get worse from that. Even if he'd run it by another 18 inches or so, cut rushes with these balls are quite sticky. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think that last shot's very interesting. All he had to do was hit about a four-inch okay. 
yeah. I see a lot of worse players from Reg who end up moving it a centimetre yeah. instead of two millimetres. Yeah, yeah. And it makes a big difference now it to does. this next shot. Absolutely. So he has to play this with pull. He could go left of the hoop or he could go right. Both are options. Yeah, that's just what I was wondering. It's normally easier if you're pulling it the same way as you are lining it up. So you'd normally play it pulling it right and that would have the blue ball spinning to yeah. go through. Yeah. Whereas if you pull it to the left, the blue's gonna be sort of pulling into the wire more. So that was the more difficult angle. He's done well to get the peel. Ideally, you'd want it another 15 yards further south. But from that angle, he'll be happy with that, I think. And the, the next interesting question is, where is he gonna put red? I think he'll put red down to two back. Because he always does that. Because he always does that. Yeah. Yeah. One thing I've noticed, Chris, with, with Reg is his peeling is incredibly good. Mm. He's, he seems to judge the pull better than most. N not only does he do that, but one thing I was saying to Jenny yesterday is his mallet entry to the ball on his peel strokes is wonderfully smooth and flat. Right. So once again, that's gone down to two back. Was that another just 200 we had on that? Up to five now. <laughs> um, so lovely shot, black's right next to yellow. Um, red's in a nice position. He's unlikely to rush blue one yard in front of the you, hoop. You would think that that would be unlikely, but yeah. I'm not having any more money on what he might uh, or might not But do. he doesn't want to now, because he's, he's put this red quite a long way um, north. So he can peel from three yards with a nice straight stop shot or drive. Yeah. And Red's in a lovely position. Peel or, or almost dead weight it? Which, which I, I would be wanting to make sure it went through three yards if it didn't catch any wire. Okay. So, so you don't mind it bouncing? No. A bit? No. Uh, again, Jaws is a perfectly good result. Oh, Jaws would be brilliant. Um, again, another thing I've been saying to a lot of the players this tournament is, is watch the elite players approach a hoop or rush to a hoop from two yards away yeah. approach it and get a rush to where they want it yeah. and uh, they do it all the time they do. and the lower level players don't and it, it, to me it's a sort of an easy fix it's an easy way to make your game better yes um, so he's rushed to the north boundary he's now got room to send yellow it, it won't be a million miles away from where red is it'll be a little bit further east yes and maybe a little bit further south. Oh, def definitely further south, um, if he can do it. But the priority is probably going to be making sure Black gets a decent rush on Blue. Yeah. And Blue's quite handily come out a couple of balls east of the line of one and two. So he shouldn't have the hoop too much in his mind for the no. shot. No. Pretty good, isn't it? That is good. So yellow, I think he would have preferred that oh, two yeah. to three yards further east. Yeah. So I said gone on a couple of yards probably further than he would want. Yeah, it's playable where. And it's that shot I think Reg was much better than me at. I, I could I could put that anywhere. You know, it could could not even be in peeling position with me. And Reg would normally rush it straight in front, three yards, and then then he'd jaws the peel all better. Slightly overcut it that time. 
meaning yeah. he's now got a four yard peel instead of a three yard peel. Yeah. He can play it dead straight and just hold the black for a rush to hoop four on red. And again, I think I'd like to watch, let the viewers watch the entry to the ball. It will be slow, it will be smooth, it will make a consistent contact with the striker's ball. That, that sounds like an easy thing to do. That. Well, why wouldn't anybody do that? Yeah. But you watch most people and it'll be a little proddy shot, mm. potentially not hitting it dead straight. Or centrally so, on the mallet face. Or centrally on the mallet face, exactly. So not only you're putting a little bit of pull on the ball, but you're not getting your ball to finish within that half inch of where it should finish. So suddenly you've got a three quarter ball rush to hoop four instead of a centre ball rush. And it all becomes more difficult. And would you say this is what differentiates the really good players from the nearly good players? Ball striking. Uh, ball striking is huge. I was a little bit surprised he chose to hit down on that. The, pen, the tempo of the shot was lovely. Mm. It was nice and slow and smooth. But he actually played it with the mallet down. I thought he could probably have played it with a drive, which is less likely to create pull. Um, and it looks to me as if but Blue's in a bad position. It, it did go pretty straight. Do you think that Blue rush peels? Well, it's very hard to tell from here. It just seemed to die on the wire, it, didn't it? it did. And if it did, then it's going to be very difficult to rush peel. And a bit of a nightmare to tickle into the jaws. Yeah. And again, looking at this, Reg would rather have rushed past hoop four than short, wouldn't he? Yes. And the reason is he's trying to get a rush back to blue and yellow. And it's easier to do it from that long side rather than have to play this very wide angle croquet stroke. He's very good at these though. Again, consistent tempo and just seems to poke it through the, through the gap. Yeah, absolutely, and one of the things, uh, I was talking to Aston Wade earlier this morning about how can you get better at getting rushes out of hoops. And there's an exercise we um, have called the clock hoop approach. Okay. Where you imagine the hoops, the middle of the clock, mm -hmm. where the arm, where the sort of hands come out from, and you put your ball two yards back, dead straight in front, and play a croquet stroke to approach it from six o'clock. Okay. And then you move it to 7 o'clock and then play an approach from there. And then 8 o'clock, 9 o'clock, 10 o'clock, 11, 12, 1, 2. And Reg was the playing that approach from 3 o'clock. Right, yes. But once you've got the hang of playing that from 2 yards, at all the 12 possible hours, and getting a rush out of it to somewhere, well, you've improved your game straight away. <laughs> Massively, yes. Um, it sounds easy, but when you get to three o'clock and you've suddenly got to play this very wide angle shot with your ball going across the hoop well, face. Well, that's the thing, isn't it? I mean, if you could choose, you'd approach every hoop from straight in front. Straight in front. And partly otherwise, because seven o'clock, eight o'clock. Well, par partly because you're not so dependent on the distance your ball travels. Correct. Absolutely. Whereas from the side, you're heavily dependent. But one of the things I've been encouraging people to do is when they're rushing to a hoop from a way away, know which side is better to miss on. So obviously we like it to finish straight in front, but sometimes finishing a yard past is better than a yard short. Uh, it's a bit like you know when I t talk about golf croquet and you're taking position as a hoop, hopefully we've got some golf croquet players tuning in, looking at a, a slightly different version of the game. But when you're taking croquet, got a position at golf croquet, Straight in front of the hoop's usually very good, but often if you're going from one angle, say six to seven, short might mean you can't run the hoop, yep. whereas long means you can run the hoop. And he's hit that hard and it's finished in a dreadful place. I don't I think it's good from his body language. Can he jaws it, do you think? Well, jawsing would be great, yeah. Oh, it's okay. This is okay. And he can get past the wire to get a rush on yellow yeah, to Yeah, well, five. that's a critical thing at the moment. He's got to keep a break going. Yeah, so th this should go through at that angle. Never mind jaws, I think.
How firm have these hoops been, Chris? Much better than I anticipated. Mm. Um, so I mentioned hoop three on lawn seven yesterday. That was like a rock. Right. Great. And all of these hoops have been absolutely fine. Um, people who watch regularly will know I'm a big fan of the quadway hoops and they're very good. Um, we have to give a huge amount of credit to Charlie, the groundsman, who's been setting them, and Ian Vincent, who's been checking them. They've been good all the time. Yesterday, these four lawns on this side were put in fresh holes. Right. So that's made a big difference from the quarterfinals yes, onwards. Sure. Um, yeah. Yesterday, we had a lovely day's weather. They baked in all day, and they got more difficult. A um, couple of people have challenged whether their balls have stuck. And after a lot of consideration, the referees have said no. There's a tiny gap, and they've been really, really quite challenging. So, um, Reg's just waiting for a referee here. Uh, he might be asking for some damage to be repaired. He might be saying, yeah, it's well... Not, I'm not sure what he is asking for, actually. It could be. There's no obvious fault. Maybe, perhaps, blue bouncing back onto the mallet. Might that be a fault? Yeah, well, it would be. Um unlikely to happen I would have thought um, championship referees only they're so a rare, they are a rare breed these days and they are Jenny's a championship ref and, and Ian's Vincent comes. and yep she's on her way but um, yeah there really aren't very many championship refs around so yeah, this is pretty much 45 degrees, isn't it? He's in line with the corner from where he is. Plenty of room to get black past the wire and get a rush to hoop five. The only question is, is he jawsing it or can he get it all the way through? It's a big advantage if he gets it a few inches through, isn't it? Um, is it? I mean, to Reg, perhaps. I, I personally wouldn't mind either way. So for you, what you're saying is you're happy to croquet the feeling. I'm going to be, I would be croqueting blue to three back, whether it went through or not. Right. But Whereas yeah. Reg yeah. can rush it and potentially get a go at the peel yeah. going to red. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's just a, well, at my level, the chances of actually rushing to a peelable position are very small. And the chances of rushing to a position where I can't improve yeah. the peely are quite large. Yeah. Whereas I would back myself to croquet it to a, a good position. Well, he's worried about committee of fault. Oh, look at that. His balls have been marked. Meanwhile, while we're waiting for this, on the other lawn, Robbie Fletcher is taking what I think is the first break round. He's no. just coming to three back. Making a new standard leave. Ooh. I thought he would play that with a roll. Precisely to avoid any possibility of getting blue in the way. Absolutely. As it is, but he hasn't it? got blue in the way. And, he, and he's... No. I think the he's other got thing... got another cut rush. He has. This is quite a big cut rush yes. as well. Yes. I think the best he could do with this is about three yards in front of hoop five. That would be fine. It doesn't look easy, but he is good at these. Yeah, that's about as well as he could play that. Yeah. About three and a half yards in front of the hoop. And he, I think he'll try and rush back to corner one. Uh, yes. Well, yes. Because he could he, easily he's rush. He's going to send yellow towards one back, isn't he? Well, he's not, or is he going to send it north of northwest of three back? Mm, I think he's going to do somewhere halfway in the middle, okay. and sort of send it almost to the peg area. Because it's quite hard to get it to one back, I would think, with these balls. He can't. That's black and white. He cannot get. If he rushes yellow into corner one, he can't play a good enough stop shot to send out a, a genuine one back pan here. And and hold for a rush, uh, which is. Oh my word! Oh uh, well. 
I, I, I mean, I thought there were lots of chances that he would break down during the turn, but that wasn't one of them. You know, I said 30% no. in the Swiss. I thought he's maybe up to 50, 55 now. How I could see him not getting the shield, do you think? Uh, well, a couple of feet, two feet, two, two, and two and a half. feet straight. Hmm. Um, and he's failed it off the hoop two ball. The only positive you can say about it is James is probably going to make hoop two off the PLE. We're clutching at straws. We are clutching at straws, yeah. Um, he could he could cut black towards hoop four straight I away. I think he will. As a par near I think for later. He will. Take off south of blue. Yeah, bring it a it bit nearer hard. red, stick it to three and Bob's your uncle. Just needs to rush out of hoop two then, doesn't yeah. he? Um, I thought the way Reg was going to break down there was not getting the peels because right. they were going to pull an unusual amount. Now he's only just tickled that. I mean, it's still good enough there as a hoop four pioneer. It, yes. But I don't understand well, why he like, didn't just hit it a bit harder. He, he, he needs to move it away from the hoop, I would say. Yeah. Which he is doing. Yeah. But that's fine. We've still got the same basic plan. Now, I'd be interested to get your views on techniques. Oh, he's overhit that. He's overhit that. That got the full contact. It did. You're right. It did. Um, sorry, Keith, I interrupted you. No, that's fine. Um, I was just saying, I'd be interested to get your views on players' techniques because even a casual observer could notice that James has a completely different technique from Reg in terms of grip at least we have four great players to watch we've got a standard grip with Reg yes. what many people call a South African grip with the thumb top thumb going back over the top of the mallet okay and the the lower finger going down the shaft of the mallet many people find that difficult to do because it puts quite a lot of stress on your muscles yes um, in your wrist so only some people can do that. Uh, again, I'll just go through the four types of... Okay, uh, James has crunched through that. We'll let him play his return okay first. So that's one grip, sort of standard, but not the sort of South African standard. Yes. Then we've got James, who obviously is very tall, um, uses a very long mallet and uses a pen holder grip. So Not top. many people do that, do they? And technically it's weak, but I'll come on to that. Okay. Well, I notice his hands are ones at the top and one's got a bit down split. the shaft. Split. Yeah, split. split grip. And that tends to be the case with pen holder grips. They right. tend not to have the hands working in tandem um, so again just looking at those two players what we're trying to do is we're trying to get the swing coming from the shoulders and we're okay. trying to reduce the amount of swing that is generated by the wrist at some stage to increase power you're going to have to use some level of wrist action but for most of your shots getting a nice pendulum from the swing is ideal so big muscles big muscles yeah trying to avoid the small muscles um, Reg is very good at doing that. The swing comes from the shoulders very well, the hands work in tandem very well, and I think the other thing I want to mention is the speed of the swing. It's very slow. And if you can get a slow swing and still hit the ball basically as firmly as you want, that's ideal. Uh, people may be interested to know that Robert Fulford, when he's practicing, actually uses a metronome. Okay. Mm -hmm. So that's one of the things that you use when you're doing music to set, set time and set tempo. Tempo is my key word at Croquet. If you can get your tempo right, even if you haven't got a straight swing. Well, Reg seems to have a, a one tempo. And, and it much depends how hard he's going to hit it is governed by how long the back, back swing is. is. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. 
Um, and anyone wanting to look at a tempo should look at Bamford and Fulford. Lovely, slow tempos, and it, they hold up very well under pressure. Mm. The faster a swing you get, you get a tendency to become too fast when you get under pressure yeah. and start the downswing too quickly. Yeah. Again, just going back to the game for a little bit, and yeah, sure. James has sort of taken quite a cautious view here. Well, he's, he's not got his partner ball at four back as yet. And he could have decided to play some more difficult shots after hoop two yeah. and try and get the peel after four he back. He could. But yeah. he's actually just sort of gone, no, I'm going to just get a nice break. I'm just going to settle. Uh, remember, he hasn't actually had a lot of lawn time in the past two and a half hours. Yeah. Um, Reg won that second game to equalise. Uh, so probably might have only had 15 minutes in the last two and a half hours. Yeah. And he's just said, no, I'm going to just get a nice break. I'm going to rush back after hoop four and try and get the peel organised or maybe get a game. Oh, well, he may get the peel. This is a position Reg was in in game two. Yeah. And he actually got the peel. Yeah, it's a very good shot. Um, James's blue is a bit further north than Red has. Red had his yeah, escape. That is ball. true. Yes. Um, nice contact. He's got a very good black at hoop five. That's a beautiful shot. Yeah. The downside here is Reg could play it with a straight stop shot or drive, and just hit blue over to either hoop six or south. Whereas if James... You don't think James can do that from here? James would have to play a role. You don't think this can be done as a, a driving one? Or no. Are you worried about Red no, going off? No, I think Red off? goes off with James' oh, stop okay. shot. Yeah, I'm really maybe. concerned about that. OK. Um, what he could do is just accept Blue's sort of good enough as a thick takeoff from where it is. As you say, Black's really good. Yeah. But explain to the people who are listening why you think black's good then. Well, I, I think black's good because there's quite a large area you can go to with yellow um, and still rotate into a, a decent position to approach the hoop. Uh -huh. If black's significantly north of the hoop, you, you know you have to stay north of it and on a good line. Yeah. And there's no chance of getting crosswired. And there's no chance of getting crosswired. That's always it's, it's, my yeah. my worry. If I've got a if I've got a ball that's a foot in front of hoop five, if I can get crosswired from it. Yeah. Uh, so I King, I agree. It's a really good position. Now James missed that peel. Obviously, we don't know why that is. But what do you think could have contributed to that? Poor lining up, or poor stroke, stroke making, or or just random lawn interference. I like fast players. But one of the things I learnt slowly was that there are certain key shots in every turn that are worth spending an extra 30 seconds, 40 seconds well, on. Well, it's noticeable. Reg, I'd venture to say, is never casual. Correct. If, if things go wrong, it's not for lack of care. Yeah. And after I've rushed back after hoop four, my mind is saying, if this goes through, I've won. Oh, absolutely. Um, Getting the four back peel is massive, yeah, isn't it? Absolutely. Yeah. And it falls into that category of do I need to spend 30 seconds more? And perhaps sometimes you put it down, it's bob on first yeah, time. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. I, I'm always a little bit skeptical that James gets it right very quickly all the time. Sometimes, surely, you go, no, oh, no, I've got it wrong again, I have to have another go. I certainly do. Sometimes I'm going back three, four times before I'm happy with it. Yeah. And James always seems to be okay second time or first time. Um, so maybe that's an area where he could spend a bit more time. He's very good at those sorts of shots, though. Fantastic Just a bit touch. Of touch. Yeah, yeah. And again, you mentioned technique. Uh, so I mentioned sort of tempo of swing um, yeah. coming from the shoulders. The other thing I'm looking for is flatness of swing. Right. And so in, in the hitting area? In the hitting area. Um, yeah. I like to see, after the ball's been struck, the forearms extending forwards mm -hmm. rather than upwards. Okay. And that will help create a much flatter hitting zone and create more consistency. And Reg has got great forearm extension. So if, you, if you're if you not flat, well, what are they, the problems? That 
you might the encounter. Well, you're potentially not going to hit the ball in the middle all the time. You might hit it with the bottom bevel as you come up. Right. Or you might hit down on it because the swing is more of a U shape. Yeah. Rather than this sort of flat bottom boat is what I tell people. Yep. You imagine a very flat bottom boat. So we want to extend our sweet spot. Yes, gotcha. Um, none of us time the ball perfectly every shot. If when we are imperfect, we still get an adequate result, that's all I'm trying to do. Sure. Uh, so Robbie's got hampered after hoop one. Looks quite difficult to me. It's uh, he's, well, he's got a four yard. Target ball's a long way away. If he's significantly hampered, yeah. Even with James's fantastic stop shot, he hasn't managed to get a good two back pioneer out there. So he will be tempted to peel red going to blue. Well, he wanted to peel red going to black, didn't he? He did. Black was perfect for that. Yeah. Will he still go for it with this dodgy two back pioneer? Is, is that a serious question, given that it's James? Well, well, it is, even given the fact it's James. He will go for it. I think. So, let's say it's me. Should I go for it? <laughs> well, you're good at croquet strokes, guys. I am. But there's no hurry. There isn't. You, you can get the penalty peel before four, but yeah. So again, running the viewers past the two options, we've got hitting black, send it to three back, rush red in front of penultimate, peel penultimate, getting a rush on blue to two back. Yes. That's the option we think he's going to do. The other option, send black to three back, get a rush on red on top of blue, get a dolly rush to two back, send blue out as an escape ball for the penult peel before four back, rush red probably to the south boundary, send it up to penult, get a rush out to three back. And the difference is the peel's going to be later, but you guarantee the dolly rush to two back. And I'm looking at this going, well, actually my most likely chance to not finish this turn is not making two back. Yes. So I think I'm going to take oh. red down to two back, turn it round to blue. It makes a lot of sense. Particularly when you don't get the peel and leave yourself a four yard rush. This is not in my 100% range, Keith. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure James will hit it. But that's not an ideal approach, is it? Let's face it. It's not perfect. Well, but let's, let's go with the next in the question. zone of what we were talking about earlier. It's an approach from the side, which is not as nice as a, an approach from in front. It's quite a long way away, so blue will go deep, and I think he'll run the hoop to the boundary. It's a lovely shot. It's a good shot, and he'll run the hoop to the boundary, but then you're at the mercy of how it comes out of the hoop, assuming you get to the boundary. Yeah, it's come out well. It's, it's come out well. So, now we've achieved that, so we've do put you, the break at risk. Do you do peel or not peel this? Going to black. Well, I know somebody. He may, he's probably not watching, but he would, he would say 100% not, mm. ever, never, ever. Hello, Christian. Yeah. <laughs> How are you watching? <laughs> um, uh, James is also not going to. He is not going to. Um, I think black's a really quite nice ball to peel going to. So I might have been tempted. Well, I think the argument in favour is that uh, it's actually a nice to get the peel because it it should as long as you continue the break that's a that's not an ideal blue is it? no and explain why that blue well, causes problems it's going to cause a problem because he's once he's made this hoop and hopefully rushed black up near red um he's going to want to peel red through penal and get a rush on blue to fall back and blue's quite close to the centre line. So normally you would peel through the hoop and your ball would go to the left of Penalt to get a rush on blue Indeed. to the hoop. Yeah. Here we, we're not confident that that is possible. It's, it may still be possible. 
but he, he wouldn't necessarily have a straight peel. And and he's now put like his striker's ball finishing with a rush on blue to four back may get hampered by red coming through the hoop Indeed. to yeah. a, a spot that he doesn't want. Well, you you, you like to put it in um, what you like to call the box. I do. Yeah, and the, but well, exactly how big is that box? The um, box is massive. <laughs> it's huge, isn't it? Yeah, I couldn't have failed to get blue into the box, I don't think. The box is probably six yards by six yards. Um, and where and it starts what about a yard east of the hoop and so goes to the line joining yeah. three and four oh a little bit past that even okay you know it's so big it's it's unmissable and then you just play a good croquet stroke yeah so, then. yeah but um no for, for most people i think the box needs to be a bit smaller than that um again we're in this position where he is going to go to the left here isn't he I think he's going on. No, he's not. No, he's, he's going, going right. right. He's going right. Oh, so, well, okay. Instead of playing a roll, which we might have played there, he's tried to get red well out of the way by playing a stop oh, shot. That's sensible. Which is that's sensible. It's not. If if blue hadn't been there, if it had been in the box, I would have played a roll. Yeah. Because I don't actually like having to deal with a situation where red sort of wanders down, sort of peg high. Yep. And you don't know whether to rush it closer to Rover or to rush it back. Yeah. Um, so having peeled it that far, James will probably rush it in front of Rover well, and take off back to black. In game one, mm -hmm. he failed to finish by rushing it back, almost from that exact position. But he didn't have... Black wasn't there. It was probably two yards. It was north of the hoop, and it was... Um, yard or two east and he rushed red into it oh dear um, I thought he would I thought he would rush it in front he had the option to he chose to rush it north so we'll see what he does this time yeah I, I think it's a lovely ball to the side that you can take off from Rover 2 without anything in the way yeah and I'm yeah. not gonna rush north Whereas, it, well, I still don't know what he's doing. He's, he's rushing to Rover. This time he's rushing to Rover, yeah. I think that's a good choice. I think it's a good choice, yeah. Um, if it had been up by the peg, we'd both have rushed back north and croquet it back yes. down. Yeah. He's, he's put that a long way past. Yeah, the whole point of doing this manoeuvre is to, to get Red really tight to Rover, isn't yeah. it? He's done well there. That's okay. Fair. I've watched many times, I've watched Robert Fulford do these, I've noticed he takes utmost care to get what would be red in this case really close to the front of Rover. So he know, presumably because he then knows he will be doing an Irish peel yep. from almost an unmissable position. Yep, nothing can go wrong. Mm. Um, and Rob, in that case, going back. 25 years everyone would have a deep ball and a side ball yeah and then rob introduced the concept of two side balls and then rob changed his own concept of two side balls into a side ball and a short straight ball right the reason being that if you've got a side ball already you and you run the hoop by a couple of millimeters and you can't hit your side ball you can still hit your straight ball well and also there's a chance that the p lee will will go off the yep. straight ball and no longer be in the way should you need to so I think black is probably two and a half three yards too deep here red sufficiently good that you're never going to be jumping you're always going to be Irish peeling yeah well yeah because you're peeling from so close jumping's pretty much out of the equation yeah. isn't it you don't need black there um, so shorter and straighter or a second side ball probably a little bit better um, so we're a few strokes away from 2-1 to James reminder to everyone both semi-finals are best of five mm -hmm. um, standard advanced that's by choice player choice 
Yep. Now James was quite quick at that, but he had obviously yellow had not run the hoop because he had a had a hoop shot after the peel, didn't he? Yep. Very sensibly getting blue <laughs> out of the way, well out of the way. I like the way when Reg is doing this, he really makes sure he gets a dolly rush to the peg. Absolutely. You see a lot of people still having to like do a three yard takeoff to get a rush. Or, yep. And then you bring the hoop into play. It's a good rush. Yeah. And that's within 100% range for me. Um, so this is a repeat of the Open Championship Finals from last this year. Yep. Where James won 3 1 from memory. He did. Uh, it was a very strong performance as well. Reg yes. made a big error early on, misapproaching two back. He did, in the first, um, first game. First game early on, I, I think, from memory. And then James simply played really well after that. Well, Reg did one sex duple and then he, he failed to finish a sex duple. Yeah. So, your recap of that game was really all about the tactical choice of what Reg did when he got in. He chose to go to one back. Should have done a TPR. And Keith, <laughs> Keith has a, a long association with doing TPOs. I think everyone knows Reg wasn't going to do a TPO because <laughs> he, that's not how he plays the game. Um, but for the last three or four days, Reg has just been going to four back. He has. Letting the opponent miss the lift and finishing. Uh, at that stage, he decided no, perhaps because of the rain taking the edge off the lawns perhaps because he thought no this is the time in the tournament to show I'm the boss maybe that the one back leaving the sex tuple was but correct no normally he um, he does a lot of sex tuples leading up to this stage so that he feels he gets more confident about finishing them as the tournament goes on I think um, and he's he seemed to definitely decide not to do them. Plus, I had the obviously I had the benefit of the conversation that I had with him, where he just yep. said he didn't like the balls. And yeah, he said something about you know in a in a sex tuple he might have two rushes that are a bit iffy, um, and that's why he needs the the old Dawsons. He knows how they're going to work. Yeah. And it, but with these, he said, you know, I've, I've got the added thing of, I'm not sure what the rushes are going to do. Yeah. And I think there's, um, there may be a few viewers who've been playing 35 years or so who remember Jake's balls. Well, indeed. And you often got variable contacts there. And people say, well, look, these modern players, they're much better than the old players like Solomon and Aspinall and, you know, all these players from the past. And I'm not sure they are. I think if you were the best in your time, you'd probably be very close to the best whenever you were playing. Well, this is a sort of discussion people have about a lot of sports, yeah. don't they? And equipment change. Yeah, you know, you know, would Bobby Jones or Ben Hogan have done well with modern equipment in modern tournaments? Um, and I think the answer is yes. Yeah, they uh, would um, with a bit of practice. Yeah, you know, Rob and Reg have done 300 sex tuples, and yeah, that's great. It's fantastic. But uh, the balls have improved and become more consistent until recently. The mallet technology, yeah, is just different and you can see that with your average club player who's quite good at hitting three and four yarders and when we started your average club player missed them quite regularly didn't they well so did tournament players yeah to be fair <laughs> I, <laughs> I certainly did i know that um so a nine inch wooden mallet compared to an 11 inch carbon fiber peripherally weighted modern mallet or 12 inches i think reg probably uses um big difference um, and it yeah, has the peripheral the weighting make, makes it. It's the same sort of technology as in golf clubs. Yeah. Uh, which probably came in about 50 years ago initially. Yeah. In, in golf, um, and it was Alan Pitcock who produced. Not say he produced the very first one, but he certainly produced mallets that had almost no weight 
except on the end faces. Yeah. Um, and I certainly was struggling with my old nine-inch wooden-headed mallet and got a pidcock and a different player. Won the President's Cup that year, played in the Mac, Mac. and yeah. 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 Uh, and I'd, I could tell straight away, oh, this is a different game. It is. Yeah. Yeah. Three yarders, fine. Now right. I don't mind them. In fact, I know, I, I know where they're going. They're rushes yeah. three yarders instead yeah. of, yeah. am I going to take croquet again? Yeah. So anyway, back to game four. James, James to go first. Two one ahead. And will it be another super shot? I think James. we will. Because uh, Reg, Reg played two standard openings. Um, first ball, you know, to the east boundary. Um, and uh, James played a super shot in game two. And another one here. Quite a short one. Yeah. you say? Yeah, that's very short. I think that will be now, encouraging. What's the, what's the thinking here? Because I'm sure... Not everyone will be familiar with the, the purpose of the super shot. Now the purpose, and, and also where exactly you would put it. The purpose is normally to maximise your chance of going around third turn. Sure. So the idea is that wherever Reg puts his ball, James is going to hit Reggie's ball yep. and try and go around. Okay. And whilst there are other purposes of a super shot, we're not going to be seeing those in this game. But the purpose is purely for third turn break. Okay. And Reggie's standard response is to go either maximum distance, which is about 19 yards south of corner three. Which is what he's doing now then, or presumably. To go, or to go almost peg high occasionally. Ah, well, in game two he had a, a sort of slow shot at black from corner one. Right. Um, which only just missed, and then James, given how confidently he hit it, um, probably had a double. Yeah, hit the backward ball on a double. Yeah. Um, and failed to go around. He didn't go in front of one, did no. he? Did he? No. We couldn't see from here, because um, James was in the way, but did his takeoff just hit the hoop? Not sure. I didn't have a good angle on that. All right. So, not sure. Um, so, again, James, as we say, he's going to try and hit the red, and the idea of shooting. Where, where would you shoot from? I shoot from third corner. Rob shoots from a couple of yards inside third corner to sort of join up with it a bit, maybe yeah, eight I or nine to, yards I, south. Yeah. Okay, which is what James. That's what has James has done. He's hit it. So. And the beautiful thing about the position now is Blue's travelling along a really quite good rush line to get a rush to hoop one. So this is not a difficult croquet stroke. No. You can try and get a two and a half yard rush, and whether it's one and a half yards or three and a half yards, yep, you're going to get it it's straight. It's almost the same principle as approaching a hoop from in front then, isn't it? It is, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Um, and when I was playing the absolute elite players, and I thought they were playing well, I thought the only way to defend against a super shot ball was to hit it. Right. And when I played Rob Hit in, it and move it. Move it. Yeah. Yeah. When I played Rob in 2009, I, I hit it twice. I just shot hard at it twice. <coughs> right. I moved it to just outside corner two yeah. and played just outside corner four. So effectively, he can't go round third turn. That's the theory. The theory, sure. Um, now, uh, I don't think there's been any evidence so far that either of them are on absolute elite form they both just had a little bit of error sure. so james didn't get um going third turn last time he hit so i don't think there's any need for race to have done that in this game so he's taking his most defensive sort of giving james the longest possible shot and james has hit it but we are now at a stage as james grovels through that where we anticipate that the next time Reg comes on the lawn, he's going to have the last shot of his match if he misses. Yes. Uh, so he's grovel through one. James, again calling for... This, this looks potentially difficult. I agree. He put his mallet up straight away, so he's clearly not thinking it's, it's not possible. No. Um, he's had no look at, you know, trying to run hoop two or hit red or just run away. He's clearly going to be poking this at black. Here comes Jenny. Um... So 
Let's take a brief time out to look at the other match. Uh, Robbie is... He's on a TP. And he will... Ooh. OK, I was looking at... Right, don't know if the viewers are actually looking at this lawn, but he's made one back and and rushed north of the Pele at Penalt, and he will be sending the ball to three back. But I'm not sure he's got enough room to hold for blue, but he has got a, a new mallet he's had made, hasn't he, Chris? So he made his own mallet, and it has a phenomenal stop shot. Yeah. Um, I can get, um, let's think, that's five... Yeah, I mean, I can get some pretty high ratios with it. Um, probably sending the front ball an extra six yards when approaching hoop one than you would with a standard mallet. Yeah, he's done very well there. Right, James is hampered shot. Uh, much easier than yeah. it looked from up yeah. here. That wasn't too difficult, was it, really? Um, and so James's idea here will be to make nine hoops stop at four back and there's a few different leaves available it's good just sorry to interrupt but it's good to get those watched though isn't it rather than just play them very much so um, partly it's etiquette in the sense but it is the principle of um, not only justice being done but being seen to be done so if you have an independent party watching the shot um, the opponent should have the comfort that um, the shot was indeed clean. Yeah, Even nothing though worse. it was a seemed to be a fairly easy shot. Yeah, nothing worse than coming off the lawn and one of the spectators coming up to you afterwards and saying, oh, "Are you sure that wasn't a bottom bevel?" <laughs> and you know, nothing takes the gloss off you win any more <laughs> than that. Um, indeed. Sorry. Yes. So he's going to make. Oh, it's fascinating. We would both have just tapped that. Oh, I would foot. definitely have tapped it because now I'm struggling to play this shot. No, James, James has just got this. James is going to go south of black to the far sure. side. Sure, yeah. And he's got no problem whatsoever with oh, the ratio. Yeah, you're right there. In fact, he could have he could have had another he could have yeah, yard or so. He could, yeah. Um, one of the things I have been talking to people about is this high ratio stop shot. You mentioned Robbie's. Yes. Now James watching him beat Reg in the Opens last year was just a joy to watch because the distance his back ball travelled each shot was so small because he had this fabulous high ratio stop shot. So where we might have been playing it from four yards away and moving our ball four yards, he could play it from three yards away and move his ball three yards. And it just meant everything was on a piece of string. Yeah, uh, delight to watch. And now Robbie has obviously picked up on this high ratio stop shot being quite well, important. He he told me he got this mallet mate so that he could uh, retain the stop shot ratios he needed when doing sex balls with okay. these balls. With these balls. So it's specific to these balls. Ah, very interesting. So that seems to me a level of. Um, attention to detail yeah that it's it's good to see but it's oh. it's pretty uncommon it uh, he's fabulous in terms of how much attention to detail he spends i i still think he plays a little bit too slowly occasionally but you're never worried that he's done anything careless no um so uh, there was another point which i mentioned earlier how well he'd played at the gc opens Right. And I mentioned that he hadn't quite reached that level here. Okay. He's changed mallet. So he turned right. up, for people who, who don't follow close, cl too closely, he turned up at Heathrow and the airline had lost his mallet head. Right. So he had three shafts in his bag still, but okay. he didn't have a mallet head. So he, I emailed Stephen Mulliner and Reg Bamford and said, look, I think you've got something similar to what I use can you you know help me and Stephen said yep yeah, yep yeah, I've, I've got six of them I'll bring them all down tomorrow all right. and 
Reg said, yeah, no, that's fine, I'll, I'll help. But I'm not coming down to the tournament straight away. So he turned up at Southwick on day, on day one of the Opens. And Stephen comes out from the car park, comes down to the club, and Robbie says, have you got the, the mallets? And Stephen said, oh, no, I've completely forgotten all the mallets. I haven't got nothing for you. But fortunately, Adrienne, Reggie's wonderful wife, had couriered a mallet, Brilliant. possibly two, down to Southwick overnight for Robbie. Excellent. And he played the entire tournament with one of Reggie's mallets, right. Right. beat him 7-0 in the first game <laughs> of the final, and was absolutely unbelievable with it. So I've heard, yes. And well, so Reg told me. Yeah. He said he was unplayable. He was unplayable. Yeah, yeah. he was unplayable. Uh, certainly game one. Um, and then he's turned up here and he's now got his own mallet back. Yeah. So great, obviously, croquet strokes and all that. But the shooting hasn't quite been there. Um, so whether that... You know, he just needs another week, ten days to crank it up again. Um, we'll have to wait and see. Um, well, he seems to hit the ball very cleanly. Yes. And Reg has noticed that. Yeah. He said that striking was pure. Yeah. yeah it's a nice flat swing. Yeah. Um, and the, and this is what I've I've been telling people. You, you know, practice everything you want to practice that's good but ultimately hitting your ball with the centre of the face travelling in the right direction at the right speed is actually what you need. Yeah, now, when Tolomash wrote his book he said in the front of it there's only one difficult thing to do at croquet and that's hit your ball. Right. And most people read that and think this guy hasn't got a clue. <laughs> There's all these croquet strokes and cannons <laughs> and tactics. And uh, the more you play and the more you watch people like Bamford and Fulford practice, they hit their own ball as cleanly and as purely as they can. And their practice involves hitting four and seven yarders, just focusing on striking their ball well. Well, Re Reg's routine is he he'll come down for an hour, an hour and a half at the end of the day and just hit four yarders. Yeah. That's what he's been doing over so, and over again. Going back to James, lovely quick break, round to four back already, and this is what we call a three duck sleeve. Yes. All the balls are going to be very close to sort of where they are now, in a line, probably pointing at the peg, and there's not going to be a double from A bulk or B bulk, and they're both as far away from A bulk and B bulk so as you can get. more or less the maximum distance. Correct. Of, yeah. Now, um, there's a question I've got for you here, because do you have a preference for the order of that the balls go in? Yeah, I like I like exactly what James is doing. So, okay. hit one ball at the boundary, okay. opponent ball in the middle, mm -hmm. and my ball well, you want to, in the lawn. You want to make hoot one off partner, because then it goes to hoot three. Correct. Yeah, I get that. I used to put... I used to put uh, the hoop one ball in the middle and oppo on the boundary because I just felt it gave me more room to get a ball to two. Oh. But I have seen a variation, and it was Samir Patel showed me this, where he actually he will cut rush. He'll have a this way round, so yeah. they'll hit one ball on the boundary, and then he'll he'll cut red a little bit south in order to have a straight shot pioneering two, which is an interesting variation. But it it does mean he he puts a slight kink in the line of the, the balls. I was always at a stage where I thought if I made hoot one, I was going to finish. That was my number one thing. And if I got red halfway to hoop two, oh, I like a ball at two. You do like, like a ball at hoop two. Oh, I like a ball at two. Um, yeah, I might. I might be coming from corner two. Are you quite two. likely to be coming from corner well, two? Well, a lot of people just shoot from B bolt. In which case, there's, there's no problem where you put it because you don't make hoop one off partner then. No. no. 
and then you've got plenty of room to get a ball to hoop yeah. to. So yeah. you could argue that this leave encourages the shot from corner one. Yeah. Interestingly, it looked like he shot at red there, Keith. It did. I thought he shot at red. Is there any reason why you shoot at red instead of blue? Blue's sort of a couple of feet closer. I can't think of one, to be honest. Um, so what we're expecting now is black to hit red, croquet red to hoop two, all the way to hoop two, and rush blue, blue to, to yellow. yellow. Yep. And then... Get an absolutely perfect rush to hoop one. Yep. And nothing can go wrong. Nothing can go wrong. It might as well be shake hands time. It will. Reggie's going to need one of his stopping I, I think James stopping will, will probably play the turn rather than ask, ask, ask Reg what he wants to do. Reg drink. isn't going to put the towel in then? No. No? No. No, no I don't think so. Um, no, in your, in your mind, fun, yeah. at this stage, I, I would always be thinking, this game's over. So, in Reggie's mind, no, in James's mind. No, I wouldn't. It's interesting he's chosen to do this well, instead. See, yeah, this okay. is legitimate. If you, it's close enough. Hitting it's it. close yeah. enough, isn't it? It's why I would normally have shot at blue, but oh, you know. another reason to shoot um, at blue. Yeah. In in James's mind, I'm I'm the, the key focus in my mind is the next shot I'm going to play. Oh sure. And I'm just trying to here. I'm trying to make sure I get a rush on red to blue with a good hoop two pioneer. But equally you could have got a rush on blue to red. You could, yeah. Um, again, potentially, if you fail hoop one, you're giving them a seven yarder instead of a two yarder. But I'm, I'm trying to break it down into individual shots and make it as easy to play each individual shot as I can do. Yeah. Um, there is no reason for James to have to play any more difficult strokes for the rest of this match. No. Absolutely not, but he's again not rushed in front of the hoop. Virtually all the errors we've seen, rushing-wise, have ended up short, haven't they? Yes. And it's because yeah. of the balls. Well, it's potentially a factor. I mean, we, we did have James's rush that he pinged at the start of this yeah, that game, was, didn't they? Right? That was overhit, whatever. Yeah. One of the things I like that James has done then is he's deliberately move blue behind the hoop on his hoop approach and it yeah. just means when you've got your 18 inch straight hoop that most of us are a little bit nervy of because it's the first hoop of the turn and we know if we do it we've got a laid triple ahead of us we can yeah. just hit it a bit harder you can and it is very annoying when you then get a, a ton of wire and miss it I think he was close enough. Oh, he was fine there. He was fine. He was fine there, but... That's a bit short, that blue. All okay, but he's going to need to rush it in front and place it. And... Meanwhile, Robbie has made Rover and done the peels and will be pegging out for... 2-1 down. Yeah. No real surprise to me. I expected the a comeback there. Yes. Um, I thought even at 2-0 up, Mark was probably only 60% for the match. Probably slight underdog, I think, at 2 1 up. 
Uh, potentially, absolutely. Yeah, Robbie's not the sort of character to collapse in a heap because no. he's two 0 down. No. Uh, having said that, it's difficult to think of many times he has been two 0 down. So it might sort of be a new experience. Well, he's not two 0 down anymore. Again, that blue's just a little bit short of where James would like her. Yes. But you might be able to run the hoop past it and just it's chip it back It's an interesting situation. Uh, it's, I, I, mean, I think I would have done what James did, but I actually generally used to prefer approaching the hoop off the Peely. I, I agree, that's what I coach. In that particular instance, it was fairly neutral, I thought. It was, I th yes, because blue was further away than red was. And again here, just take a little bit more time. Yeah, now do you do do you care about whether you get a rush here? It'd be nice, but Okay. Well, I think that's the perfect I think option. So too. Play yeah, it straight it and take a cut rush to get yeah. halfway there. Yeah. Um, yeah. No need to play it with pull to get a perfect dolly rush. No. And risk the peel. Well, this is progressing very nicely, but you can't you can't relax, can you? You, you really? certainly can't relax. Um, I, I think it, there'll be lots of people watching this going, "This is pretty much a big upset." And I think what we need to highlight is. I mentioned to Rick before lunch, I think Reg has won the Opens twice in the last nine years. Is that right? Is that all? He, he was surprised as well. I think James has won it twice in the last four years. He has. Yes. So, um, only how... twice in the last nine. That does surprise me. 2017, I remember that one. He had an absolute blinder of a croquet stroke match. He just seemed to play croquet strokes from anywhere. Uh, James has lost that red ball. Um, it's irritating but it's not a disaster is it? Can get a rush back to blue after hoop four and go send blue back south and tidy it all up. Yeah and would you... I, I'd be trying to get a rush on blue. Corner one-ish. Yeah. Just probably go down into the area first and have a look at where the hoop one. Sure. Is try and make sure that isn't in play. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think oh, that's I wouldn't. I wouldn't mind rushing it to the end of April. To be honest, that's, the end. That sort of. The end of April, call level with hoop one on the west boundary are both quite good spots. Yeah. Um, yeah. And in many ways, it's going to be determined by where my rush points. Yes. Um, Absolutely. But I mean, to be fair, uh, it, it wouldn't be a disaster to just rush it to six and take off. No, it? I don't like that. That is not that is not something I want to do at this stage of the match. That is playing a shot, which is slightly more difficult than anything I want to play in the rest of the match. That nearly went in the jewels. Um, so I think end of A ball is quite, quite good here. That's fine if it misses red. To miss it. Perfect. It did. Absolutely perfect. Got quite close to it. Though. Yeah. Just another point for people playing that shot. I see lots of people smash that rush off the south boundary. Well, if you send to ball red, you're in all sorts of trouble. Why yeah. not play it at the right pace? Yes. You still Absolutely. you still got loads of room to play a half roll here. Drivey half roll. See, James has got his hands down his mallet. He's got that good a stop shot. And yet he hasn't given himself the chance to hammer into red and rush it halfway to the south boundary. Um, slightly over hit. This definitely falls into my hope I didn't have to play a shot this difficult this turn. Yes. Good shot. Lots of balls to run it to, but I think he will just run it to red. 
you could see lots of the weaker players run that up to hoop six, couldn't you? Just not feel confident of running it by four yards. You'd hope not. And it, it frustrates us. You'd hope not. Um, Again, two choices. You can go to yellow or you can go to blue. I'd go to yellow here. So would I, I think. But he's gone to blue. Nice red. I think if we haven't mentioned it so far, we should say um, how nicely these um, new croquet lawns have played. They're only about two and a half years old, aren't they? Yes. And uh, certainly yesterday afternoon, they were all picking up pace, um, all playing very nicely. I uh, say so Lawn 7 had that really very tasty fast patch on it. Yeah, I think that's where the path between the bowling greens used to be. Used to be. So hopefully that will retain there and the groundsman can just gradually help the grass recover. Yeah. Um, a lovely tight position here despite having a backward takeoff to the hoop that looked a bit scary. It's a sort of it's a sort of nitpicking that um, some viewers may wish we didn't do. But on a really tricky lawn, these things can matter, can't they? They're oh, huge, huge. Now yeah, where's that gone? That's it looks good. good looks good. Looks good. Yeah, this looks good. Ooh. Okay, I've got a question for you here. Um, will he rush blue to Rover in a moment, or will he rush it west of yellow? Well, he should be trying to rush it west of yellow, so I'm going to say he's going to do the right thing here. Okay. Um, again, the reason being, if you rush it west of yellow, you can croquet it to Rover. Yes. Every time you play a croquet stroke, you can guarantee the ball's going to start going in the right direction. Yeah. When you rush it there, you're using skill and talent. I, I like to tell people that they should be trying to use as little skill and talent as they can. Well James has a lot of talent and skill and he's decided and he's to, chosen to do this because he wants to get the peels before two back to be flashy Yeah, and it's the wrong thing to do. So you should always rush west, croquet it back. Is it fair to say that when you, you rush, you attempt to rush something somewhere, you, you've restricted uh, your options for what you can do with it on the croquet stroke. Yeah. So he's, now, he's done nice. very, very well there. So he rushed it in a in a really good place. Um, but Reg, in um, one of the earlier games, he rushed down. Uh, and he rushed peeled. He rushed peeled Penol. And Aston and I were saying we'd probably rush it sort of peg high and then play a, a croquet stroke. And he tried to rush it all the way down and he, he came out at a funny angle and then he couldn't get it near a peeling yep. position. Yep. Another lovely croquet stroke there. Yellow sent perfectly to four back. Tight position on blue for the rush peel. Yeah. I think another one of phrase that we both like is um, form is temporary, <laughs> class is permanent. Yeah. And James has a lot of class, and just because he had a bad Mac shouldn't impact his likelihood to pick up potentially his third Open Championship in five years. Um, sending the opponent ball to Rover here, so he doesn't have to make. Rover off partner and Robbie's won the opening over on lawn seven so he should Super be having shot. Is it? no hang on what's happened there 
looks like lots of um oh he could have been he could, he could have hit fourth turn couldn't he yeah on a hit fourth shot turn from a super yeah. shot so again no real idea why james rushed to partner to penalt you'd normally be croaking your pioneers out yeah but he's got all the balls perfectly now and uh, we should mention playing with a new mallet this season. His old one disintegrated and a Cheltenham member has very kindly lent him this for the season. Right. Presumably hoping to pull out a four-figure trade for it <laughs> at the end of the season. Well, James's old mallet has been repaired. Oh. Um, I'm not sure I, if he's going to swap back or whether he will stick with this one for the world's. Might be wise to stick with this I'd one. I'd stick with this one if I were him. So this, this blue will be pretty close to the, the peg in a moment for when he comes through Rover. And again, you could rush it to the peg and take off six yards to red. You could. But we would like to rush it two yards past red. Absolutely. Croak it back to the peg and only move black yep. three feet, yep. four feet. Yeah. So a reminder for everyone watching, you've still got the chance to enter the uh, World's Fantasy Competition. Uh, James at uh, probably increasing popularity after this win. And um, yeah, entries close uh, nine o'clock morning of the uh, first day. Details can be found on the CA's Facebook page. Congratulations yeah. to James, good win. What is he doing here? Oh, he's pegging out is the answer, but uh, yeah, very good win for James. Um, yeah, so Reg had his error on his sex table. He did. And he did a bit of missing. And I think key points are uh, James. Um, yeah, James hit in fourth turn both times Reg had hit in third turn and made a leave. Yes. So those two hit-ins yes. that Reg made were negated yes. by immediate hit-ins by James. Yes. And uh, that combined with the error on the well, sex tuple. Did you think Reg should have been using a super shot over him? He's shown no ability to hit the ball straight during the event. And I think he was trying, well... He hit in third turn. He did. Both games. He did, he did. And I, I think the thing that I, I don't like, if, if he doesn't play a super shot opening, I want him to play a defensive opening. Sure. So when he hits in third turn, I don't want him to go and dig that ball out of corner two. I want him to lay a rush two one. And get James to shoot from third corner. Rather or, than or he used to. I think he used to leave a rush to corner two. At one time, he just didn't go anywhere near corner two. Yeah, yeah. So he didn't give James sufficiently difficult pickups right at the start of the match. Yeah. James had an easy opening. And my c concern about James is he's been weak in the first 20 minutes of matches for quite a while. And I would like to give him the chance to make an error early on rather than say, here's a four ball break straight away. Yeah. Um, so he got to settle early, he got a lead early. Um, when Reg was actually starting to dominate and he'd won the second game and he was on an equalising break in the third, he could have just gone to four back and said, He could. Yeah, yeah. I'm yeah. going to go 2 1 up if you miss. Yeah. Um, the way he broke down on this sex tuple was completely unexpected. Yes. Yeah. But he gave himself a chance to do that. 
He did. There were some shots that didn't quite yep. go how he would have liked. Yep. That ball was too deep that he needed to rush to five. Correct. He yeah. didn't quite get a rush on it. Nope. So it was all sort of predictable. Yep. Um, these things happen. Um, when I say I estimated his chance at 50, 55, and I said he needs 70. Yep. So it's a tactical error from my perspective. Um, when it comes to quarter-final day at the Worlds, uh, I think he will be 70% plus. Well, he'll be playing with the old Dawsons, I think. On easier lawns with easier hoops. Um, they'll be the quadways. Will they? That's I definitely believe, agreed I now, think so, it? yeah. OK. For, from the quarter-finals onwards on the front lawns at Hurlian. OK, so that, that will make a difference. Um, that's interesting. That will make a difference to the event. Um, so yeah, if Hurlingham can get 13 seconds and dry, dry the front lawns out a bit and put quadways in, we might be, might be in for a bit less peeling than I anticipated. Um, so we're going to set the camera up on the other semi-final lawn now. Yeah. And I'm going to hop out. Okay. And I think um, Aston Wade is going to come and join you, Keith. And we're going to move now. Right. So thanks for your company. Yeah, and I'll thank go and you, get Chris. Aston. So many thanks to Chris for his uh, expert commentary um, I can see the uh, the other lawn so and I can tell you that Robert Fletcher is on what I believe is the first break he won the opening so he's having a, a ball to fall back We're just uh, switching things over at the moment for those uh, on the live stream. Uh, so it takes a little bit of rejigging. We've got one camera more easily pointing at the uh, Fletcher Avery game. We've just got to move a few wires.
hi to all the listeners that are out there. Uh, we're just um, we're just in the middle of moving um, the cameras to cover the other semi-final between um, Robert Fletcher and Mark Avery. Um, I think this, the score is currently two-one. Uh, please look on Croquet Scores if you uh, are not following the text commentary there, and we'll be with you as soon as we can. So hi everyone, it's uh, Rich Waterman back here on commentary. We uh, just saw Mark Avery narrowly miss the lift shot shooting uh, at Robert Fletcher's balls. It looked like it was very, very close. He could see by the anguish on his face that must have been a tight one. Maybe it was even online and then just hilled off. So um, yeah, Robert Fletcher went round to four back, left what's called a Morm standard leave. So one of uh, Mark's ball on the back of um, hoop two and the other ball on the back of uh, three back. Um, it, what it does is it enables Robert to more easily potentially make a triple peel if uh, Mark misses which he just did. So with the game score at 2-1 and Robert now on second break having already done a triple uh, it could be 2-2 before you blink um, even at 2-0 we always thought that uh, you know, Robert wouldn't go down 
easily. So he's now set up a very nice rush to one. If you're making one off partner with your second break, it does make the triple clear a lot easier, much more straightforward. We shall see how this develops. Really nice rush over to one, good position. It's such a game momentum association, Croquet, you know, just literally one mistake or one good hit in. And the other player gets more lawn time and then suddenly the whole match changes. That's what I love about the best of five. It just creates such an opportunity for these momentum swings. Mark's just going to have to hope that uh, Robert makes a, makes an error or if not, he'll have to hopefully uh, get that game five under his belt and squeeze it 3-2. You notice the control there, Robert. He's um, right in front of one anyway. Really nice stop shot, sending blue deep. That should enable him to run one and get a nice rush on blue. That incredible control, that croquet shot. Yeah, it's come through a little bit strong, but that's not a problem. Gone past blue, but. Uh, the balls are in decent place for him to develop the break. So I hope you enjoyed the commentary from our friends uh, Keith Aiton and Chris Clark, two of the absolute kind of Wikipedias of croquet, phenomenal knowledge. I've got Aston Wade coming back to join me, the next generation of elite croquet player. Here he comes. Hello Rich. Good to see you again mate. Yeah, good to be back. Uh, just uh, commenting on the fact that um, with Robert Fletcher being able to make one off partner ball should make the straightforward triple peel a bit easier. Just got to pick up red. Yellow's in a great spot from the leave. So, uh, so far so good I think for Mr Fletcher. Did you see how close Mark's shot was? I missed it. It's, it looked extremely close. He. Uh, was staring at it and he, uh, judging from his reaction, I think either it was on target and held off or it was incredibly close. Oh, so uh, on the small margins, games change, right? So as you'd expect from someone of the ability of Robert, he's just put blue right on hoop <laughs> three. <laughs> wow. Well, that's pretty um, much in peeling position, yeah. isn't it? <laughs> He's put it right there and uh, got right on top of red as well. That is, uh, for those of you that play a bit of croquet, you'll realise quite how good that is. And a nice cut rush over to uh, towards heat two as well. So again, make it, by playing these bigger shots and getting them right, it then means he can play a series of relatively small controlled shots moving forward. So uh, the payoff is potentially huge. But that, yeah, that just shows you how good he is. I'll just sit here and dream of playing shots like that, if I'm <laughs> honest. Certainly, if this next croquet stroke goes to plan, he'll have everything exactly where he wants it for a standard triple. Yeah. Yeah, as we look at the stats, I mean, it, it's generally more of a trend, I think, down in Australia and New Zealand that people tend to triple more, look to triple more than sex people. It just seems a but yeah, out of. <laughs> a look at the stats that are currently provided by Eugene and Chris Williams. Robert Fletch has played 1,356 competitive games since 1985. He's got 1,151 wins. It's an 85% win rate. And this is going to be against the top, top players. Right? He's not going to be playing. I doubt he's played very many low-class events. And his... He's done 768 triple peels, so that's that's over half the games that he's played. He's won with a triple peel. And then just some matter of course, he's done 58 what's called TPOs, so that's where you're triple peeling the opponent out of the game. He's lost through triple peel through having done a triple peel and then losing the game 13 times, so everyone's human, right? And, and a mere 25 sex duple peels, but I think that's probably more of a function for he doesn't try them very often. He's certainly got the skill to do them. 
and of course number one in the world as we said before previous world champion um, got to be one of the absolute favourites for the world championships coming up if he's playing like this as well he's going to be a hard man to beat but there are some very good players that might try and stop him It'll be interesting to see if he continues with triples at the Worlds or maybe moves into some sex duples. Yeah. Um, I asked him about it, trying to get some information <laughs> out of him. Uh, nice he, he wouldn't give me much, um, <laughs> but he says he doesn't like strategic sex duples. Um, yeah. He'll play them tactically if he yeah. thinks it's an advantage in a particular game, uh, yeah. but he won't play a whole tournament aiming to sex duple. Yeah, it's interesting. I think if you're playing a really high level opponent towards the end of the tournament and that opponent is shooting really well, then sex tuples, if the, if the lawns are fairly open to that approach, uh, it obviously means you're generally giving your opponent a very, very long shot. Um, so there is some logic behind doing a sex tuple on flat, relatively easy lawns where your opponent is a good shot because you don't really want to give them a shorter lift shot. I think we are expecting the lawns at Hurlingham to be a little bit quicker than they normally are, mm. um, but they're generally thought of as being fairly easy conditions, um, fairly flat lawns, uh, not that fast, um, and the hoops tend not to be too difficult at Hurlingham, yeah. um, especially not compared to uh, what Roberts used to in Australia playing with quadways mm. on hard ground uh, that'll be a lot more challenging yeah so just nudging red into position for when he makes the hoop off blue blue will get put into peeling position peel blue and then rush red uh, south down the lawn yellow's a decent pioneer it's a little bit short but it's a decent pioneer for four so yeah you'd be He'd be very happy with this position. I think he'd be backing himself to finish from here most times. He doesn't notice, even though the balls are in a good position, the amount, you see the amount of focus, concentration on every shot is uh, noteworthy. He does put full focus into every shot he takes. Uh, noticeable with GC as well. Um, mm. Even if it seems like something that's a fairly routine clearance, you know, he'll take his time and put everything he's got into each shot. Mm. One of the things I notice with the really top players is that the focus is incredible. I think that's probably the one thing that I notice. Obviously, they swing is better and they hit the ball better, but there is that. That's gone into the jaws of oh, uh, in the jaws. That's, that's um, okay, I think. Yeah, he'll probably look to come back after hoop four and rush peel that. Um, again, you're always fairly happy to have peels stop in the jaws. Um, going through is ideal, but as long as they don't bounce off to the side, uh, yeah. I think we're fairly happy there. Yeah, the only really bad thing that can go wrong with balls in the jaws, if you don't approach it particularly closely, you can end up in a situation where you try and rush peel it through, so hitting it through and the ball just jams again and then you've got a really nasty shot after that but given the level of control that Robert has I would very much doubt that's going to be an issue for him so we're just playing red down to five which is red top hoop going to yellow make hoop four and then as Aston said come back and probably rush that ball through some players wait, happy to wait a little bit to get that through but I'd, I like to get it through early If you don't get a rush out of four back up to blue, it's not a disaster. Yeah, um, you can just stop it up to ideally a little bit east of hoop six, um, going to red at hoop five, and then get your rush out of five up to blue. Yeah, it's one of the things I think if you when you start to do a few more triples, um, you actually have more time than you think. Uh, the key is getting that first peel in, you get that first four back peel in. Then you've got a lot of opportunities to get the last two peels in, even if it's uh, what's called a straight double peel, where you're making the you know, the penalt peel while approaching penalt. 
Uh, it's getting that first four back peel in. Um, once you've got that in place, particularly players of this standard, it's, you're generally backing them at a finish, particularly in these conditions. Yeah, you have a lot of opportunities to do the penalty peel. Uh, you can do it after hoop six if everything's on schedule, um, or you can do it on the way to two back or the way to three back uh, with a death roll, mm -hmm. uh, which I'm not sure if we've seen one of those yet. Yeah. Um, but it's quite a big shot, but as long as your peely is in good position, um, it's not that much of a risk. Uh, or you can do it before fall back uh, and then have a straight row of appeal. So, as Rich says, there is a lot of a lot of time, a lot of opportunities uh, to get these peels done. It's actually something I realised uh, when I played the counties oh, with yeah. Rob Fulford. Yes. Um, obviously, won the world championships <laughs> yeah. uh, several times, uh, and we played an alternate stroke triple peel. Yeah. And I I played a couple by myself, um, but it always felt like quite a bit of stress to get the peels done. Yeah, uh, and then playing with Rob, it just felt like we had all the time in the world <laughs> to manoeuvre things around. Yeah, yeah it was uh, it was an absolute pleasure to pair the two of you together because it's like you know, and, and Rob really enjoys teaching talented players as well. So it's a a win for both of you that partnership. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah we're very lucky in the Essex team. We got Aston, who's the next generation. The elite player and Rob Fulford spares us a couple of days each time um, to impart his wisdom to the Essex team at the county, so that's very much appreciated. Right, so he's obviously got the peel through, so that's great. He'll um, probably nudge his partner ball over in the direction of uh, Pennell, going to red, which is at five. Yeah, he's in very good shape now, so... Uh, yeah. It takes a bit of thought, this, as you can see. It's quite a brown patch down that strip. So the line that he's taking off to red is quite quick here. Yeah. Uh, compared with some other patches of the lawn. Uh, he's played that fairly well. Uh, you can look to rush north after hoop five, uh, and then move blue into peeling position before making hoop six. Yeah, there's that little fast patch, isn't there? Just uh, between sort of three and six. That's a bit browner. So these lawns on this side of the clubhouse at Nottingham all used to be balls greens, I believe. Um, That's right, yeah. They converted to croquet lawns about a year ago. Uh, that particular kind of strip along lawn seven, I think, used to be a walkway. Ah. So it's been kind of relayed. Um, which is why it's a little bit different with the pace okay. compared to the rest of the lawn. Yeah. Off oh, converted lawns, they play extremely well. So, uh, yeah, Nottingham have done a great job. A lot of uh, credit should go to all those involved. I know um, one of my croquet friends, Alex McIntyre, is involved in lawn prep. It's, um, I think it is the first time that Nottingham have hosted the Open, so uh, they've done a brilliant job. Catering's been great, lawns have been great. It's been a really good tournament. So he hasn't got a particularly nice rush out of five here. Um, can't send it any further north, so he's just going to move it out to the east. And then he'll have quite a big roll to send red over to one back, trying to get behind blue uh, to rush it back to six. So he's just looking at where he wants to play that croquet stroke from. So one thing Robert will do is um, take his time over shots that have uh, yeah, slightly trickier. Yeah, we have to, sometimes we forget actually, you know, he's not even 30, I believe he turns 30 in July. He's won the Australian first eights nine times, the men's championship in Australia eight times and the open championship seven times. That's not bad going. Uh, when you're still in your 20s, is it? Uh, pretty dominant already. <laughs> <laughs> and a nice guy as well. Yeah, lovely guy. Yeah, which actually, to be fair, one of the things I love about croquet is that all the top players are really approachable and really um, willing to give advice and help others to improve. Um, I think that's a really real strength of our sport is that 
you know, that's that enthusiasm for the game and for helping certainly talented youngsters uh, like Aston to improve rapidly. Yeah, it's certainly something I've experienced um, coming through is that just so many people are willing to give their time um, yeah. to help me progress. Um, Rich being one of them. <laughs> Do my best. Yeah, I think you might have outgrown me, but maybe the mental side we can... Uh, I, I definitely help, I help. still some work to do there. Yeah. Yeah. I am very fortunate to be helped some of the uh, elite squads in both AC and GC with uh, mindset talks, which I think, yeah, I think once once you've got it right, then it's just tweaking, but um, yeah. it's not an accident that all the four of these guys are in the semi-final. They've all got a really good competitive mindset. Um, as is, as a few Aston, to be fair, I mean, like, you know, you, I think you you've got that kind of finals mentality where you actually enjoy you actually enjoy the occasion and the. I do, yeah. yeah. Um, I usually tend to play my best in the finals. Nice. Um, not not always. Yeah. Um, but I certainly enjoy a final. Right, so he's put Blue in a pretty decent position for. I think, it's an interesting one with the penalty peel. It's like you don't really mind if it goes and sticks in the jaws because what you can then do is rush peel it down to Rover. Um, the kind of the worst thing for for Blue would be if it just what you call grovels through. It means it just kind of sneaks through, and then the kind of hoop gets in the way of moving it up to Rover. So it's a you know maybe it's a foot deeper than ideal but he he'll be fine with this he'll be making looking to make six and go slightly beyond the blues probably but um yeah no drama with uh, with this break at the moment there we go just slides past beautiful should give him the opportunity to cut it back into better peeling position here yeah And then, yeah, then he's got a choice. He can either just just nestle it into the jaws, or he can play this a bit firmer, so it clears the hoop nicely. And then he'll then be rushing yellow off the north, well, towards the north boundary. Probably not off the north boundary, but towards the north boundary, so he can play it down to two back, getting onto red for his next hoop. He does have quite a good stop shot, so yeah. doesn't necessarily need to be off the north boundary. Yeah, I think personally, I'd like to go off the north boundary to play the ball over to two back getting on red um, but yeah Robbie has a good stop shot so it doesn't need quite that much space yeah again that ideally if you can play the shorter shots uh, all the better and it is personal preference to a certain extent it depends on your mallet as well it depends on your swing where exactly you like to place these balls for ideal position but you know red's a, red's a very decent pioneer for one back so he's um, not got a lot to worry about at the moment uh, looks like that's in the jaws, is it? I think that's in the jaws. Yeah. Um, so that's good there. Uh, yeah. As we talked about earlier, you can just rush that through later on. Yeah. So again, as as Aston said, Robert's got a great stop shot, so he doesn't need to move yellow. It's all about creating space, creating space for the shot to play a, a reasonable shot down to two back and get on red um, to knock it back towards one back. As Aston said, he's got a great stop shot, so he doesn't need to take yellow a lot further away from red. So again, he's reducing potential errors by having shorter shots. Yeah. Yellow's slightly short, but it's absolutely no problem at all there with two back. And the stops, stop shot ratio comes down to technique uh, as well as the mallet. Yeah, um, had a go with. Robert's mallet earlier in the tournament. Uh, yeah. It does produce a very nice stop shot. Um, I think he actually designed it himself. Um, ah, had okay. it produced. Nice. He had a bit of drama before the GC Open uh, when his mallet head got lost in Heathrow. Ah. So played yeah, that with one of Reg's old mallets. Okay. Um, but this is his mallet uh, that he's had shipped over in time for the event. Wow. So he played the GC with a borrowed mallet. With a borrowed mallet. Wow. And then um, was and was phenomenal. Yeah. Croquet gods we're talking about here. Um, so what's interesting is that uh, I'm just looking at the 
So the only game that Roberts lost in this tournament was in the early Swiss, and he actually did lose to James Deeth, funnily enough. Oh. Potential finalist, final opponent. He beat, um, Robert beat Joel, Joel Taylor in the quarters, who's a really up and coming player, Joel. Brian Cumming and Stephen Wright in the knockout. And in every single game, bar one, he had a peeling turn, um, which is, yeah, impressive. So he knows what he's doing when it comes to peels. So any other time that Roberts played in the Opens it was in 2010, I believe that was before uh, McRoberts and Shield that he did that. He came, he was runner-up I believe in that year. So he would have been about, what, 2010, so 13. Yeah, he wouldn't have been very old, like about 16. A lot of the good players start very, very young, I think. Uh, it's fair to say that it does give learning the game when you're young and getting good habits in place is, is, is important. When did you first start playing? So I started playing when I was about 13. Yeah. Um, played at school um, in the summer term, some afternoons. Yeah. Uh, we had some matches against other schools in the area, got quite competitive as I do with most, with most <laughs> things, to be fair. Yeah, brilliant. Um, so I joined my local cl croquet club at the time, Hampworth Croquet Club. Oh, um, yes, no, Down Hampworth. in the New Forest. Nice. Um, they kind of taught me to play uh, some GC and ended up entering some tournaments in 2020 in between lockdowns to keep me entertained. Yeah. Um, really kind of burst onto the scene uh, by winning the British Open GC. Uh, in yeah. 2021. Yeah, it was a reason, reasonable opening. Uh, it was a bad debut, was it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I first stopped, spotted Aston. Uh, he, we had a kind of a, a youth um, squad that was organised by Eugene Chang, who's also been uh, sorting out all the AV here. I spotted Aston playing, I thought he looks like he could be very good. And uh, managed to tap him up for the Essex team, which was a in hindsight, one of the best bits of talent spotting, I think, probably in croquet history. <laughs> I was delighted at the time when you asked if I wanted to play for Essex. Um, it was before I was really all that good, so yeah, well, I yeah, think Edge did a good job there. And then everyone else wanted to sign him up, but it was too late, so that was good. Right, so Robert's um, a quite a common tactic is when you're going through either hoop four or two back, is actually you can get a lot of positional control by placing the reception ball, in this case yellow, in a spot and then running the hoop through to the boundary because then you're actually very predictable where your balls are going to be. So you'll see that quite a lot with the, with the top guys. Just caught that a bit thin. Yeah, what you don't want to do when you're doing that is put the reception ball directly behind the hoop. Yeah. And then when you run it into the reception ball you don't get a rush anywhere. Uh, that can happen a few times. You will occasionally take a bit of wire on the hoop and come out at an angle you don't expect as well. Uh, but generally it allows you to run the hoop at a comfortably firm pace uh, rather than trying to judge where your ball goes through. Yeah. And that can lead to lobbing the hoop. Yeah. Um, so. <laughs> so, so you just clip yellow, which you wouldn't have wanted to do. He's going to send this up to full back. Um, there's still an opportunity here potentially to get a good position on blue and have a speculative rover appeal, but he might well just be patient now and get the ball set up well and finish the triple um, by doing the rover appeal while going through rover himself. But let's yes, see, he's, uh, he's the expert at croquet shot, so let's see where black ends up. Yeah, so even if he could have sent blue back to rover there, red's not an ideal pioneer not free great, back to do the rover appeal getting yeah. to red. Uh, you want red south of the line of rover there um, as your pioneer. So what you might try and do here is place blue as the reception ball after three back. Yeah. Uh, rushed over to in front of rover. Yeah. And peel it then. Yeah. If not, he'll just leave it in good position in front of rover to come yeah. back to later. So again, this ties into what we were saying before about there's lots of peeling opportunities. So this is kind of one of the more I'd say unusual ones, but as Aston said, yeah, they have still got opportunities to get that early peel in um, after three back. So 
Red's in a nice spot, so that he just needs a bit of control now coming out of three back, which I'm sure he will to give him that. Even if he doesn't get this, this peel in early, it's not a disaster at all. He'll have a good position. Although it is quite difficult to get this rush on blue over to peeling position in front of Rover, you don't really lose much by trying it. Yeah. Um, as I said, if you don't get in front of Rover, you just place it in good position and move on. So this is a fairly free manoeuvre uh, to try and get the peel done early. Yeah. Yeah, it's kind of a free hit, isn't it? Yeah. That's one of the things when I was taught triple peels by a gentleman by the name of uh, Cliff Jones. Uh, he always said, yeah, don't don't sacrifice the break to try and make the triple peel. So it's a, it's a nice bonus at this level. What you're trying to do, obviously, is give your opponent a minimum number of shots. You just don't want interaction. So these guys will try and triple or sex people. But you're always mindful of not getting greedy and um, just actually taking a step back and sometimes just, you know, you'll stop the peeling turn just to make sure you get the break done. So this isn't an ideal rush. No. It's going to have to play out with quite a bit of cut. When you're playing cut rushes, it becomes more difficult to judge the pace. Looks pretty good though, uh, doesn't it? He's done one? a good job with that. And he's placed red in a position where he can play this peel with a straight stop shot if he wants yeah. to. Uh, so that, as we spoke about earlier, minimises pull. Yeah. Uh, it should make it easier for him to get the peel. Yeah, we had a question about pull um, in the comments earlier on. And it literally is just the two balls just grip each other a little bit. So if you're splitting the balls any significant amount, um, 45 degrees kind of being the optimal you do they tend to get drawn to each other if you're playing it straight you won't have pull and equally if he was playing uh, what we call a takeoff so one ball moving very little the other one just moving off at 90 degrees you're going to get virtually no pull as well so I would expect that this is either going to go through or the very worst case sit in the jaws if it sits in the jaws as before it's not it's actually fine it's actually more than think given the uh, the skill that he has at peeling that uh, I'll be betting on this being successful. Yeah, I think Jaws here is probably the worst outcome he's going to get. Um, yeah. At the very least it should stop in the Jaws if it doesn't go through. Yeah. So the only thing to note, he's not going to hit it this hard, but if you, I think I mentioned it earlier on, if you are peeling another ball through, because it's a croquet shot, that ball is not allowed to go off the lawn, so he couldn't hit this super hard, because if it went through and went off the lawn, it would be the end of the turn. Uh, but that's not going to be the case with this shot. Yeah, so general advice there is don't play a peel with so much pace that it could go off the lawn yeah. if it ran the hoop cleanly. Um, most of the time it will kind of rattle around the hoop, take a bit of wire, and it won't go as far as you play it to. But just on the off chance it sails through, um, it's not worth playing it at a pace where it could risk going off the lawn. Yeah. It's not really an issue within a rover or pen up peel. It has happened to me once doing a four back peel. I got a bit excited and thumped it through off the lawn, but uh, it's pretty rare. I think not these guys aren't going to do that. So that was a really nice shot. Um, nice rush up towards yellow. So again, nice short shots left. Uh, it'd be, yeah, highly unusual if he didn't finish. Ooh, okay, that's, yeah, that's fine. He probably didn't want it to go off penalt, but it's not a problem. You just leave it there and just go yeah, together. It's in a good position as a penalt pioneer. Yeah. So what we'll probably do after, he'll make four back off yellow. I imagine he'll then get control, probably start to move partner um, back towards the peg just to make his job a bit easier. So again, it's should be fairly straightforward from here just to tap land for that, that very bare patch but even from here even though I can see the back of the head I can see the level of concentration that's going on he's not taking anything for granted um, and that is something you can practice as well by the way so if you struggle if your kind of mind drifts just take time you don't even have to do it on the lawn you can just take time just practicing focusing on something and just seeing where or how your mind might wander but the, the, the big boys the really elite players are very very good at concentrating on what they're doing and there are some players who will play 
all the difficult turns to establish a break um, and then find they go wrong. Yeah. And that sometimes is just a lapse in concentration mm. when they think they have everything under control. Yeah. That certainly happened to me a few times. Um, you yeah. assume it's all fine and suddenly you're in the middle of a hoop. So yeah, it's important here for Robert to maintain his concentration, and I don't think he'll have any trouble doing that. So he's rushed back down towards Rover. Uh, I think what he'll do here is put Yellow as his Rover Pioneer, yeah. uh, getting a rush on Blue back up towards Red, yeah. and then he can keep Blue around the peg, ready for his peg out. Yeah. It's all looking good. It's like it's a great example here of making a triple peel look very very simple just by playing really great croquet shots and I can't emphasize enough you know um, when I used to watch Rob Fulford play, practice at Colchester it just looks so easy and the reason it looks so easy is because they're so in control of the the rushes and also the croquet shots so just give the sort of the viewers a bit of a heads up so we're, we're volunteer and amateurs so we have to pack all the gear up at the end of the day, so we're probably going to have to do that about five o'clock. Assuming this game finishes, I think that probably does leave enough time for us to see the final game, but just to warn you that we'll do our absolute best to see this out to the finish. But we do have to get everything secured and ready for the final for tomorrow, so I'll just warn you now. If we can't make it to the end of the uh, match, maybe that uh, someone's still willing to do some typed commentary on croquet scores. Yeah. So we'll let you know about that if needs be. Yeah, that's a great point. Yeah, we've got a team of experts um, providing commentary on croquetscores.com if you don't know where of that. It's a great way of following results. Uh, if you can also, if you find the AC Open Singles Championship. I know that we've got um, Jenny Jenny Clark and um, Andrew Gregory been doing things. Andrew's been doing an absolute sterling job providing full commentary on the semis. He's phenomenally good at expressing lawn positions and patterns of play through text, which is not the easiest thing in the world, to be fair. So he's that kind of a resident expert on croquet scores. So Robert's come through Penel a little bit hard there and ended up probably about three yards from red so opted just to hit blue first um, just to minimize any risks. You'd ideally want to be hitting red there first um, but this is okay he's got a rush back south so shouldn't have any problems. And one thing that you can do here uh, is put red uh, quite deep um, behind Rover yeah. and then keep yellow close. Um, if anything goes wrong and you end up with a slightly difficult hoop and you have to run it hard, you have a deep ball which you can hit uh, after you go off the boundary. Uh, but he's confident here of making Rover under control so he doesn't yeah. feel the need for that. He'll just keep yellow nearby, uh, run it with control and come back to either red or blue. Yeah, it's a good point. It's like, you know, things that could go wrong is just you know potentially just creeping through rover and not being able to see another ball or smashing through rover and being a long way from anything but so yeah he's right in front so it won't be a problem so a couple of comments come through just about the sort of croquet basics i think when the next game starts we'll probably just talk through again how the game works just for those I know we've got a real mix of viewers so uh, some of you I know very experienced players just want to see what's going on some of you may be um, just starting out in association croquet or some of you might be more golf croquet players and you're just having a look at association I would strongly encourage everyone to have a go at both um, and I'm also aware there's a friend of mine watching who doesn't know very much about croquet at all so we'll do. We'll cover the basics again at the start of the next game. Um, Roberts are obviously finishing. He's finished. So it's one one game all. Sorry, two games all. Sorry. Um, so it's now the final game. So it's looking similar to what Mark Avery had against Stephen Molyneux yesterday, yes. where he got two games up uh, and then lost the next two. Got it. Yeah. Uh, he managed to pull it out in the fifth, but the momentum's definitely switched towards Robert now. Yeah, big time. 
So we have a toss at the very start of the game. Whoever wins that toss gets a choice either to go first or second, or they can choose what colour of balls. Um, the other player then gets a choice in the second and fourth games, and the first player gets a choice in the third and fifth. So whoever won the toss in the first one, I'm not sure who that was. I'm not sure either. Um, it's very unusual to change colours at this point. Most people are kind of used to playing certain colours and then you kind of get locked in on it, but it has happened. Uh, we'll just talk you through the start of the game and, and some basics on the first couple of hoops and then we'll probably revert back to our normal commentary. Just to make sure everyone's in the loop. For those new to the game, I probably is like the closest thing probably is to association croak is probably snooker where you've got a, some sort of break element to it. Like obviously in the snooker, the colours get put back on the table. In this case, you've only obviously you've only got four colours. Yeah, it's about kind of getting yourself positions where you can either pop multiple balls or make multiple hoops at once. Yeah. Um. So in golf croquet, which obviously you're a, a whiz at, is it's a single hoop at a time. Whoever gets that hoop gets the point. You move on to the next one. So this is very much more single shot, single hoops. Whereas I was like, you can make two hoops in a row, obviously. <laughs> uh, but yeah, association croquet is more about, particularly at this level, is much more about breaks. Um, and as we saw in that case, Robert Fletcher finished in two breaks. Uh, the rain rain's is coming. picked up a little bit, so players may choose to wait for five, ten minutes to see yeah, if it dies down. It clear. I'll look at the weather the forecast. forecast. I think the, the forecast is saying probably should crack on at this point. It's just going to continue raining, is it? Yeah, it's going to be one of those. We've done, given what it looked like, I think we've done quite well really today. We had one downpour. Tomorrow doesn't look too bad at all. We've got some late afternoon, early evening stuff, but I would have probably expected it will be over by then. I mean, you didn't. S it's really only th thunder, thunderstorms and puddles are the two things that will stop croquet play. Yeah, or snow. Snow would be another one. Not played in the snow, I have to say. I've played in hail before. <laughs> um, <laughs> yes, of course. That was during. That was in the final of your under 21s World Championship, wasn't it? Uh, yeah, that, was that it wasn't quite, quite hail. hail. It was, it was hard hail. enough that it felt like it. Right. Um, <laughs> but yeah, that was flooding some of the lawns. Yeah. Um, so we were lucky. We finished when we did. I think going into a game five, the lawn was becoming a little bit unplayable with the water on the surface. Yeah. Um, yeah, certainly don't stop for bad weather. Yeah. It's when the wind is strong, that, that tends to affect a lot of croquet players, particularly if you cast over the shots. Um, yeah. So that's kind of swinging the mallet to line yourself up. If you get a crosswind blowing the mallet all over the place, yeah, yeah, that, that can fun. become quite difficult. Yeah. So it looks like uh, Robert and Mark have just taken a quick break. I think the weather's clearing by the looks of it, yeah. So they've taken a quick break for game five, which is the deciding game. So just sort of a few of those that are sort of new to croquet, you're gonna notice that uh, we've got obviously got a peg in the middle. Uh, which is used for finishing and for generally getting in the way if you're unlucky. Uh, it's got colours on there which represent the four main colours in Croco, blue, red, black and yellow. So one team is blue and black, the other team is red and yellow. And then if you have two games on one lawn, uh, we use what's called secondary colours, which is green, pink, brown and white. So green and brown play together and pink and white play together. And then Obviously, it can be a bit confusing in terms of, oh, we've got a bell going for tea. That's tea, yeah. The players might take a little bit longer yeah, for that. Yeah, exactly. Though. So you might have to bear with us. Okay. Yeah. Is it off or...? Yeah. Okay. okay. <laughs> so we're just getting some updates from our AV team, um, just looking at the timings and how long things are going to take. I think that's cool. We're going to have to stop the live commentary there for today. Um, so we're going to wish both players the best of luck in their game five. I do, you know, do apologise. Unfortunately, we're not professionals, and 
equipment needs to be packed up. So uh, follow on on Croquet Scores. Andrew will carry on updating that. Uh, final will start at 10 a.m. tomorrow. I know that we're going to get a lot of Chris Cart commentating tomorrow. He's obviously a fabulous font of knowledge. I'll probably see a little bit of me and Aston and Keith and. I'm not going to be others. here tomorrow, oh, sadly, uh, but I'm, I will be watching. So. Um, I shall sure, I sure miss you, my friend. I'll be cheering you on at the World Championships. Thank you. And uh, yeah, it's been a pleasure today. Yeah, again, apologies that we couldn't um, do the live streaming for the fifth game. It's just uh, a lot, of, a lot of, a lot of, uh, a lot of kits back up. Yeah, well, I think we've had plenty of action so far today, anyway. So hopefully everyone's enjoyed watching. Apparently we're on camera, so we give everyone a wave oh, goodbye. Oh, okay. Well, wave goodbye then. Yeah. <laughs> Cheers, guys. See you tomorrow. Yeah. Right. Feel free to sit and chat as long as you like. Okay. <laughs>